Book One, Chapter One of the New Machiavelli. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Ogus. The New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. Book One, Chapter One. Concerning a book that was never written. One. Since I came to this place, I have been very restless, wasting my energies in the futile beginning of ill-conceived books. One does not settle down very readily at two-and-forty to a new way of living, and I have found myself with the teeming interests of the life I have abandoned still buzzing like a swarm of homeless bees in my head. My mind has been full of confused protests and justifications, in any case, I should have found difficulties enough in expressing the complex thing I have to tell, but it has added greatly to my trouble that I have a great analogue, that a certain Niccolo Machiavelli chanced to fall out of politics at very much the age I have reached, and wrote a book to engage the restlessness of his mind, very much as I have wanted to do. He wrote about the relation of the great constructive spirit in politics to individual character and weaknesses, and so far his achievement lies like a deep rut in the road of my intention. It has taken me far astray. It is a matter of many weeks now, diversified indeed by some long drives into the mountains behind us, and a memorable sail to Genoa across the blue and purple waters that drowned Shelley since I began a laboured and futile imitation of the prince. I sat up late last night with a jumbled accumulation, and at last made a little fire of olive twigs and burnt it all, sheet by sheet, to begin again clear this morning. But incidentally I have re-read most of Machiavelli, not excepting those scandalous letters of his to Vettori, and it seems to me, now that I have released myself altogether from his literary precedent, that he still has his use for me. In spite of his vast prestige, I claim kindred with him, and set his name upon my title page, in partial intimation of the matter of my story. He takes me with sympathy, not only by reason of the dream he pursued, and the humanity of his politics, but by the mixture of his nature. His vices come in, essential to my issue. He is dead and gone. All his immediate correlations to party and faction have faded to insignificance, leaving only, on the one hand, his broad method and conceptions, and upon the other, his intimate living personality, exposed down to its salacious corners as the soul of no contemporary can ever be exposed. Of those double strands it is I have to write, of the subtle, protesting, perplexing play of instinctive passion and desire against too abstract a dream of statesmanship. But things that seem to lie very apart in Machiavelli's time have come near to one another. It is no simple story of white passions struggling against the red that I have to tell. The state-making dream is a very old dream indeed in the world's history, it plays too small a part in novels. Plato and Confucius are but the highest of a great host of minds that have had a kindred aspiration, have dreamt of a world of men better ordered, happier, finer, securer. They imagine cities grown more powerful and peoples made rich and multitudinous by their efforts. They thought in terms of harbours and shining navies, great roads engineered marvellously, jungles cleared and deserts conquered, the ending of muddle and diseases and dirt and misery, the ending of confusions that waste human possibilities. They thought of these things with passion and desire as other men think of the soft lines and tender beauty of women. Thousands of men there are today almost mastered by this white passion of statecraft, and in nearly every one who reads and thinks, you could find, I suspect, some sort of answering response. But in every one it presents itself extraordinarily entangled and mixed up with other, more intimate things. It was so with Machiavelli. 
I picture him at San Casciano as he lived in retirement upon his property after the fall of the Republic, perhaps with a twinge of the torture that punished his conspiracy still lurking in his limbs. Such twinges could not stop his dreaming. Then it was the prince was written. All day he went about his personal affairs, saw homely neighbours, dealt with his family, gave vent to everyday passions. He would sit in the shop of Donato del Corno, gossiping curiously among vicious company, or pace the lonely woods of his estate, book in hand, full of bitter meditations. In the evening he returned home and went to his study. At the entrance, he says, he pulled off his peasant clothes, covered with the dust and dirt of that immediate life, washed himself, put on his noble court dress, closed the door on the world of toiling and getting, private loving, private hating and personal regrets, sat down with a sigh of contentment to those wider dreams. I like to think of him so, with brown books before him, lit by the light of candles in silver candlesticks, or heading some new chapter of the prince with a grey quill in his clean, fine hand. So writing he becomes a symbol for me, and none the less because of his animal humour, his queer indecent side, and because of such lapses into utter meanness as that which made him sound the note of the begging letter writer even in his dedication, reminding his magnificence very urgently, as if it were the gist of his matter, of the continued malignity of fortune in his affairs. These flaws complete him. They are my reason for preferring him as a symbol to Plato, of whose indelicate side we know nothing, and whose correspondence with Dionysus of Syracuse has perished, or to Confucius, who travelled China in search of a prince he might instruct, with lapses and indignities now lost in the mists of ages. They have achieved the apotheosis of individual forgetfulness, and Plato has the added glory of that acquired beauty, that bust of the Indian Bacchus, which is now indissolubly mingled with his tradition. They have passed into the world of the ideal, and every humbug takes his freedoms with their names. But Machiavelli, more recent and less popular, is still all human and earthly, a fallen brother, and at the same time that nobly dressed and nobly dreaming writer at the desk. That vision of the strengthened and perfected state is protagonist in my story. But as I re-read The Prince and thought out the manner of my now abandoned project, I came to perceive how that stir and whirl of human thought one calls by way of embodiment the French Revolution has altered absolutely the approach to such a question. Machiavelli, like Plato and Pythagoras and Confucius two hundred odd decades before him, saw only one method by which a thinking man, himself not powerful, might do the work of state-building, and that was by seizing the imagination of a prince. Directly these men turned their thoughts towards realisation, their attitudes became, what shall I call it, secretarial. Machiavelli, it is true, had some little doubts about the particular prince he wanted, whether it was Caesar Borgia or Giuliano or Lorenzo, but a prince it had to be. Before I saw clearly the differences of our own time, I searched my mind for the modern equivalent of a prince. At various times I redrafted a parallel dedication to the Prince of Wales, to the Emperor William, to Mr Evesham, to a certain newspaper proprietor who was once my schoolfellow at City Merchants, to Mr J. D. Rockefeller, all of them men in their several ways and circumstances and possibilities, princely. Yet in every case my pen bent of its own accord towards irony, because, because although at first I did not realise it, I myself am just as free to be a prince. The appeal was unfair. The old sort of prince, the old little principality, has vanished from the world. The common weal is one man's absolute estate and responsibility no more. In Machiavelli's time, it was indeed, to an extreme degree, one man's affair. But the days of the prince who planned and directed and was the source and centre of all power are ended. 
we are in a condition of affairs infinitely more complex, in which every prince and statesman is something of a servant, and every intelligent human being something of a prince. No magnificent pensive Lorenzos remain any more in this world for secretarial hopes. In a sense it is wonderful how power has vanished, in a sense wonderful how it has increased. I sit here, an unarmed, discredited man, at a small writing table in a little defenceless dwelling among the vines, and no human being can stop my pen except by the deliberate self-immolation of murdering me, nor destroy its fruits except by theft and crime. No king, no council can seize and torture me, no church, no nation silence me. Such powers of ruthless and complete suppression have vanished. But that is not because power has diminished, but because it has increased and become multitudinous, because it has dispersed itself and specialised. It is no longer a negative power we have, but positive. We cannot prevent, but we can do. This age, far beyond all previous ages, is full of powerful men, men who might, if they had the will for it, achieve stupendous things. The things that might be done today, the things indeed that are being done. It is the latter that give one so vast a sense of the former. When I think of the progress of physical and mechanical science, of medicine and sanitation during the last century, when I measure the increase in general education and average efficiency, the power now available for human service, the merely physical increment, and compare it with anything that has ever been at man's disposal before. And when I think of what a little straggling, incidental, undisciplined and uncoordinated minority of inventors, experimenters, educators, writers and organisers has achieved this development of human possibilities, achieved it in spite of the disregard and aimlessness of the huge majority and the passionate resistance of the active dull, my imagination grows giddy with dazzling intimations of the human splendours the justly organised state may yet attain. I glimpse for a bewildering instant the heights that may be scaled, the splendid enterprises made possible. But the appeal goes out now in other forms, in a book that catches at thousands of readers for the eye of a prince diffused. It is the old appeal, indeed, for the unification of human effort, the ending of confusions. But instead of the Machiavellian deference to a flattered lord, a man cries out of his heart to the unseen fellowship about him. The last written dedication of all those I burnt last night was to no single man, but to the socially constructive passion in any man. There is, moreover, a second great difference in kind between my world and Machiavelli's. We are discovering women. It is as if they had come across a vast interval since his time into the very chamber of the statesman. 2. In Machiavelli's outlook, the interest of womanhood was in a region of life almost infinitely remote from his statecraft. They were the vehicle of children, but only Imperial Rome and the New World of today have ever had an inkling of the significance that might give them in the state. They did their work, he thought, as the ploughed earth bears its crops. Apart from their function of fertility, they gave a humorous twist to life, stimulated worthy men to toil, and wasted the hours of princes. He left the thought of women outside, with his other dusty things, when he went into his study to write, dismiss them from his mind. But our modern world is burthened with its sense of the immense, now half-articulate significance of women. They stand now, as it were, close beside the silver candlestick, speaking as Machiavelli writes, until he stays his pen and turns to discuss his writing with them. It is this gradual discovery of sex as a thing collectively portentous that I have to mingle with my statecraft if my picture is to be true which has turned me at length from a treatise to the telling of my own story. In my life I have paralleled very closely the slow realisations that are going on in the world about me. I began life ignoring women, 
They came to me at first perplexing and dishonouring. Only very slowly and very late in my life and after misadventure did I gauge the power and beauty of the love of man and woman and learnt how it must needs frame a justifiable vision of the ordered world. Love has brought me to disaster because my career had been planned regardless of its possibility and value. But Machiavelli, it seems to me, when he went into his study, left not only the earth of life outside, but its unsuspected soul. 3. Like Machiavelli at San Casciano, if I may take this analogy one step further, I too am an exile. Office and leading are closed to me. The political career that promised so much for me is shattered and ended for ever. I look out from this vine-wreathed veranda under the branches of a stone pine. I see wide and far across a purple valley whose sides are terraced and set with houses of pink and ivory. The Gulf of Liguria gleaming sapphire blue and cloud-like baseless mountains hanging in the sky and I think of lank and coaly steamships heaving on the grey rollers of the English Channel, and darkling streets wet with rain. I recall as if I were back there the busy exit from Charing Cross, the cross and the money changers' offices, and the splendid grime of giant London, and the crowds going perpetually to and fro, the lights by night, and the urgency and eventfulness of that great, rain-swept heart of the modern world. It is difficult to think we have left that, for many years if not for ever. In thought I walk once more in Palace Yard, and hear the clink and clatter of hansoms, and the quick quiet whir of motors. I go in vivid recent memories through the stir in the lobbies. I sit again at eventful dinners in those old dining rooms, like cellars below the house, dinners that ended with shrill division bells, I think of huge clubs swarming and excited by the bulletins of that electoral battle that was for me the opening opportunity. I see the stenciled names and numbers go up on the green bays, constituency after constituency, amidst murmurs or loud shouting. It is over for me now and vanished. That opportunity will come no more. Very probably you have heard already some crude, inaccurate version of our story and why I did not take office and have formed your partial judgment on me. And so it is I sit now at my stone table, half out of life already, in a warm, large, shadowy leisure, splashed with sunlight and hung with vine tendrils, with paper before me to distill such wisdom as I can, as Machiavelli in his exile sought to do, from the things I have learnt and felt during the career that has ended now in my divorce. I climbed high and fast from small beginnings. I had the mind of my party. I do not know where I might not have ended, but for this red blaze that came out of my unguarded nature and closed my career for ever. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two, Section One of the New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Bromstead and My Father. One. I dreamt first of states and cities and political things when I was little boy in knickerbockers. When I think of how such things began in my mind, there comes back to me the memory of an enormous bleak room with its ceiling going up to heaven and its floor covered irregularly with patched and defective oilcloth and a dingy mat or so and a surround, as they call it, of dark stained wood. Here and there against the wall are trunks and boxes. There are cupboards on either side of the fireplace and bookshelves with books above them and on the wall, and rather tattered, is a large yellow-varnished geological map of the south of England. Over the mantel is a huge lump of white coral rock, and several big fossil bones. 
and above that hangs the portrait of a brainy gentleman, sliced in half and displaying an interior of intricate detail and much vigour of colouring. It is the floor I think of chiefly, over the oil cloth of which, assumed to be land, spread towns and villages and forts of wooden bricks. There are steep square hills, geologically volumes of ore, cyclopedia of the sciences, and the cracks and spaces of the floor, and the bare brown surround, were the water channels and open sea of that continent of mine. I still remember with infinite gratitude the great uncle to whom I owe my bricks. He must have been one of those rare adults who have not forgotten the chagrin and dreams of childhood. He was a prosperous West of England builder. Including my father, he had three nephews, and for each of them he caused a box of bricks to be made by an out-of-work carpenter. Not the insufficient supply of the toy shop, you understand, but a really adequate quantity of bricks made out of oak and shaped and smoothed, bricks about five inches by two and a half by one, and half bricks and quarter bricks to correspond. There were hundreds of them, many hundreds. I could build six towers as high as myself with them, and there seemed quite enough for every engineering project I could undertake. I could build whole towns with streets and houses and churches and citadels. I could bridge every gap in the oil cloth and make causeways over crumpled spaces, which I feigned to be morasses, and on a keel of whole bricks it was possible to construct ships to push over the high seas to the remotest port in the room. And a disciplined population that rose at last by sedulous begging on birthdays and all convenient occasions to well over two hundred of lead sailors and soldiers, horse, foot and artillery, inhabited this world. Justice has never been done to bricks and soldiers by those who write about toys. The praises of the toy theatre have been a common theme for essayists, the planning of the scenes, the painting and cutting out of the cast, penny plain tuppence coloured, the stink and glory of the performance, and the final conflagration. I had such a theatre once, but I never loved it, nor hoped for much from it. My bricks and soldiers were my perpetual drama. I recall an incessant variety of interests. There was the mystery and charm of the complicated buildings one could make, with long passages and steps and windows through which one peeped into their intricacies, and by means of slips of card one could make slanting ways in them, and send marbles rolling from top to base, and thence out into the hold of a waiting ship. Then there were the fortresses and gun emplacements and covered ways in which one's soldiers went, and there was commerce, the shops and markets and storerooms, full of nasturtium seed, thrift seed, lupin beans and such like provender from the garden. Such stuff one stored in matchboxes and pillboxes, or packed in sacks of old glove fingers, tied up with thread and sent off by wagons along the great military road to the beleaguered fortress on the Indian frontier, beyond the worn places that were dismal swamps. And there were battles on the way. That great road is still clear in my memory. I was given, I forget by what benefactor, certain particularly fierce red Indians of lead, I have never seen such soldiers since, and for these my father helped me to make tepes of brown paper, and I settled them in a hitherto desolate country under the frowning nail-studded cliffs of an ancient trunk. Then I conquered them and garrisoned their land. Alas, they died, no doubt through contact with civilization, one my mother trod on, and their land became a wilderness again, and was ravaged for a time by a clockwork crocodile of vast proportions. And out towards the coal scuttle was a region near the impassable thickets of the ragged hearthrug where lived certain China Zulus brandishing spears, and a mountain country of rudely piled bricks concealing the most devious and enchanting caves, and several mines of gold and silver paper. 
Among these rocks, a number of survivors from a Noah's Ark made a various, dangerous, albeit frequently invalid and crippled fauna, and I was wont to increase the uncultivated wildness of this region further by trees of privet twigs from the garden hedge and box from the garden borders. By these territories went my imperial road, carrying produce to and fro, bridging gaps in the oil cloth, tunnelling through encyclopaedic hills. One tunnel was three volumes long, defended as occasion required by camps of paper tents or brick blockhouses, and ending at last in a magnificently engineered ascent to a fortress on the cliffs commanding the Indian reservation. My games upon the floor must have spread over several years and developed from small beginnings, incorporating now this suggestion and now that. They stretch, I suppose, from seven to eleven or twelve. I played them intermittently, and they bulk now in the retrospect far more significantly than they did at the time. I played them in bursts, and then forgot them for long periods, through the spring and summer I was mostly out of doors, and school and classes caught me early. And in the retrospect I see them all not only magnified and transfigured, but foreshortened and confused together. A clockwork railway, I seem to remember, came and went, one or two clockwork boats, toy sailing ships, that being keeled would do nothing but lie on their beam ends on the floor. A detestable lot of cavalry men, undersized and gilt all over, given me by a maiden aunt, and very much what one might expect from an aunt, that I used as Nero used his Christians to ornament my public buildings. And I finally melted some into fratricidal bullets, and therewith blew the rest to flat splashes of lead by means of a brass cannon in the garden. I find this empire of the floor much more vivid and detailed in my memory now than many of the owners of the skirts and legs and boots that went gingerly across its territories. Occasionally, alas, they stooped to scrub, abolishing in one universal destruction the slow growth of whole days of civilised development. I still remember the hatred and disgust of these catastrophes. Like Noah, I was given warnings. Did I disregard them, coarse red hands would descend, plucking garrisons from fortresses and sailors from ships, jumbling them up in their wrong boxes, clumsily, so that their rifles and swords were broken, sweeping the splendid curves of the imperial road into heaps of ruins, casting the jungle growth of Zululand into the fire. "'Well, Master Dick,' the voice of this cosmic calamity would say, "'you ought to have put them away last night. "'No, I can't wait until you've sailed them all away in ships. i got my work to do, and do it I will.' and in no time all my continents and lands were swirling water and swiping strokes of house flannel. That was the worst of my giant visitants, but my mother too, dear lady, was something of a terror to this microcosm. She wore spring-sided boots, a kind of boot now vanished, I believe, from the world, with dull bodies and shiny toes, and a silk dress with flounces that were very destructive to the more hazardous viaducts of the imperial road. She was always, I seem to remember, fetching me, fetching me for a meal, fetching me for a walk, or, detestable absurdity, fetching me for a wash and brush up, and she never seemed to understand anything whatever of the political systems across which she came to me. Also she forbade all toys on Sundays except the bricks for church building and the soldiers for church parade, or a scriptural use of the remains of the Noah's Ark mixed up with a wooden Swiss dairy farm. But she really did not know whether a thing was a church or not, unless it positively bristled with cannon, and many a Sunday afternoon have I played Chicago, with the fear of God in my heart, under an infidel pretense that it was a new sort of ark, rather elaborately done. Chicago, I must explain, was based upon my father's description of the pig slaughterings in that city, and certain pictures I had seen. 
You made your beasts, which were all the ark lot really, provisionally conceived as pigs, go up elaborate approaches to a central pen, from which they went down a cardboard slide four at a time, and dropped most satisfyingly down a brick shaft, and pit a litter over some steep steps, to where a head slaughter man, nay Noah, strung a cotton loop round their legs, and sent them by pin-hooks along a wire to a second slaughter man with a chipped foot, formerly Mrs. Noah, who, if I remember rightly, converted them into army sausage by means of a portion of the inside of an old alarum clock. My mother did not understand my games, but my father did. He wore bright-collared socks and carpet slippers when he was indoors, my mother disliked boots in the house, and he would sit down on my little chair and survey the microcosm on the floor with admirable understanding and sympathy. It was he who gave me most of my toys, and, I more than suspect, most of my ideas. Here's some corrugated iron, he would say, suitable for roofs and fencing, and hand me a lump of that stiff crinkled paper that is used for packing medicine bottles, or, Dick, do you see the tiger loose near the Imperial Road? Won't do for your cattle ranch. And I would find a bright new lead tiger, like a special creation, at large in the world, and demanding a hunting expedition, and much elaborate effort to get him safely housed in the city menagerie beside the captured dragon crocodile, tame now, and his key lost, and the heart and spring gone out of him. And to the various irregular reading of my father, I owe the inestimable blessing of never having a boy's book in my boyhood except those of Jules Verne. But my father used to get books for himself and me from the Bromstead Institute, Fenimore Cooper and Maine Reed and Illustrated Histories, one of the Russo-Turkish War and one of Napier's expedition to Abyssinia I read from end to end, Stanley and Livingston, Lives of Wellington, Napoleon and Garibaldi, and back volumes of Punch, from which I derive conceptions of foreign and domestic politics it has taken years of adult reflection to correct. And at home permanently we had Wood's Natural History, a brand new illustrated Green's History of the English People, Irving's Companions of Columbus, a great number of unbound parts of some geographical work, a voyage round the world, I think it was called, with pictures of foreign places, and Clark's New Testament with a map of Palestine, and a variety of other informing books bought at sales. There was a Sowerby's Botany also, with thousands of carefully tinted pictures of British plants, and one or two other important works in the sitting room. I was allowed to turn these over and even lie on the floor with them on Sundays and other occasions of exceptional cleanliness. And in the attic I found one day a very old forgotten map after the fashion of a bird's eye view, representing the Crimea that fascinated me and kept me for hours navigating its waters with a pin. 2. My father was a lank-limbed man in easy shabby tweed clothes and with his hands in his trouser pockets. He was a science teacher, taking a number of classes at the Bromstead Institute in Kent under the old science and art department and visiting various schools. And our resources were eked out by my mother's income of nearly a hundred pounds a year and by his inheritance of a terrace of three palatial but structurally unsound stucco houses near Bromstead Station. They were big clumsy residences in the earliest Victorian style, interminably high and with deep damp basements and downstairs coal cellars and kitchens that suggested an architect vindictively devoted to the discomfort of the servant class. If so, he had overreached himself and defeated his end, for no servant would stay in them, unless for exceptional wages, or exceptional tolerance of inefficiency, or exceptional freedom in repartee. Every story in the house was from twelve to fifteen feet high, which would have been cool and pleasant in a hot climate, and the stairs went steeply up, to end at last in attics too inaccessible for occupation. 
The ceilings had vast plaster cornices of classical design, fragments of which would sometimes fall unexpectedly, and the wallpapers were bold and gigantic in pattern, and much variegated by damp and ill-mended rents. As my father was quite unable to let more than one of these houses at a time, and that for the most part to eccentric and undesirable tenants, he thought it politic to live in one of the two others, and devote the rent he received from the let one, when it was let, to the incessant necessary repairing of all three. He also did some of the repairing himself, and smoking a bulldog pipe the while, which my mother would not allow him to do in the house, he cultivated vegetables in a sketchy, unpunctual, and not always successful manner in the unoccupied gardens. The three houses faced north, and the back of the one we occupied was covered by a grapevine that yielded, I remember, small green grapes for pies in the spring, and imperfectly ripe black grapes in favourable autumns for the purposes of dessert. The grapevine played an important part in my life, for my father broke his neck while he was pruning it when I was thirteen. My father was what is called a man of ideas, but they were not always good ideas. My grandfather had been a private schoolmaster and one of the founders of the College of Preceptors, and my father had assisted him in his school until increasing competition and diminishing attendance had made it evident that the days of small private schools kept by unqualified persons were numbered. Thereupon my father had roused himself and had qualified as a science teacher under the science and art department, which in these days had charge of the scientific and artistic education of the mass of the English population, and had thrown himself into science teaching and the earning of government grants, therefore, with great, if transitory, zeal and success. I do not remember anything of my father's earlier and more energetic time. I was the child of my parents' middle years. They married when my father was thirty-five and my mother passed forty, and I saw only the last decadent phase of his educational career. The science and art department has vanished altogether from the world, and people are forgetting it now with the utmost readiness and generosity. Part of its substance and staff and spirit survive, more or less completely digested, into the Board of Education. The world does move on, even in its government. It is wonderful how many of the clumsy and limited governing bodies of my youth and early manhood have given place now to more scientific and efficient machinery. When I was a boy, Bromstead, which is now a borough, was ruled by a strange body called a local board, it was the age of boards, and I still remember indistinctly my father rejoicing at the breakfast table over the liberation of London from the corrupt and devastating control of a metropolitan board of works. Then there were also school boards. I was already practically in politics before the London school board was absorbed by the spreading tentacles of the London County Council. It gives a measure of the newness of our modern ideas of the state to remember that the very beginnings of public education lie within my father's lifetime, and that many most intelligent and patriotic people were shocked beyond measure at the state doing anything of the sort. When he was born, totally illiterate people who could neither read a book nor write more than perhaps a clumsy signature were to be found everywhere in England, and great masses of the population were getting no instruction at all. Only a few schools flourished upon the patronage of exceptional parents. All over the country, the old endowed grammar schools were to be found sinking and dwindling. Many of them had closed altogether. In the new great centres of population, multitudes of children were sweated in the factories, darkly ignorant and wretched, and the under-equipped and understaffed national and British schools, supported by voluntary contributions and sectarian rivalries, made an ineffectual fight against this festering darkness. It was a condition of affairs clamouring for remedies, but there was an immense amount of indifference and prejudice to be overcome before any remedies were possible. 
Perhaps some day some industrious and lucid historian will disentangle all the muddle of impulses and antagonisms, the commercialism, utilitarianism, obstinate conservatism, humanitarian enthusiasm, out of which our present educational organisation arose. I have long since come to believe it necessary that all new social institutions should be born in confusion, and that at first they should present chiefly crude and ridiculous aspects. The distrust of government in the Victorian days was far too great, and the general intelligence far too low, to permit the state to go about the new business it was taking up in a business-like way, to train teachers, build and equip schools, endow pedagogic research, and provide properly written school books. These things, it was felt, must be provided by individual and local effort, and since it was manifest that it was individual and local effort that were in default, it was reluctantly agreed to stimulate them by money payments. The state set up a machinery of examination, both in science and art, and for the elementary schools, and payments, known technically as grants, were made in accordance with the examination results attained to such schools as Providence might see fit to send into the world. In this way it was felt the demand would be established that would, according to the beliefs of that time, inevitably ensure the supply. An industry of grant earning was created, and this would give education as a necessary by-product. In the end, this belief was found to need qualification, but grant earning was still in full activity when I was a small boy. So far as the science and art department and my father are concerned, the task of examination was entrusted to eminent scientific men, for the most part quite unaccustomed to teaching. You see, if they also were teaching similar classes to those they examined, it was feared that injustice might be done. Year after year, these eminent persons set questions and employed subordinates to read and mark the increasing thousands of answers that ensued, and having no doubt the national ideal of fairness well developed in their minds, they were careful each year to re-read the preceding papers before composing the current one, in order to see what it was usual to ask. As a result of this, in the course of a few years, the recurrence and permutation of questions became almost calculable, and since the practical object of the teaching was to teach people not science, but how to write answers to these questions, the industry of grant earning assumed a form easily distinguished from any kind of genuine education whatever. Other remarkable compromises had also to be made with the spirit of the age. The unfortunate conflict between religion and science prevalent at this time was mitigated, if I remember rightly, by making graduates in arts and priests in the established church science teachers ex officio, and leaving local and private enterprise to provide schools, diagrams, books, material, according to the conceptions of efficiency prevalent in the district. Private enterprise made a particularly good thing of the books. A number of competing firms of publishers sprang into existence specialising in science and art department work. They set themselves to produce textbooks that should supply exactly the quantity and quality of knowledge necessary for every stage of each of five and twenty subjects into which desirable science was divided, and copies and models and instructions that should give precisely the method and gestures esteemed as proficiency in art. Every section of each book was written in the idiom found to be most satisfactory to the examiners, and test questions extracted from papers set in former years were appended to every chapter. By means of these last, the teacher was able to train his class to the very highest level of grant-earning efficiency, and very naturally he cast all other methods of exposition aside. First he posed his pupils with questions, and then dictated model replies. That was my father's method of instruction. I attended his classes as an elementary grant earner from the age of ten until his death. And it is so I remember him, 
sitting on the edge of a table, smothering a yawn occasionally, and giving out the infallible formulae to the industriously scribbling class sitting in rows of desks before him. Occasionally he would slide to his feet and go to a blackboard on an easel and draw on that very slowly and deliberately in coloured chalks a diagram for the class to copy in coloured pencils, and sometimes he would display a specimen or arrange an experiment for them to see. The room in the institute in which he taught was equipped with a certain amount of apparatus prescribed as necessary for subject this and subject that by the science and art department, and this my father would supplement with maps and diagrams and drawings of his own. But he never really did experiments, except that in the class in systematic botany he sometimes made us tease common flowers to pieces. He did not do experiments if he could possibly help it, because in the first place they used up time and gas for the Bunsen burner and good material in a ruinous fashion and in the second they were, in his rather careless and sketchy hands, apt to endanger the apparatus of the Institute and even the lives of his students. Then thirdly, real experiments involved washing up, and moreover they always turned out wrong and sometimes misled the too observant learner very seriously and opened demoralising controversies. Quite early in life I acquired an almost ineradicable sense of the unscientific perversity of nature and the impassable gulf that is fixed between systematic science and elusive fact. I knew, for example, that in science, whether it be subject 12, organic chemistry, or subject 17, animal physiology, when you blow into a glass of lime water, it instantly becomes cloudy, and if you continue to blow, it clears again, whereas in truth you may blow into the stuff from the lime water bottle until you are crimson in the face and painful under the ears, and it never becomes cloudy at all. And I knew, too, that in science, if you put potassium chlorate into a retort and heat it over a Bunsen burner, oxygen is disengaged and may be collected over water, whereas in real life, if you do anything of the sort, the vessel cracks with a loud report, the potassium chlorate descends sizzling upon the flame, the experimenter says, oh damn, with astonishing heartiness and distinctness, and a lady student in the back seats gets up and leaves the room. Science is the organised conquest of nature, and I can quite understand that ancient libertine refusing to cooperate in her own undoing. And I can quite understand, too, my father's preference for what he called an illustrative experiment, which was simply an arrangement of the apparatus in front of the class, with nothing whatever by way of material, and the Bunsen burner clean and cool, and then a slow, luminous description of just what you did put in it when you were so ill-advised as to carry the affair beyond illustration, and just exactly what ought anyhow to happen when you did. He had considerable powers of vivid expression, so that in this way he could make us see all he described. The class, freed from any unpleasant nervous tension, could draw this still life without flinching and if any part was too difficult to draw, then my father would produce a simplified version on the blackboard to be copied instead, and he would also write on the blackboard any exceptionally difficult but grant-earning words, such as empyreumatic or botryoidal. Some words in constant use he rarely explained. I remember once sticking up my hand and asking him in the full flow of description, Please, sir, what is flocculent? The precipitate is. Yes, sir, but what does it mean? Oh, flocculent, said my father. Flocculent, why? He extended his hand and arm and twiddled his fingers for a second in the air. Like that, he said. I thought the explanation sufficient, but he paused for a moment after giving it. As in a flock bed, you know, he added and resumed his discourse. 3. 
My father, I am afraid, carried a natural incompetence in practical affairs to an exceptionally high level. He combined practical incompetence, practical enterprise, and a thoroughly sanguine temperament in a manner that I have never seen paralleled in any human being. He was always trying to do new things in the briskest manner, under the suggestion of books or papers or his own spontaneous imagination, and as he had never been trained to do anything whatever in his life properly, his futilities were extensive and thorough. At one time he nearly gave up his classes for intensive culture, so enamoured was he of its possibilities. The peculiar pungency of the manure he got in pursuit of a chemical theory of his own has scarred my olfactory memories for a lifetime. The intensive culture phase is very clear in my memory. It came near the end of his career and when I was between eleven and twelve. I was mobilised to gather caterpillars on several occasions, and assisted in nocturnal raids upon the slugs by lantern light that wrecked my preparation work for school next day. My father dug up both lawns, and trenched and manured in spasms of immense vigour, alternating with periods of paralysing distaste for the garden. And for weeks he talked about eight hundred pounds an acre at every meal. A garden, even when it is not exasperated by intensive methods, is a thing as exacting as a baby. Its moods have to be watched. It does not wait upon the cultivator's convenience, but has times of its own. Intensive culture greatly increases this disposition to trouble mankind. It makes a garden touchy and hysterical, a drugged and demoralised and over-irritated garden. My father got at cross-purposes with our two patches at an early stage. Everything grew wrong from the first to last, and if my father's manures intensified nothing else, they certainly intensified the primordial curse. The peas were eaten in the night before they were three inches high, the beans bore nothing but blight, the only apparent result of a spraying of the potatoes was to develop a penchant in the cat for being ill indoors. The cucumber frames were damaged by the catapulting of boys going down the lane at the back, and all your cucumbers were mysteriously embittered. That lane, with its occasional passers-by, did much to wreck the intensive scheme, because my father always stopped work and went indoors if anyone watched him. His special manure was apt to arouse a troublesome spirit of inquiry in hardy natures. In digging his rows and shaping his patches, he neglected the guiding string and trusted to his eye altogether too much, and the consequent obliquity and the various windbreaks and scarecrows he erected, and particularly an irrigation contrivance he began and never finished, by which everything was to be watered at once by means of pieces of gutter from the roof and outhouses of number two, and a large and particularly obstinate clump of elder bushes in the abolished hedge that he had failed to destroy entirely either by axe or by fire, combined to give the gardens, under intensive culture, a singularly desolate and disorderly appearance. He took steps towards the diversion of our house drain under the influence of the Sewage Utilisation Society, but happily he stopped in time. He hardly completed any of the operations he began. Something else became more urgent, or simply he tired. A considerable area of the number two territory was never even dug up. In the end, the affair irritated him beyond endurance. Never was a man less horticulturally minded. The clamour of these vegetables he had launched into the world for his service and assistance wore out his patience. He would walk into the garden the happiest of men after a day or so of disregard, talking to me of history perhaps, or social organisation, or summarising some book he had read. He talked to me of anything that interested him, regardless of my limitations. Then he would begin to note the growth of the weeds. This won't do, he would say, and pull up a handful. More weeding would follow, and the talk would become fragmentary. His hands would become earthy, his nails black, 
weeds would snap off in his careless grip, leaving the roots behind. The world would darken. He would look at his fingers with disgusted astonishment. Curse these weeds, he would say from his heart. His discourse was at an end. I have memories, too, of his sudden unexpected charges into the tranquillity of the house, his hands and clothes intensively enriched. He would come in like a whirlwind. This damn stuff all over me, and the agricultural chemistry class at six. Bah! Ah! My mother would never learn not to attempt to break him of swearing on such occasions. She would remain standing a little stiffly in the scullery, refusing to assist him to the adjectival towel he saw. If you say such things... He would dance with rage and hurl the soap about. The towel! he would cry, flicking suds from big fingers in every direction. The towel! I'll let the blithering class slide if you don't give me the towel. I'll give up everything. I tell you everything. At last, with the failure of the lettuces, came the breaking point. I was in the little arbour, learning Latin irregular verbs, when it happened. I can see him still, his peculiar tenor voice still echoes in my brain, shouting his opinion of intensive culture for all the world to hear, and slashing away at that abominable mockery of a crop with a hoe. We had tied them up with bast only a week or so before, and now half were rotten and half had shot up into tall slender growths. He had the hoe in both hands and slogged, great wipes he made, and at each stroke he said, Take that! The air was thick with flying fragments of abortive salad. It was a fantastic massacre. It was the French revolution of that cold tyranny, the vindictive overthrow of the pampered vegetable aristocrats. After he had assuaged his passion upon them, he turned for other prey. He kicked holes in two of our noblest marrows, flicked off the heads of half a row of artichokes, and shied the hoe with a splendid smash into the cucumber frame. Something of the awe of that moment returns to me as I write of it. "'Well, my boy,' he said, approaching with an expression of beneficent happiness, "'I've done with gardening. Let's go for a walk like reasonable beings. I've had enough of this.' His face was convulsed for an instant with bitter resentment, pandering to cabbages. End of chapter 2, section 1「2, Section 2 of The New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 4. That afternoon's walk sticks in my memory for many reasons. One is that we went further than I had ever been before, far beyond Keston and nearly to Sevenoaks, coming back by train from Dunton Green. And the other is that my father, as he went along, talked about himself, not so much to me as to himself, and about life, and what he had done with it. He monologued so that at times he produced an effect of weird world forgetfulness. I listened puzzled, and at that time not understanding many things that afterwards became plain to me. It is only in recent years that I have discovered the pathos of that monologue, how friendless my father was, and uncompanioned in his thoughts and feelings, and what a hunger he may have felt for the sympathy of the undeveloped youngster who trotted by his side. "'I'm no gardener,' he said. "'I'm no anything. Why the devil did I start gardening? I suppose man was created to mind a garden, but the fool let us out of that. What was I created for? God, what was I created for?' "'Slaves to matter.' minding inanimate things it doesn't suit me you know i've got no hands and no patience i've mucked about with life mucked about with life he suddenly addressed himself to me and for an instant i started like an eavesdropper discovered 
Whatever you do, boy, whatever you do, make a plan. Make a good plan and stick to it. Find out what life is about. I never have. And set yourself to do whatever you ought to do. I admit it's a puzzle. Those damned houses have been the curse of my life. Stucco white elephants. Beastly cracked stucco with stains of green, black and green, conferva and soot. Property they are. Beware of things, Dick. Beware of things. Before you know where you are and you're waiting on them and minding them, they'll eat your life up, eat up your hours and your blood and energy. When those houses came to me, I ought to have sold them or fled the country. I ought to have cleared out, sarcophagi, eaters of men. Oh, the hours and days of work, the nights of anxiety those vile houses have cost me. The painting, it worked up my arms, it got all over me. I stank of it, it made me ill. It isn't living, it's minding. Property's the curse of life. Property, ugh! Oh, look at this country all cut up into silly little parallelograms. Look at all those villas we passed just now, and those potato patches, and that tarred shanty and the hedge. Somebody's minding every bit of it like a dog tied to a cart's tail, patching it and bothering about it, bothering, yapping at every passer-by. Look at that notice-board. One rotten, worried little beast wants to keep us other rotten little beasts off his patch. God knows why. Look at the weeds in it. Look at the mended fence. There's no property worth having, Dick, but money. That's only good to spend, all these things. Human souls buried under a cartload of blithering rubbish. I'm not a fool, Dick. I have qualities. Imagination. A sort of go. I ought to have made a better thing of life. I'm sure I could have done things. Only the old people pulled my leg. They started me wrong. They never started me at all. I only began to find out what life was like when I was nearly forty. If I'd gone to a university, if I'd had any sort of sound training, if I hadn't slipped into the haphazard places that came easiest, nobody warned me. Nobody. It isn't a world we live in, Dick. It's a cascade of accidents. It's a chaos exasperated by policemen. You be warned in time, Dick. You stick to a plan. Don't wait for anyone to show you the way. Nobody will. There isn't a way till you make one. Get education. Get a good education. Fight your way to the top. It's your only chance. I've watched you. You'll do no good at digging and property minding. There isn't a neighbour in Bromstead won't be able to skin you at such like games. You and I are the brainy, unstable kind. Topside or nothing. And if ever those blithering houses come to you, don't have them. Give them away. Dynamite them. And off. Live, Dick. I'll get rid of them for you if I can, Dick. But remember what I say. So it was my father discoursed, if not in those particular words, yet exactly in that manner, as he slouched along the southward road, with resentful eyes becoming less resentful as he talked and flinging out clumsy, illustrative motions at the outskirts of Bromstead as we passed along them. That afternoon he hated Bromstead from its foot towering pebbles up. He had no illusions about Bromstead or himself. I have the clearest impression of him in his garden-stained tweeds with a deer stalker hat on the back of his head, and presently a pipe, sometimes between his teeth and sometimes in his gesticulating hand, as he became diverted by his talk from his original exasperation. This particular afternoon is no doubt mixed up in my memory with many other afternoons. All sorts of things my father said and did at different times have got themselves referred to it. It filled me at the time with a great unprecedented sense of fellowship, and it has become the symbol now for all our intercourse together. If I didn't understand the things he said, I did the mood he was in. He gave me two very broad ideas in that talk, 
and the talks I have mingled with it. He gave them to me very clearly, and they have remained fundamental in my mind. One, a sense of the extraordinary confusion and waste and planlessness of the human life that went on all about us, and the other of a great ideal of order and economy, which he called variously science and civilization, and which, though I do not remember that he ever used that word, I suppose many people nowadays would identify with socialism, as the Fabians expound it. He was not very definite about this science, you must understand, but he seemed always to be waving his hand towards it, just as his contemporary Tennyson seems always to be doing. He belonged to his age, and mostly his talk was destructive of the limited beliefs of his time. He led me to infer, rather than actually told me, that this science was coming, a spirit of light and order, to the rescue of a world groaning and travailing in muddle for the want of it. 5. When I think of Bromstead nowadays, I find it inseparably bound up with the disorders of my father's gardening, and the odd patchings and paintings that disfigured his houses. It was all of a piece with that. Let me try and give something of the quality of Bromstead and something of its history. It is the quality and history of a thousand places round and about London and round and about the other great centres of population in the world. Indeed, it is in a measure the quality of the whole of this modern world from which we who have the statesman's passion struggle to evolve and dream still of evolving order. First, then, you must think of Bromstead a hundred and fifty years ago as a narrow, irregular little street of thatched houses strung out on the London and Dover Road, a little mellow sample unit of a social order that had a kind of completeness at its level of its own. At that time, its population numbered a little under two thousand people, mostly engaged in agricultural work, or in trade serving agriculture. There was a blacksmith, a saddler, a chemist, a doctor, a barber, a linen draper who brewed his own beer, a veterinary surgeon, a hardware shop, and two capacious inns. Round and about it were a number of pleasant gentlemen's seats, whose owners went frequently to London town in their coaches along the very tolerable high road. The church was big enough to hold the whole population, were people minded to go to church, and indeed a large proportion did go, and all who married were married in it, and everybody to begin with was christened at its font and buried at last in its yew-shaded graveyard. Everybody knew everybody in the place. It was, in fact, a definite place and a real human community in those days. There was a pleasant old market house in the middle of the town with a weekly market and an annual fair at which much cheerful merry-making and homely intoxication occurred. There was a pack of hounds which hunted within five miles of London Bridge and the local gentry would occasionally enliven the place with valiant cricket matches for a hundred guineas a side to the vast excitement of the entire population. It was very much the same sort of place that it had been for three or four centuries. A Bromstead Rip Van Winkle from 1550 returning in 1750 would have found most of the old houses still as he had known them, the same trades a little improved and differentiated one from the other, the same roads rather more carefully tended, the inns not very much altered, the ancient familiar market house. The occasional wheeled traffic would have struck him as the most remarkable difference, next perhaps to the swaggering painted stone monuments instead of brasses, and the Protestant severity of the communion table in the parish church, both from the material point of view very little things. A Rip Van Winkle from 1350 again would have noticed scarcely greater changes, fewer clergy, more people, and particularly more people of the middling sort the glass in the windows of many of the houses, the stylish chimneys springing up everywhere would have impressed him, and such like details. The place would have had the same boundaries, the same broad essential features, would have been still itself in the way that a man is still himself after he has filled out a little, 
and grown a longer beard and changed his clothes. But after 1750, something got hold of the world, something that was destined to alter the scale of every human affair. That something was machinery, and a vague energetic disposition to improve material things. In another part of England, ingenious people were beginning to use coal in smelting iron, and were producing metal in abundance, and metal castings in sizes that had hitherto been unattainable. Without warning or preparation, increment involving countless possibilities of further increment was coming to the strength of horses and men. Power, all unsuspected, was flowing like a drug into the veins of the social body. Nobody seems to have perceived this coming of power, and nobody had calculated its probable consequences. Suddenly, almost inadvertently, people found themselves doing things that would have amazed their ancestors. They began to construct wheeled vehicles much more easily and cheaply than they had ever done before, to make up roads and move things about that had formerly been esteemed too heavy for locomotion, to join woodwork with iron nails instead of wooden pegs, to achieve all sorts of mechanical possibilities to trade more freely and manufacture on a larger scale, to send goods abroad in a wholesale and systematic way, to bring back commodities from overseas, not simply spices and fine commodities, but goods in bulk. The new influence spread to agriculture. Iron appliances replaced wooden, breeding of stock became systematic, paper-making and printing increased and cheapened. Roofs of slate and tile appeared amidst and presently prevailed over the original Bromstead thatch. The huge space of common to the south was extensively enclosed, and what had been an ill-defined horse-track to Dover, only passable by adventurous coaches in dry weather, became the Dover Road, and was presently the route first of one and then of several daily coaches. The high street was discovered to be too tortuous for these awakening energies, and a new road cut off its worst contortions. Residential villas appeared, occupied by retired tradesmen and widows, who esteemed the place healthy, and by others of a strange new unoccupied class of people who had money invested in joint-stock enterprises. First one and then several boys' boarding schools came, drawing their pupils from London. My grandfather's was one of these. London, twelve miles to the northwest, was making itself felt more and more. But this was only the beginning of the growth period, the first trickle of the coming flood of mechanical power. Away in the north they were casting iron in bigger and bigger forms, working their way to the production of steel on a large scale, applying power in factories. Bromstead had almost doubled in size again long before the railway came. There was hardly any thatch left in the high street, but instead were houses with handsome brass-knockered front doors and several windows, and shops with shop fronts all of square glass panes, and the place was lighted publicly now by oil lamps. Previously only one flickering lamp outside each of the coaching inns had broken the nocturnal darkness. And there was talk, it long remained talk, of gas. The gas works came in 1834, and about that date my father's three houses must have been built convenient for the London road. They mark nearly the beginning of the real suburban quality. They were let at first to city people, still engaged in business. And then hard on the gas works had come the railway and cheap coal. There was a wild outbreak of brickfields upon the clay lands to the east, and the great growth had begun in earnest. The agricultural placidities that had formerly come to the very borders of the high street were broken up north, west and south by new roads. This enterprising person and then that began to run up houses, irrespective of every other enterprising person who was doing the same thing. A local board came into existence, and with much hesitation and penny-wise economy, inaugurated drainage works. Rates became a common topic, a fact of accumulating importance. Several chapels of zinc and iron appeared, 
and also a white new church in commercial gothic upon the common and another of red brick in the residential district out beyond the brickfields towards chessington the population doubled again and doubled again and became particularly teeming in the prolific working-class district about the deep-rutted, muddy, coal-blackened roads between the gas-works, Blodgett's laundries, and the railway goods-yard. Weekly properties, that is to say small houses, built by small property owners and let by the week, sprang up also in the cage fields, and presently extended right up the London road. A single national school in an inconvenient situation set itself inadequately to collect subscriptions and teach the swarming, sniffing, grimy offspring of this dingy new population to read. The villages of Beckington, which used to be three miles to the west and blamely four miles to the east of Bromstead, were experiencing similar distensions and proliferations and grew out to meet us. All effect of locality or community had gone from these places long before I was born. Hardly any one knew any one. There was no general meeting place any more. The old fairs were just common nuisances, haunted by gypsies, van showmen, cheap jacks and London roughs. The churches were incapable of a quarter of the population. One or two local papers of shameless veniality reported the proceedings of the local bench and the local board, compelled tradesmen who were interested in these affairs to advertise, used the epithet Bromsteadian as one expressing peculiar virtues, and so maintained in the general mind a weak tradition of some local quality that embraced us all. Then the parish graveyard filled up and became a scandal, and an ambitious area with an air of appetite was walled in by a Bromstead cemetery company and planted with suitably high-minded and sorrowful varieties of conifer. A stonemason took one of the earlier villas with a front garden at the end of the high street and displayed a supply of urns on pillars and headstones and crosses in stone, marble and granite, that would have sufficed to commemorate in elaborate detail the entire population of Bromstead as one found it in 1750. The cemetery was made when I was a little boy of five or six. I was in the full tide of building and growth from the first. The second railway, with its station at Bromstead North, and the drainage, followed when I was ten or eleven, and all my childish memories are of digging and wheeling, of woods invaded by building, roads gashed open and littered with iron pipes amidst a fearful smell of gas, of men peeped at and seen toiling away deep down in excavations, of hedges broken down and replaced by planks, of wheelbarrows and builders' sheds, of rivulets overtaken and swallowed up by drain pipes big trees and especially elms cleared of undergrowth and left standing amid such things acquired a peculiar tattered dinginess rather in the quality of needy widow women who have seen happier days the ravensbrook of my earlier memories was a beautiful stream it came into my world out of a mysterious beyond out of a garden splashing brightly down a weir which had once been the weir of a mill above the weir and inaccessible there were bulrushes growing in splendid clumps and beyond that pampas grass yellow and crimson spikes of hollyhock and blue suggestions of wonderland from the pool at the foot of this initial cascade it flowed in a leisurely fashion beside a footpath there were two pretty thatched cottages on the left and here were ducks and there were willows on the right and so came to where great trees grew on high banks on either hand and bowed closer, and at last met overhead. This part was difficult to reach because of an old fence, but a little boy might glimpse that long cavern of greenery by wading. Either I have actually seen kingfishers there, or my father has described them so accurately to me that he inserted them into my memory. I remember them there anyhow, most of that overhung part I never penetrated at all, but followed the field path with my mother and met the stream again, where beyond there were flat meadows, ropers' meadows. 
The Ravensbrook went meandering across the middle of these, now between steep banks and now with wide shadows at the bends where the cattle waded and drank. Yellow and purple loose strife and ordinary rushes grew in clumps along the bank, and now and then a willow. On rare occasions of rapture one might see a rat cleaning his whiskers at the water's edge. The deep places were rich with tangled weeds, and in them fishes lurked, to me they were big fishes, water boatmen and water beetles traversed the calm surface of these still deeps. In one pool were yellow lilies and water soldiers, and in the shoaly places hovering fleets of small fry basked in the sunshine, to vanish in a flash at one's shadow. In one place too were rapids, where the stream woke with a start from a dreamless brooding into foaming panic, and babbled and hastened. Well do I remember that half-mile of rivulet. All other rivers and cascades have their reference to it for me. And after I was eleven, and before we left Bromstead, all the delight and beauty of it was destroyed. The volume of its water decreased abruptly. I suppose the new drainage works that linked us up with Beckington, and made me first acquainted with the geological quality of the London clay, had to do with that, until only a weak uncleansing trickle remained. That at first did not strike me as a misfortune. An adventurous small boy might walk dry-shod in places hitherto inaccessible. But hard upon that came the pegs, the planks and carts, and devastation. Roper's meadows, being no longer in fear of floods, were now to be slashed out into parallelograms of untidy road, and built upon with rows of working-class cottages. The roads came horribly. The houses followed. They seemed to rise in the night. People moved into them as soon as the roofs were on, mostly workmen and their young wives, and already in a year some of these raw houses stood empty again from defaulting tenants, with windows broken, on woodwork warping and rotting. The Ravensbrook became a dump for old iron, rusty cans, abandoned boots and the like, and was a river only when unusual rains filled it for a day or so with an inky flood of surface water. That indeed was my most striking perception in the growth of Bromstead. The Ravensbrook had been important to my imaginative life. That way had always been my first choice in all my walks with my mother, and its rapid swamping by the new urban growth made it indicative of all the other things that had happened just before my time, or were still, at a less dramatic pace, happening. I realised that building was the enemy. I began to understand why in every direction out of Bromstead one walked past scaffold poles into litter, why fragments of broken brick and cinder mingled in every path, and the significance of the universal notice-boards, either white and new, or a year old and torn and battered, promising sites, proffering houses to be sold or let, abusing and intimidating passers-by for fancied trespass and protecting rights of way. It is difficult to disentangle now what I understood at this time, and what I have since come to understand, but it seems to me that even in those childish days I was acutely aware of an invading and growing disorder. The serene rhythms of the old established agriculture I see now were everywhere being replaced by cultivation under notice and snatch crops. Hedges ceased to be repaired and were replaced by cheap iron railings or chunks of corrugated iron. More and more hoardings sprang up and contributed more and more to the no-bad tribes of filthy paper scraps that flew before the wind and overspread the country. The outskirts of Bromstead were a maze of exploitation roads that led nowhere, that ended in tarred fences studded with nails. I don't remember barbed wire in those days, I think the zeitgeist did not produce that until later, and in trespass boards that used vehement language. Broken glass, tin cans and ashes and paper abounded, cheap glass, cheap tin, abundant fuel, and a free untaxed press had rushed upon a world quite unprepared to dispose of these blessings when the fullness of enjoyment was past. 
I suppose one might have persuaded oneself that all this was but the replacement of an ancient tranquillity, or at least an ancient balance, by a new order. Only to my eyes, quickened by my father's intimations, it was manifestly no order at all. It was a multitude of incoordinated fresh starts, each more sweeping and destructive than the last, and none of them ever really worked out to a ripe and satisfactory completion. Each left a legacy of products, houses, humanity, or what not, in its wake. It was a sort of progress that had bolted. It was change out of hand, and going at an unprecedented pace nowhere in particular. No, the Victorian epoch was not the dawn of a new era. It was a hasty trial experiment, a gigantic experiment of the most slovenly and wasteful kind. I suppose it was necessary. I suppose all things are necessary. I suppose that before men will discipline themselves to learn and plan, they must first see in a hundred convincing forms the folly and muddle that come from headlong, aimless and haphazard methods. The nineteenth century was an age of demonstrations, some of them very impressive demonstrations, of the power that have come to mankind, but of permanent achievement what will our descendants cherish? It is hard to estimate what grains of precious metal may not be found in a mud torrent of human production on so large a scale. But will any one a hundred years from now consent to live in the houses the Victorians built, travel by their roads or railways, value the furnishings they made to live among, or esteem, except for curious or historical reasons, their prevalent art, and the clipped and limited literature that satisfied their souls? That age which bore me was indeed a world full of restricted and undisciplined people, overtaken by power, by possessions and great new freedoms, and unable to make any civilised use of them whatever. Stricken now by this idea and now by that, tempted first by one possession and then another to ill-considered attempts, it was my father's exploitation of his villa gardens on the wholesale level. The whole of Bromstead, as I remember it, and as I saw it last, it is a year ago now, is a dull, useless boiling up of human activities, an immense clustering of futilities. It is as unfinished as ever. The builder's roads still run out and end in midfield in their old fashion. The various enterprises jumble in the same hopeless contradiction, if anything intensified. Pretentious villas jostle slums, and public house and tin tabernacle glower at one another across the cat-haunted lot that intervenes. Roper's meadows are now quite frankly a slum. Back doors and sculleries gape towards the railway, their yards are hung with tattered washing unashamed and there seem to be more boards by the railway every time I pass, advertising pills and pickles, tonics and condiments, and such-like solicitudes of a people with no natural health nor appetite left in them. Well, we have to do better. Failure is not failure nor waste wasted if it sweeps away illusion and lights the road to a plan. 6. Chaotic indiscipline, ill-adjusted effort, spasmodic aims, these give the quality of all my Bromstead memories. The crowning one of them all rises to desolating tragedy. I remember now the wan spring sunshine of that Sunday morning, the stiff feeling of best clothes and aggressive cleanliness and formality, when I and my mother returned from church to find my father dead. He had been pruning the grapevine. He had never had a ladder long enough to reach the sill of the third-floor windows. At house-painting time he had borrowed one from the plumber who mixed his paint. And he had, in his own happy-go-lucky way, contrived a combination of the garden fruit ladder with a battered kitchen table that served all sorts of odd purposes in an outhouse. He had stayed up this arrangement by means of the garden roller, and the roller had, at the critical moment, rolled. He was lying close by the garden door, with his head queerly bent back against a broken and twisted rainwater pipe, an expression of pacific contentment on his face, 
a bamboo curtain rod with a table knife tied to the end of it, still gripped in his hand. We had been rapping for some time at the front door, unable to make him hear, and then we came round by the door in the side trellis into the garden, and so discovered him. Arthur! I remember my mother crying with the strangest break in her voice. What are you doing there, Arthur? And Sunday! I was coming behind her, musing remotely, when the quality of her voice roused me. She stood as if she could not go near him. He had always puzzled her so, he and his ways, and this seemed only another enigma. Then the truth dawned on her. She shrieked as if afraid of him, ran a dozen steps back towards the trellis door, and stopped and clasped her ineffectual gloved hands, leaving me staring blankly, too astonished for feeling, at the carelessly flung limbs. The same idea came to me also. I ran to her. Mother! I cried, pale to the depths of my spirit. Is he dead? I had been thinking two minutes before of the cold fruit pie that glorified our Sunday dinner table, and how I might perhaps get into the tree at the end of the garden to read in the afternoon. Now an immense fact had come down like a curtain, and blotted out all my childish world. My father was lying dead before my eyes. I perceived that my mother was helpless, and that things must be done. Mother! I said, we must get Dr. Beasley and carry him indoors. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3, Section 1 of The New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus Scholastic 1. My formal education began in a small preparatory school in Bromstead. I went there as a day boy. The charge for my instruction was mainly set off by the periodic visits of my father with a large bag of battered fossils to lecture to us upon geology. I was one of those fortunate youngsters who take readily to school work. I had a good memory versatile interests and a considerable appetite for commendation and when i was barely twelve i got a scholarship at the city merchant's school and was entrusted with a scholar's railway season ticket to victoria after my father's death a large and very animated and solidly built uncle in tweeds from staffordshire uncle minter my mother's sister's husband with a remarkable accent and remarkable vowel sounds, who had plunged into the Bromstead home once or twice for the night, but who was otherwise unknown to me, came on the scene, sold off the three gaunt houses with the utmost gusto, invested the proceeds of my father's life insurance money, and got us into a small villa at Penge, within sight of that immense façade of glass and iron, the Crystal Palace. Then he retired in a mood of good-natured contempt to his native habitat again. We stayed at Penge until my mother's death. School became a large part of the world to me, absorbing my time and interest, and I never acquired that detailed and intimate knowledge of Penge and the hilly villadim round about that I have of the town and outskirts of Bromstead. It was a district of very much the same character, but it was more completely urbanised and nearer to the centre of things. There were the same unfinished roads, the same occasional disconcerted hedges and trees, the same butcher's horse grazing under a builder's notice board, the same incidental lapses into slum. The Crystal Palace grounds cut off a large part of my walking radius to the west, with impassable fences and forbiddingly expensive turnstiles. But it added to the ordinary spectacle of meteorology a great variety of gratuitous fireworks which banged and flared away of a night after supper and drew me abroad to see them better. Such walks as I took to Croydon, Wimbledon, West Wickham and Greenwich 
impressed upon me the interminable extent of London's residential suburbs. Mile after mile one went, between houses, villas, rows of cottages, streets of shops, under railway arches, over railway bridges. I have forgotten the detailed local characteristics, if there were any, of much of that region altogether. I was only there two years, and half my perambulations occurred at dusk or after dark, but with Penge I associate my first realisations of the wonder and beauty of twilight and night, the effect of dark walls reflecting lamplight, and the mystery of blue haze-veiled hillsides of houses, the glare of shops by night, the glowing steam and streaming sparks of railway trains, and railway signals lit up in the darkness. My first rambles in the evening occurred at Penge, I was becoming a big and independent-spirited boy, and I began my experience of smoking during these twilight prowls with the threepenny packets of American cigarettes then just appearing in the world. My life centred upon the city merchant's school. Usually I caught the 818 for Victoria, I had a midday meal and tea, four nights a week I stayed for preparation, and often I was not back home again until within an hour of my bedtime. I spent my half-holidays at school in order to play cricket and football. This and a pretty voracious appetite for miscellaneous reading, which was fostered by the Penge Middleton Library, did not leave me much leisure for local topography. On Sundays also I sang in the choir at St Martin's Church, and my mother did not like me to walk out alone on the Sabbath afternoon. She herself slumbered, so that I wrote or read at home. I must confess I was at home as little as I could contrive. Home after my father's death had become a very quiet and uneventful place indeed. My mother had either an unimaginative temperament, or her mind was greatly occupied with private religious solicitudes, and I remember her talking to me but little, and that usually upon topics I was anxious to evade. I had developed my own view about low church theology long before my father's death, and my meditation upon that event had finished my secret estrangement from my mother's faith. My reason would not permit even a remote chance of his being in hell, he was so manifestly not evil, and this religion would not permit him a remote chance of being out yet. When I was a little boy, my mother had taught me to read and write and pray, and had done many things for me. Indeed, she persisted in washing me, and even in making my clothes, until I rebelled against these things as indignities. But our minds parted very soon. She never began to understand the mental processes of my play. She never interested herself in my school life and work. She could not understand things I said and she came, I think, quite insensibly to regard me with something of the same hopeless perplexity she had felt towards my father. Him she must have wedded under considerable delusions. I do not think he deceived her indeed, nor do I suspect him of mercenariness in their union, but no doubt he played up to her requirements in the half-ingenuous way that was and still is the quality of most wooing, and presented himself as a very brisk and orthodox young man. I wonder why nearly all love-making has to be fraudulent. Afterwards he must have disappointed her cruelly by letting one aspect after another of his careless, sceptical, experimental temperament appear. Her mind was fixed and definite. She embodied all that confidence in church and decorum and the assurances of the pulpit which was characteristic of the large mass of the English people, for after all the rather low church section was the largest single mass in early Victorian times. She had dreams, I suspect, of going to church with him side by side. She in a little poke bonnet and a large flounce crinoline, all mauve and magenta, and starched under a little lace-trimmed parasol, and he in a tall silk hat and peg-top trousers and a roll-collar coat, and looking rather like the prince consort, white angels almost visibly raining benedictions on their amiable progress. Perhaps she dreamt gently of much belaced babies, and an interestingly pious, but not too dissenting or fanatical little girl or boy or so, also angel-haunted. 
and I think, too, she must have seen herself ruling a seemly home of taste, with a vivarium in the conservatory that opened out of the drawing-room, or again making preserves in the kitchen. My father's science teaching, his diagrams of disemboweled humanity, his pictures of prehistoric beasts that contradicted the flood, his disposition towards soft shirts and loose tweed suits, his inability to use a clothes brush, his spasmodic reading fits and his bulldog pipes, must have jarred cruelly with her rather unintelligent anticipations. His wild moments of violent temper, when he would swear and smash things, absurd, almost lovable storms that passed like summer thunder, must have been starkly dreadful to her. She was constitutionally inadaptable, and certainly made no attempt to understand or tolerate these outbreaks. She tried them by her standards, and by her standards they were wrong. Her standards hid him from her. The blazing things he said rankled in her mind unforgettably. As I remember them together, they chafed constantly. Her attitude to nearly all his moods and all his enterprises was a sceptical disapproval. She treated him as something that belonged to me and not to her. Your father, she used to call him, as though I had got him for her. She had married late, and she had, I think, become mentally self-subsisting before her marriage. Even in those Herne Hill days, I used to wonder what was going on in her mind, and I find that old speculative curiosity return as I write this. She took a considerable interest in the housework that our generally servantless condition put upon her. She used to have a charwoman in two or three times a week, but she did not do it with any great skill. She covered most of our furniture with flouncy, ill-fitting covers, and she cooked plainly and without very much judgment. The Penge house, as it contained nearly all our Bromstead things, was crowded with furniture, and is chiefly associated in my mind with the smell of turpentine, a condiment she used very freely upon the veneered mahogany pieces. My mother had an equal dread of blacks by day and the night air, so that our brightly clean windows were rarely open. She took a morning paper, and she would open it and glance at the headlines, but she did not read it until the afternoon, and then I think she was interested only in the more violent crimes, and in railway and mine disasters, and in the minutest domesticities of the royal family. Most of the books at home were my father's, and I do not think she opened any of them. She had one or two volumes that dated from her own youth, and she tried in vain to interest me in them. There was Miss Strickland's Queens of England, a book I remember with particular animosity, and Queechy in the Wide, Wide World. She made these books of hers into a class apart by sewing outer covers upon them of calico and figured muslin. To me in these habiliments they seem not so much books as confederated old ladies. My mother was also very punctual with her religious duties and rejoiced to watch me in the choir. On winter evenings she occupied an armchair on the other side of the table at which I sat, head on hand reading, and she would be darning stockings or socks or the like. We achieved an effect of rather stuffy comfortableness that was soporific, and in a passive way I think she found these among her happy times. On such occasions she was wont to put her work down on her knees and fall into a sort of thoughtless musing that would last for long intervals and rouse my curiosity. For like most young people, I could not imagine mental states without definite forms. She carried on a correspondence with a number of cousins and friends writing letters in a slanting Italian hand and dealing mainly with births, marriages and deaths, business starts, in the vaguest terms, and the distresses of bankruptcy. And yet, you know, she did have a curious intimate life of her own that I suspected nothing of at the time that only now becomes credible to me. She kept a diary that is still in my possession, a diary of fragmentary entries in a miscellaneous collection of pocket-books. 
She put down the texts of the sermons she heard, and queer, stiff little comments on casual visitors. Miss G, and much noisy, shrieking talk about games and such frivolities and croquet. A delighted and very attentive. Such little human entries abound. She had an odd way of never writing a name, only an initial. My father is always A, and I am always D. It is manifest she followed the domestic events in the life of the Princess of Wales, who is now Queen Mother, with peculiar interest and sympathy. Pray, G, all may be well, she writes in one such crisis. But there are things about myself that I still find too poignant to tell easily. Certain painful and clumsy circumstances of my birth in very great detail, the distresses of my infantile ailments. Then later I find such things as this. Her D. S. The S is evidently swear. G. Bless and keep my boy from evil. And again, with the thin handwriting shaken by distress, D. would not go to church, and hardened his heart, and said wicked infidel things, much disrespect of the clergy. The anthem is tiresome. That men should set up to be wiser than their maker then trebly underlined, I fear his father's teaching. Dreadful little tangle of misapprehensions and false judgments. More comforting for me to read, D very kind and good. He grows more thoughtful every day. I suspect myself of forgotten hypocrisies. At just one point my mother's papers seemed to dip deeper. I think the death of my father must have stirred her for the first time for many years to think for herself. Even she could not go on living in any peace at all, believing that he had indeed been flung headlong into hell. Of this gnawing solicitude she never spoke to me, never, and for her diary also she could find no phrases. But on a loose half-sheet of notepaper between its pages, I find this passage that follows written very carefully. I do not know whose lines they are, nor how she came upon them. They run, And if there be no meeting past the grave, If all is darkness, silence, yet tis rest, Be not afraid, ye waiting hearts that weep, For God still giveth his beloved sleep, And if an endless sleep he wills, so best. That scrap of verse amazed me when I read it. I could even wonder if my mother really grasped the import of what she had copied out. It affected me as if a stone-deaf person had suddenly turned and joined in a whispered conversation. It set me thinking how far a mind, in its general effect quite hopelessly limited, might range. After that I went through all her diaries, trying to find something more than a conventional term of tenderness for my father. But I found nothing. And yet somehow there grew upon me the realisation that there had been love. Her love for me, on the other hand, was abundantly expressed. I knew nothing of that secret life of feeling at the time. Such expression as it found was all beyond my schoolboy range. I did not know when I pleased her, and I did not know when I distressed her. Chiefly I was aware of my mother as rather dull company, as a mind thorny with irrational conclusions and incapable of explication, as one believing quite willfully and irritatingly in impossible things. So I suppose it had to be. Life was coming to me in new forms and with new requirements, it was essential to our situation that we should fail to understand. After this space of years, I have come to realisations and attitudes that dissolve my estrangement from her. I can pierce these barriers. I can see her and feel her as a loving and feeling and desiring and muddle-headed person. There are times when I would have her alive again, if only that I might be kind to her for a little while and give her some return for the narrow, intense affection, the tender desires she evidently lavished so abundantly on me. But then again I ask how I could make that return, and I realise the futility of such dreaming. Her demand was rigid, and to meet it I should need to act and lie. So she whose blood fed me, whose body made me, lies in my memory, as I saw her last, 
fixed, still, infinitely intimate, infinitely remote. My own case with my mother, however, does not awaken the same regret I feel when I think of how she misjudged and irked my father, and turned his weaknesses into thorns for her own tormenting. I wish I could look back without that little twinge to two people who were both in their different quality so good, but goodness that is narrow is a pedestrian and ineffectual goodness. Her attitude to my father seems to me one of the essentially tragic things that have come to me personally, one of those things that nothing can transfigure, that remain sorrowful, that I cannot soothe with any explanation, for as I remember him, he was indeed the most lovable of weak, spasmodic men. But my mother had been trained in a hard and narrow system that made evil out of many things not in the least evil, and inculcated neither kindliness nor charity. All their estrangement followed from that. These cramping cults do indeed take an enormous toll of human love and happiness, and not only that, but what we Machiavellians must needs consider, they make frightful breaches in human solidarity. I suppose I am a deeply religious man, as men of my quality go, but I hate more and more as I grow older the shadow of intolerance cast by religious organisations. All my life has been darkened by irrational intolerance, by arbitrary irrational prohibitions and exclusions. Mahometanism, with its fierce proselytism, has, I suppose, the blackest record of uncharitableness, but most of the Christian sects are tainted, tainted to a degree beyond any of the anterior paganisms, with this same hateful quality. It is their exclusive claim that sends them wrong, the vain ambition that inspires them all to teach a uniform one-sided God and be the one and only gateway to salvation deprecation of all outside the household of faith, an organised undervaluation of heretical goodness and lovableness, follows necessarily. Every petty difference is exaggerated to the quality of a saving grace or a damning defect. Elaborate precautions are taken to shield the believer's mind against broad or amiable suggestions. The faithful are deterred by dark allusions, by sinister warnings, from books, from theatres, from worldly conversation, from all the kindly instruments that mingle human sympathy. For only by isolating its flock can the organisation survive. Every month there came to my mother a little magazine called, if I remember rightly, The Home Churchman, with the combined authority of print and clerical commendation, it was the most evil thing that ever came into the house, a very devil, a thin little pamphlet with one woodcut illustration on the front page of each number. Now the uninviting visage of some exponent of the real and only doctrine and attitudes, now some coral strand in act of welcoming the missionaries of God's mysterious preferences, now a new church in the Victorian Gothic. The vile rag it was, a score of vices that shun the policeman have nothing of its subtle wickedness. It was an outrage upon the natural kindliness of men. The contents were all admirably adjusted to keep a spirit in prison. Their force of sustained suggestion was tremendous. There would be dreadful intimations of the swift retribution that fell upon individuals for Sabbath-breaking, and upon nations for weakening towards ritualism, or treating Roman Catholics as tolerable human beings. There would be great rejoicings over the conversion of alleged Jews, and terrible descriptions of the deathbeds of prominent infidels with boldly invented last words, the most unscrupulous lying. There would be the appallingly edifying careers of early piety lusciously described, or stories of condemned criminals who trace their final ruin unerringly to early laxities of the kind that leads people to give up subscribing to the home churchman. Every month that evil spirit brought about a slump in our mutual love. My mother used to read the thing and become depressed and anxious for my spiritual welfare, used to be stirred to unintelligent pestering. 2. A few years ago I met the editor of this same home churchman. 
It was at one of the weekly dinners of that Fleet Street dining club, the Blackfriars. I heard the paper's name with a queer little shock, and surveyed the man with interest. No doubt he was only a successor of the purveyor of discords who darkened my boyhood. It was amazing to find an influence so terrible embodied in a creature so palpably petty. He was seated some way down a table at right angles to the one at which I sat, a man of mean appearance, with a greyish complexion, thin, with a square nose, a heavy wiry moustache, and a big Adam's apple sticking out between the wings of his collar. He ate with considerable appetite and unconcealed relish, and as his jaw was underhung, he chummed and made the moustache wave like reeds in the swell of a steamer. It gave him a conscientious look. After dinner, he a little forced himself upon me. At that time, though the shadow of my scandal was already upon me, I still seemed to be shaping for great successes, and he was glad to be in conversation with me, and anxious to intimate political sympathy and support. I tried to make him talk of the home churchman and the kindred publications he ran, but he was manifestly ashamed of his job so far as I was concerned. "'One wants,' he said, pitching himself as he supposed in my key, "'to put constructive ideas into our readers, but they are narrow, you know, very narrow, very.' He made his moustache and lips express judicious regret. One has to consider them carefully, one has to respect their attitudes. One dare not go too far with them, one has to feel one's way. He chummed, and the moustache bristled. A hireling, beyond question, catering for a demand. I gathered there was a home in Tufnell Park, and three boys to be fed and clothed and educated. I had the curiosity to buy a copy of his magazine afterwards, and it seemed much the same sort of thing that had worried my mother in my boyhood. There was the usual Christian hero, this time with mutton-chop whiskers and a long bare upper lip. The Jesuits, it seemed, were still hard at it, and heaven frightfully upset about the Sunday opening of museums and the falling birth rate, and as touchy and vindictive as ever. There were two vigorous paragraphs upon the utter damnableness of the Reverend R. J. Campbell, a contagious damnableness, I gathered, one wasn't safe within a mile of Hoban Viaduct, and a foul-mouthed attack on poor little Wilkins the novelist, who was being baited by the moralists at that time for making one of his big women characters, not being in holy wedlock, desire a baby and say so. The broadening of human thought is a slow and complex process. We do go on, we do get on. But when one thinks that people are living and dying now, quarrelling and sulking, misled and misunderstanding, vaguely fearful, condemning and thwarting one another in the close darknesses of these narrow cults, oh God, one wants a gale out of heaven, one wants a great wind from the sea. 3. While I lived in Penge, two little things happened to me, trivial in themselves and yet in their quality profoundly significant they had this in common that they pierced the texture of the life i was quietly taking for granted and let me see through it into realities realities i had indeed known about before but never realised each of these experiences left me with a sense of shock with all the values in my life perplexingly altered attempting readjustment one of these disturbing and illuminating events was that I was robbed of a new pocket knife and the other that I fell in love. It was altogether surprising to me to be robbed. You see, as an only child, I had always been fairly well looked after and protected and the result was an amazing confidence in the practical goodness of the people one met in the world. I knew there were robbers in the world just as I knew there were tigers that I was ever likely to meet robber or tiger face to face seemed equally impossible. The knife as I remember it was a particularly jolly one, with all sorts of instruments in it, tweezers, and a thing for getting a stone out of the hoof of a horse, and a corkscrew. It had cost me a carefully accumulated half-crown, 
and amounted indeed to a new experience in knives. I had had it for two or three days, and then one afternoon I dropped it through a hole in my pocket on a footpath crossing a field between Penge and Annerley. I heard it fall in the way one does without at the time appreciating what had happened. Then later, before I got home, when my hand wandered into my pocket to embrace the still dear new possession, I found it gone. And instantly that memory of something hitting the ground sprang up into consciousness. I went back and commenced a search. Almost immediately I was accosted by the leader of a little gang of four or five extremely dirty and ragged boys of assorted sizes and slouching carriage who were coming from the Annerley direction. "'Loft anything, matey?' said he. I explained. "'He's dropped his knife,' said my interlocutor, and joined in the search. "'What sort of handle was it, matey?' said a small, white-faced, sniffing boy in a big bowler hat. I supplied the information. His sharp little face scrutinised the ground about us. "'Got it!' he said, and pounced. "'Give it here!' said the big boy hoarsely, and secured it. I walked towards him, serenely confident that he would hand it over to me, and that all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds. "'No blooming fear!' he said, regarding me obliquely. "'Who said it was your knife?' Remarkable doubts assailed me. "'Of course it's my knife,' I said. The other boys gathered round me. "'This ain't your knife,' said the big boy, and spat casually. "'I dropped it just now.' "'Findings keepings, I believe,' said the big boy. "'Nonsense,' I said. "'Give me my knife. "'How many blades it got?' Three. "'And what sort of handle?' "'Bone. "'Got a corkscrew light? "'Yes. "'Oh, this ain't your knife, no how. "'See?' He made no offer to show it to me. My breath went. Look here, I said. I saw that kid pick it up. It is my knife. Rot, said the big boy, and slowly, deliberately put my knife into his trouser pocket. I braced my soul for battle. All civilization was behind me, but I doubt if it kept the colour in my face. I buttoned my jacket and clenched my fists, and advanced on my antagonist. He had, I suppose, the advantage of two years of age, and three inches of height. "'Hand over that knife,' I said. Then one of the smallest of the band assailed me with extraordinary vigour and swiftness from behind, had an arm round my neck and a knee in my back, before I had the slightest intimation of attack, and so got me down. "'I got him, Bill!' squeaked this amazing little ruffian. My nose was flattened by a dirty hand, and as I struck out and hit something like sacking, someone kicked my elbow. Two or three seemed to be at me at the same time. Then I rolled over and sat up to discover them all making off a ragged flight, footballing my cap, my city merchant's cap, amongst them. I leapt to my feet in a passion of indignation and pursued them, but I did not overtake them. We are beings of mixed composition, and I doubt if mine was a single-minded pursuit. I knew that honour required me to pursue, and I had a vivid impression of having just been down in the dust with a very wiry and active and dirty little antagonist of disagreeable odour and incredible and incalculable unscrupulousness, kneeling on me and gripping my arm and neck. I wanted, of course, to be even with him, but also I doubted if catching him would necessarily involve that. They kicked my cap into the ditch at the end of the field and made off compactly along a cinder lane while I turned aside to recover my dishonoured headdress. As I knocked the dust out of that and out of my jacket and brushed my knees and readjusted my very crumpled collar, I tried to focus this startling occurrence in my mind. I had vague ideas of going to a policeman or of complaining at a police station, but some boyish instinct against informing prevented that. No doubt I entertained ideas of vindictive pursuit and murderous reprisals, and I was acutely enraged whenever I thought of my knife. The thing indeed rankled in my mind for weeks and weeks, and altered all the flavour of my world for me. It was the first time I glimpsed the simple brute violence that lurks and peeps beneath our civilization, 
a certain kindly complacency of attitude towards the palpably lower classes was qualified for ever. 4. But the other experience was still more cardinal. It was the first clear intimation of a new motif in life, the sex motif, that was to rise and increase and accumulate power and enrichment and interweave with and at last dominate all my life. It was when I was nearly fifteen this happened. It is inseparably connected in my mind with the dusk of warm September evenings. I never met the girl I loved by daylight, and I have forgotten her name. It was some insignificant name. Yet the peculiar quality of the adventure keeps it shining darkly like some deep-coloured gem in the common setting of my memories. It came as something new and strange, something that did not join on to anything else in my life, or connect with any of my thoughts or beliefs or habits. It was a wonder, a mystery, a discovery about myself, a discovery about the whole world. Only in after years did sexual feeling lose that isolation and spread itself out to illuminate and pervade and at last possess the whole broad vision of life. It was in that phase of an urban youth's development, the phase of the cheap cigarette, that this thing happened. One evening I came by chance on a number of young people promenading by the light of a row of shops towards Beckington, and with all the glory of a glowing cigarette between my lips, I joined their strolling number. These twilight parades of young people, youngsters chiefly of the lower middle class, are one of the odd social developments of the great suburban growths. Unkindly critics, blind to the inner meanings of things, call them, I believe, monkeys' parades. The shop apprentices, the young work girls, the boy clerks and so forth, stirred by mysterious intimations, spend their first earned money upon collars and ties, chiffon hats, smart lace collars, walking sticks, sunshades or cigarettes and come valiantly into the vague transfiguring mingling of gaslight and evening, to walk up and down, to eye meaningly, even to accost and make friends. It is a queer instinctive revolt from the narrow, limited, friendless homes in which so many find themselves, a going out towards something, romance if you will, beauty, that has suddenly become a need, a need that hitherto has lain dormant and unsuspected. They promenade. Vulgar? It is as vulgar as the spirit that calls the moth abroad in the evening and lights the body of the glow-worm in the night. I made my way through the throng, a little contemptuously as became a public schoolboy, my hands in my pockets, none of your cheap canes for me, and very careful of the lie of my cigarette upon my lips. And two girls passed me, one a little taller than the other, with dim warm-tinted faces under clouds of dark hair and with dark eyes like pools reflecting stars. I half turned, and the shorter one glanced back at me over her shoulder, I could draw you now the pose of her cheek and neck and shoulder, and instantly I was as passionately in love with the girl as I have ever been before or since, as any man ever was with any woman. I turned about and followed them, I flung away my cigarette ostentatiously and lifted my school cap and spoke to them. The girl answered shyly with her dark eyes on my face. What I said and what she said I cannot remember, but I have little doubt it was something absolutely vapid. It really did not matter. The thing was we had met. I felt as I think a new hatched moth must feel when suddenly its urgent headlong searching brings it in tremulous amazement upon its mate. We met, covered from each other, with all the nets of civilization keeping us apart. We walked side by side. It led to scarcely more than that. I think we met four or five times altogether, and always with her nearly silent elder sister on the other side of her. We walked on the last two occasions arm in arm, furtively caressing each other's hands. We went away from the glare of the shops into the quiet roads of Villadom, and there we whispered instead of talking and looked closely into one another's warm and shaded face. Dear, I whispered very daringly, 
and she answered, Dear. We had a vague sense that we wanted more of that quality of intimacy and more. We wanted each other as one wants beautiful music again, or to breathe again the scent of flowers. And that is all there was between us. The events are nothing. The thing that matters is the way in which this experience stabbed through the common stuff of life and left it pierced with a light, with a huge new interest shining through the rent. When I think of it, I can recall even now the warm mystery of her face, her lips a little apart, lips that I never kissed, her soft shadowed throat, and I feel again the sensuous stir of her proximity. Those two girls never told me their surname, nor let me approach their house. They made me leave them at the corner of a road of small houses near Penge Station, and quite abruptly, without any intimation, they vanished and came to the meeting place no more. They vanished as a moth goes out of a window into the night, and left me possessed of an intolerable want. The affair pervaded my existence for many weeks. I could not do my work, and I could not rest at home. Night after night I promenaded up and down that monkey's parade, full of an unappeasable desire, with a thwarted sense of something just begun that ought to have gone on. I went backwards and forwards on the way to the vanishing place, and at last explored the forbidden road that had swallowed them up. But I never saw her again, except that later she came to me, my symbol of womanhood, in dreams. How my blood was stirred! I lay awake of nights, whispering in the darkness for her. I prayed for her. Indeed, that girl, who probably forgot the last vestiges of me when her first real kiss came to her, ruled and haunted me, gave a queen to my imagination and a texture to all my desires until I became a man. I generalised her at last. I suddenly discovered that poetry was about her and that she was the key to all that had hitherto seemed nonsense about love. I took to reading novels, and if the heroine could not possibly be like her, dusky and warm and star-like, I put the book aside. I hesitate and add here one other confession. I want to tell this thing because it seems to me we are altogether too restrained and secretive about such matters. The cardinal thing in life sneaks into us darkly and shamefully, like a thief in the night. One day, during my Cambridge days, it must have been in my first year before I knew Hatherley, I saw in a print-shop window near the Strand an engraving of a girl that reminded me sharply of Penge and its dusky encounter. It was just a half-length of a bare-shouldered, bare-breasted oriental with arms akimbo, smiling faintly. I looked at it, went my way, then turned back and bought it. I felt I must have it. The odd thing is that I was more than a little shamefaced about it. I did not have it framed and hung in my room, open to the criticism of my friends, but I kept it in the drawer of my writing table, and I kept that drawer locked for a year. It speedily merged with and became identified with the dark girl of Penge. That engraving became in a way my mistress. Often when I had sported my oak, and was supposed to be reading, I was sitting with it before me. Obeying some instinct, I kept the thing very secret indeed. For a time, nobody suspected what was locked in my drawer, nor what was locked in me. I seemed as sexless as my world required. End of chapter 3, section 1「Chapter Three, Section Two of the New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Five. These things stab through my life, intimations of things above and below and before me. They had an air of being no more than incidents, interruptions. The broad substance of my existence at this time was the city merchant's school. Home was a place where I slept and read, 
and the mooning explorations of the southeastern postal district which occupied the restless evenings and spare days of my vacations mere interstices giving glimpses of enigmatical lights and distant spaces between the woven threads of a schoolboy's career school life began for me every morning at hern hill for there i was joined by three or four other boys and the rest of the way we went together most of the streets and roads we traversed in our morning's walk from victoria are still intact the storms of rebuilding that have submerged so much of my boyhood's london have passed and left them and i have revived the impression of them again and again in recent years as i have clattered dinnerward in a hansom or hummed along in a motor cab to some engagement the main gate still looks out with the same expression of ancient, well-proportioned kindliness upon St. Margaret's Close. There are imposing new science laboratories in Chambers Street, indeed, but the old playing fields are unaltered, except for the big electric trams that go droning and spitting blue flashes along the western boundary. I know Rat and the new head very well but I have not been inside the school to see if it has changed at all since I went up to Cambridge. I took all they put before us very readily as a boy, for I had a mind of vigorous appetite. But since I have grown mentally to man's estate and developed a more and more comprehensive view of our national process and our national needs, I am more and more struck by the oddity of the educational methods pursued, their aimless disconnectedness from the constructive forces in the community. I suppose if we are to view the public school as anything more than an institution that has just chanced to happen, we must treat it as having a definite function towards the general scheme of the nation, as being in a sense designed to take the crude young male of the more or less responsible class, to correct his harsh egotisms, broaden his outlook, give him a grasp of the contemporary developments he will presently be called upon to influence and control, and send him on to the university to be made a leading and ruling social man. It is easy enough to carp at schoolmasters and set up for an educational reformer, I know, but still it is impossible not to feel how infinitely more effectually, given certain impossibilities perhaps, the job might be done. My memory of school has indeed no hint whatever of that quality of elucidation it seems reasonable to demand from it. Here all about me was London, a vast, inexplicable being, a vortex of gigantic forces that filled and overwhelmed me with impressions, that stirred my imagination to a perpetual vague inquiry, and my school not only offered no key to it, but had practically no comment to make upon it at all. We were within three miles of Westminster and Charing Cross. The government offices of a fifth of mankind were all within an hour's stroll. Great economic changes were going on under our eyes. Now the hoardings flamed with election placards, now the Salvation Army and now the unemployed came trailing in procession through the winter grey streets. Now the newspaper placards outside news shops told of battles in strange places, now of amazing discoveries, now of sinister crimes, abject squalor and poverty, imperial splendour and luxury, Buckingham Palace, Rotten Row, Mayfair, the slums of Pimlico, garbage-littered streets of bawling costermongers, the inky silver of the barge-laden Thames, such was the background of our days. We went across St Margaret's Close and through the school gate, into a quiet, puerile world apart from all these things. We joined in the earnest acquirement of all that was necessary for Greek epigrams and Latin verse, and for the rest played games. We dipped down into something clear and elegantly proportioned and time-worn, and for all its high resolve of stalwart virility, a little feeble, like our blackened and decayed portals by Inigo Jones. Within, we were taught as the chief subjects of instruction, Latin and Greek. We were taught very badly, because the men who taught us did not habitually use either of these languages. Nobody uses them any more now, except perhaps for the Latin of a few Levantine monasteries. 
at the utmost our men read them. We were taught these languages because long ago Latin had been the language of civilization. The one way of escape from the narrow and localized life had lain in those days through Latin, and afterwards Greek had come in as the vehicle of a flood of new and amazing ideas. Once these two languages had been the sole means of initiation to the detached criticism and partial comprehension of the world. I can imagine the fierce zeal of our first heads, Gardner and Roper, teaching Greek like passionate missionaries, as a progressive Chinaman might teach English to the boys of Peking, clumsily, impatiently, with rod and harsh urgency, but sincerely, patriotically, because they felt that behind it lay revelations, the irresistible stimulus to a new phase of history. That was long ago. A new great world, a vaster imperialism, had arisen about the school, had assimilated all these amazing and incredible ideas, had gone to new and yet more amazing developments of its own. But the city merchant school still made the substance of its teaching Latin and Greek, still, with no thought of rotating crops sowed in a dream amidst the harvesting. There is no fierceness left in the teaching now. Just after I went up to Trinity, Gates, our head, wrote a review article in defence of our curriculum. In this, among other indiscretions, he asserted that it was impossible to write good English without an illuminating knowledge of the classic tongues, and he split an infinitive and failed to button up a sentence in saying so. His main argument conceded every objection a reasonable person could make to the city merchant's curriculum. He admitted that translation had now placed all the wisdom of the past at a common man's disposal, that scarcely a field of endeavour remained in which modern work had not long since passed beyond the ancient achievement. He disclaimed any utility. But there was, he said, a peculiar magic in these grammatical exercises no other subjects of instruction possessed. Nothing else provided the same strengthening and orderly discipline for the mind. He said that, knowing the senior classics he did, himself a senior classic. Yet in a dim, confused way, I think he was making out a case. In schools as we knew them, and with the sort of assistant available, the sort of assistant who has been trained entirely on the old lines, he could see no other teaching so effectual in developing attention, restraint, sustained constructive effort, and various yet systematic adjustment. And that was as far as his imagination could go. It is infinitely easier to begin organised human affairs than end them. The curriculum and the social organisation of the English public school are the crowning instances of that. They go on because they have begun. Schools are not only immortal institutions but reproductive ones. Our founder, Yabez Arvon, knew nothing, I am sure, of Gates' pedagogic values and would, I feel certain, have dealt with them disrespectfully. But public schools and university colleges sprang into existence correlated. The scholars went on to the universities and came back to teach the schools, to teach as they themselves had been taught, before they had ever made any real use of the teaching. The crowd of boys herded together, a crowd perpetually renewed and unbrokenly the same, adjusted itself by means of spontaneously developed institutions. In a century... By its very success, this revolutionary innovation of Renaissance public schools had become an immense tradition woven closely into the fabric of the national life. Intelligent and powerful people ceased to talk Latin or read Greek. They had got what was wanted. But that only left the schoolmaster the freer to elaborate his point. Since most men of any importance or influence in the country had been through the mill, it was naturally a little difficult to persuade them that it was not quite the best and most ennobling mill the wit of man could devise. And moreover, they did not want their children made strange to them. There was all the machinery and all the men needed to teach the old subjects, and none to teach whatever new the critic might propose. 
such science instruction as my father gave seemed indeed the uninviting alternative to the classical grind. It was certainly an altogether inferior instrument at that time. So it was I occupied my mind with the exact study of dead languages for seven long years. It was the strangest of detachments. We would sit under the desk of such a master as Topham, like creatures who had fallen into an enchanted pit, and he would do his considerable best to work us up to enthusiasm for, let us say, a Greek play. If we flagged, he would lash himself to revive us. He would walk about the classroom mouthing great lines in a rich roar, and asking us with a flushed face and shining eyes if it was not glorious. The very sight of Greek letters brings back to me the dingy, faded, ink-splashed quality of our classroom, the banging of books, Topham's disordered hair, the sheen of his alpaca gown, his deep unmusical intonations, and the wide striding of his creaking boots glorious and being plastic human beings we would consent that it was glorious and some of us even achieved an answering reverberation and a sympathetic flush i at times responded freely we all accepted from him unquestioningly that these melodies these strange sounds exceeded any possibility of beauty that lay in the gothic intricacy the splash and glitter the jar and recovery, the stabbing lights, the heights and broad distances of our English tongue. That, indeed, was the chief sin of him. It was not that he was for Greek and Latin, but that he was fiercely against every beauty that was neither classic nor deferred to classical canons. And what exactly did we make of it, we seniors who understood it best? We visualised dimly through that dust and the grammatical difficulties, the spectacle of the chorus chanting grotesquely, helping out protagonist and antagonist, masked and buskined, with the telling of incomprehensible parasites, of inexplicable incest, of gods faded beyond symbolism, of that relentless law we did not believe in for a moment, that no modern Western European can believe in. We thought of the characters in the unconvincing wigs and costumes of our school performance. No Gilbert Murray had come as yet to touch these things to life again. It was like the ghost of an antiquarian's toy theatre, a ghost that crumbled and condensed into a gritty dust of construing as one looked at it. Marks, shindies, prayers and punishments, all flavoured with the leathery stuffiness of time-worn big hall. And then out one would come through our grey old gate into the evening light and the spectacle of London hurrying like a cataract, London in black and brown and blue and gleaming silver, roaring like the very loom of time. We came out into the new world no teacher has yet had the power and courage to grasp and expound. Life and death sang all about one, joys and fears on such a scale, in such an intricacy, as never Greek nor Roman knew. The interminable procession of horse omnibuses went lumbering past, bearing countless people we knew not whence, we knew not whither. Hansoms clattered, foot passengers jostled one, a thousand appeals of shop and boarding caught the eye. The multicoloured lights of window and street mingled with the warm glow of the declining day under the softly flushing London skies. The ever-changing placards, the shouting news vendors, told of a kaleidoscopic drama all about the globe. One did not realise what had happened to us, but the voice of Topham was suddenly drowned and lost, he and his minute, remote gesticulations. That submerged and isolated curriculum did not even join on to living interests where it might have done so. We were left absolutely to the hints of the newspapers, to casual political speeches, to the cartoons of the comic papers or a chance reading of some socialist pamphlet for any general ideas whatever about the huge swirling world process in which we found ourselves. I always look back with particular exasperation to the cessation of our modern history at the year 1815. There it pulled up abruptly, as though it had come upon something indelicate. 
But after all, what would Topham or Flack have made of the huge adjustments of the 19th century? Flack was the chief cricketer on the staff. He belonged to that great cult which pretends that the place of this or that county in the struggle for the championship is a matter of supreme importance to boys. He obliged us to affect a passionate interest in the progress of county matches, to work up unnatural enthusiasms. What a fuss there would be when some well-trained boy, panting as if from Marathon, appeared with an evening paper. I say, you chaps, Middlesex all out for a hundred and five. Under Flack's pressure, I became, I confess, a cricket humbug of the first class. I applied myself industriously, year by year, to mastering scores and averages. I pretended that Lords or the Oval were the places nearest paradise for me. I never went to either. Through a slight mistake about the county boundary, I adopted Surrey for my loyalty, though as a matter of fact we were by some five hundred yards or so in Kent. It did quite as well for my purposes. I bowled rather straight and fast, and spent endless hours acquiring the skill to bowl flack out. He was a bat in the Corinthian style, rich and voluminous, and succumbed very easily to a low shooter or an unexpected yorker, but usually he was caught early by long leg. The difficulty was to bowl him before he got caught. He loved to lift a ball to leg. After one had clean bowled him at the practice nets, one deliberately gave him a ball to leg just to make him feel nice again. Flack went about a world of marvels, dreaming of leg hits. He has been observed, going across the park on his way to his highly respectable club in Piccadilly, to break from profound musings into a strange brief dance that ended with an imaginary swipe with his umbrella, a roofer, over the trees towards Buckingham Palace. The hit accomplished, Flack resumed his way. Inadequately instructed foreigners would pass him in terror, needlessly alert. 6. These schoolmasters move through my memory as always a little distant and more than a little incomprehensible. Except when they wore flannels, I saw them almost always in old college caps and gowns, a uniform which greatly increased their detachment from the world of actual men. Gates the head was a lean, loose-limbed man, rather stupid, I discovered, when I reached the sixth and came into contact with him, but honest, simple, and very eager to be liberal-minded. He was bald with an almost conical baldness, with a grizzled pointed beard, small featured, and under the stresses of a zeitgeist that demanded liberality, with an expression of puzzled but resolute resistance to his own unalterable opinions. He made a tall, dignified figure in his gown. In my junior days he spoke to me only three or four times, and then he annoyed me by giving me a wrong surname. It was a sore point, because I was an outsider, and not one of the old school families, the Shoesmiths, the Nailers, the Marklows, the Tophams, the Pevises and such like, who came generation after generation. I recall him most vividly against the background of faded brown book-backs in the old library, in which we less destructive seniors were trusted to work, with the light from the stained-glass window falling in coloured patches on his face. It gave him the appearance of having no colour of his own, he had a habit of scratching the beard on his cheek as he talked, and he used to come and consult us about things, and invariably do as we said. That, in his phraseology, was maintaining the traditions of the school. He had, indeed, an effect not of a man directing a school, but of a man captured and directed by a school. Dead and gone Elizabethans had begotten a monster that could carry him about in its mouth. Yet being a man, as I say, with his hair a little stirred by a zeitgeist that made for change, Gates did at times display a disposition towards developments. City merchants had no modern side, and utilitarian spirits were carping in the Pall Mall Gazette and elsewhere at the omissions from our curriculum, and particularly at our want of German. 
Moreover, four classes still worked together with much clashing and uproar in the old big hall that had once held in a common tumult the entire school. Gates used to come and talk to us older fellows about these things. "'I don't wish to innovate unduly,' he used to say, "'but we ought to get in some German, you know, for those who like it. "'The army men will be wanting it some of these days.' He referred to the organisation of regular evening preparation for the lower boys in Big Hall as a revolutionary change, but he achieved it, and he declared he began the replacement of the hacked wooden tables at which the boys had worked since Tudor days by sloping desks with safety inkpots and scientifically adjustable seats with grave misgivings. And though he never birched a boy in his life, and was, I am convinced, morally incapable of such a scuffle, he retained the block and birch in the school through all his term of office, and spoke at the headmaster's conference in temperate approval of corporal chastisement, comparing it, dear soul, to the power of the sword. I wish I could in some measure, and without tediousness, convey the effect of his discourses to General Assembly in Big Hall. But that is like trying to draw the obverse and reverse of a sixpence worn to complete illegibility. His tall, fine figure stood high on the days, his thoughtful tenor filled the air as he steered his hazardous way through sentences that dragged inconclusive tales and dropped redundant prepositions. And he pleaded ever so urgently, ever so finely, that what we all knew for sin was sinful, and on the whole best avoided altogether and so went on with deepening notes and even with short arresting gestures of the right arm and hand to stir and exhort us towards goodness towards that modern unsectarian goodness goodness in general and nothing in particular which the zeitgeist seemed to indicate in those transitional years seven the school never quite got hold of me Partly, I think, that was because I was a day boy, and so freer than most of the boys, partly because of a temperamental disposition to see things in my own way and have my private dreams, partly because I was a little antagonised by the family traditions that ran through the school. I was made to feel at first that I was a rank outsider, and I never quite forgot it. I suffered very little bullying, and I never had a fight, in all my time there were only three fights, but I followed my own curiosities. I was already a very keen theologian politician before I was fifteen. I was also intensely interested in modern warfare. I read the morning papers in the reading room during the midday recess, never missed the illustrated weeklies, and often when I could afford it I bought a Pall Mall Gazette on my way home. I do not think that I was very exceptional in that. Most intelligent boys, I believe, want naturally to be men, and are keenly interested in men's affairs. There is not the universal passion for a magnified puerility among them, it is customary to assume. I was indeed a voracious reader of everything but boys' books, which I detested, and fiction. I read histories, travel, popular science, and controversy with particular zest, and I loved maps. School work and school games were quite subordinate affairs for me. I worked well and made a passable figure at games, and I do not think I was abnormally insensitive to the fine quality of our school, to the charm of its medieval nucleus, its Gothic cloisters, its scraps of Palladian, and its dignified Georgian extensions. The contrast of the old quiet that in spite of our presence pervaded it everywhere, with the rushing and impending London all about it, was indeed a continual pleasure to me. But these things were certainly not the living and central interests of my life. I had to conceal my wider outlook to a certain extent, from the masters even more than from the boys. Indeed, I only let myself go freely with one boy, Britain, my especial chum, the son of the agent general for East Australia. We two discovered in a chance conversation apropos of a map in the library that we were both of us curious why there were Malays in Madagascar, and how the Mecca pilgrims came from the East Indies before steamships were available. 
Neither of us had suspected that there was any one at all in the school who knew or cared a rap about the Indian Ocean, except as water on the way to India. But Britain had come up through the Suez Canal, and his ship had spoken a pilgrim ship on the way. It gave him a startling quality of living knowledge. From these pilgrims we got to a comparative treatment of religions, and from that, by a sudden plunge, to entirely sceptical and disrespectful confessions concerning Gates's last outbreak of simple piety in school assembly. We became congenial intimates from that hour. The discovery of Britain happened to me when we were both in the lower fifth. Previously there had been a watertight compartment between the books I read and the thoughts they begot on the one hand, and human intercourse on the other. Now I really began my higher education, and aired and examined and developed in conversation the doubts, the ideas, the interpretations that had been forming in my mind. As we were both day boys with a good deal of control over our time, we organised walks and expeditions together, and my habit of solitary and rather vague prowling gave way to much more definite joint enterprises. I went several times to his house. He was the youngest of several brothers, one of whom was a medical student, and let us assist at the dissection of a cat, and once or twice in vacation time he came to Penge, and we went with parcels of provisions to do a thorough day in the grounds and galleries of the Crystal Palace, ending with the fireworks at close quarters. We went in a river steamboat down to Greenwich, and fired by that made an excursion to Margate and back. We explored London Docks and Bethnal Green Museum, Petticoat Lane, and all sorts of out-of-the-way places together. We confessed shyly to one another a common secret vice, phantom warfare. When we walked alone, especially in the country, we had both developed the same practice of fighting an imaginary battle about us as we walked. As we went along, we were generals, and our attacks pushed along on either side, crouching and gathering behind hedges, cresting ridges, occupying copses, rushing open spaces, fighting from house to house. The hillsides about Penge were honeycombed in my imagination with the pits and trenches I had created to check a victorious invader coming out of Surrey. For him, West Kensington was chiefly important as the scene of a desperate and successful last stand of insurrectionary troops who had seized the navy, the bank and other advantages against a royalist army, reinforced by Germans, advancing for reasons best known to themselves by way of Harrow and Ealing. It is a secret and solitary game, as we found when we tried to play it together. We made a success of that only once. All the way down to Margate, we schemed defences and assailed and fought them as we came back against the sunset. Afterwards, we recapitulated all that conflict by means of a large-scale map of the Thames and little paper ironclads in plan cut out of paper. A subsequent revival of these imaginings was brought about by Britain's luck in getting, through a friend of his father's, admission for us both to the spectacle of volunteer officers fighting the war game in Caxton Hall. We developed a war game of our own at Britain's home with nearly a couple of hundred lead soldiers, some excellent spring cannons that shot hard and true at six yards, hills of books and a constantly elaborated set of rules. For some months that occupied an immense proportion of our leisure. Some of our battles lasted several days. We kept the game a profound secret from the other fellows. They would not have understood. And we also began, it was certainly before we were sixteen, to write for the sake of writing. We liked writing. We had discovered Lamb and the best of the middle articles in such weeklies as the Saturday Gazette, and we imitated them. Our minds were full of dim, uncertain things we wanted to drag out into the light of expression. Britain had got hold of Immemoriam, and I had disinterred Pope's Essay on Man and Rabbi Ben Ezra, and these things had set our theological and cosmic solicitudes talking. I was somewhere between sixteen and eighteen, I know, when he and I walked along the Thames embankment, 
confessing shamefully to one another that we had never read Lucretius. We thought everyone who mattered had read Lucretius. When I was nearly sixteen, my mother was taken ill very suddenly, and died of some perplexing complaint that involved a post-mortem examination. It was, I think, the trouble that has since those days been recognised as appendicitis. This led to a considerable change in my circumstances. The house at Penge was given up, and my Staffordshire uncle arranged for me to lodge during school terms, with a needy solicitor and his wife in Vickers Street, South West, about a mile and a half from the school. So it was I came right into London. I had almost two years of London before I went to Cambridge. Those were our great days together. Afterwards we were torn apart. Britain went to Oxford, and our circumstances never afterwards threw us continuously together until the days of the Blue Weekly. As boys we walked together, read and discussed the same books, pursued the same inquiries. We got a reputation as inseparables, and the nickname of the Rose and the Lily, for Britain was short and thick-set, with dark close curling hair and a ruddy Irish type of face, I was lean and fair-haired, and some inches taller than he. Our talk ranged widely, and yet had certain very definite limitations. We were amazingly free with politics and religion. We went to that little meeting-house of William Morris's at Hammersmith, and worked out the principles of socialism pretty thoroughly. And we got up the Darwinian theory with the help of Britain's medical student brother, and the galleries of the Natural History Museum in Cromwell Road. Those wonderful cases on the ground floor, illustrating mimicry, dimorphism and so forth, were new in our times, and we went through them with earnest industry, and tried over our Darwinism in the light of that. Such topics we did exhaustively, but on the other hand I do not remember any discussion whatever of human sex or sexual relationships. There, in spite of intense secret curiosities, our lips were sealed by a peculiar shyness. And I do not believe we ever had occasion, either of us, to use the word love. It was not only that we were instinctively shy of the subject, but that we were mightily ashamed of the extent of our ignorance and uncertainty in these matters. We evaded them elaborately with an assumption of exhaustive knowledge. We certainly had no shyness about theology. We marked the emancipation of our spirits from the frightful teachings that had oppressed our boyhood by much indulgence in blasphemous wit. We had a secret literature of irreverent rhymes and a secret art of theological caricature. Britain's father had delighted his family by reading aloud from Dr Richard Garnett's Twilight of the Gods and Britain conveyed the precious volume to me. That and the Bab Ballads were the inspiration of some of our earliest lucubrations. For an imaginative boy, the first experience of writing is like a tiger's first taste of blood, and our literary flowerings led very directly to the revival of the school magazine, which had been comatose for some years. But there we came upon a disappointment. 8. In that revival we associated certain other of the sixth form boys, and notably one for whom our enterprise was to lay the foundations of a career that has ended in the House of Lords, Arthur Cossington, now Lord Paddockhurst. Cossington was at that time a rather heavy, rather good-looking boy who was chiefly eminent in cricket, an outsider even as we were, and preoccupied no doubt, had we been sufficiently detached to observe him, with private imaginings very much of the same quality and spirit as our own. He was, we were inclined to think, rather a sentimentalist, rather a poseur. He affected a concise, emphatic style, played chess very well, betrayed a belief in willpower, and earned Britain's secret hostility, Britain being a sloven, by the invariable neatness of his collars and ties. He came into our magazine with a vigour that we found extremely surprising and unwelcome. Britain and I had wanted to write. We had indeed figured our project modestly, 
as a manuscript magazine of satirical, liberal and brilliant literature, by which in some rather inexplicable way the vague tumult of ideas that teemed within us was to find form and expression. Cossington, it was manifest from the outset, wanted neither to write nor writing, but a magazine. I remember the inaugural meeting in Shoesmith Major's study. We had had great trouble in getting it together, and how effectually Cossington bolted with the proposal. "'I think we fellows ought to run a magazine,' said Cossington. "'The school used to have one. A school like this ought to have a magazine.' "'The last one died in eighty-four said Shoesmith from the hearthrug, called The Observer, rot rather. Bad title, said Cossington. There was a tackler before that, said Britain, sitting on the writing table at the window that was closed to deaden the cries of the lower school at play and clashing his boots together. We want something suggestive of city merchants. City merchandise, said Britain. Too fanciful. What of Arvonian? "'Richard Arvon was our founder, and it seems almost a duty. "'They call them all Usians or Onians,' said Britain. "'I like city merchandise,' I said. "'We could probably find a quotation to suggest. "'Oh, mix good things.' "'Cossington regarded me abstractly. "'Don't want to put the accent on the city, do we?' said Shoesmith, "'who had a feeling for county families.' and Naylor supported him by a murmur of approval. "'We ought to call it the Arvonian,' decided Cossington, "'and we might very well have underneath, with which is incorporated the observer. "'That picks up the old traditions, makes an appeal to old boys and all that, "'and it gives us something to print under the title. "'I still held out for city merchandise, which had taken my fancy. "'Some of the chap's people won't like it,' said Naylor. "'Certain not to.' "'and it sounds rum.' "'Sounds weird,' said a boy who had not hitherto spoken. "'We aren't going to do anything queer,' said Shoesmith, "'pointedly not looking at Britain. "'The question of the title had manifestly gone against us. "'Oh, have it Arvonian,' I said. "'And next, what size shall we have?' said Cossington. "'Something like Macmillan's Magazine or Longman's. "'Longman's is better because it has a whole page, not columns.' It makes no end of difference to one's effects. What effects? asked Shoesmith abruptly. Oh, a pause or a white line or anything. You've got to write closer for a double column. It's nuggety. You can't get a swing on your prose. I had discussed this thoroughly with Britain. If the fellows are going to write, began Britain, we ought to keep off fine writing, said Shoesmith. It's cheek. I vote we don't have any. We shan't get any, said Cossington. And then, as an olive branch to me, unless Remington does a bit, or Britain, but it's no good making too much space for it. We ought to be very careful about the writing, said Shoesmith. We don't want to give ourselves away. I vote we ask old Topham to see us through, said Naylor. Britain groaned aloud, and everyone regarded him. Greek epigrams on the fellow's names, he said. Small beer in ancient bottles. Let's get a stuffed broody hen to sit on the magazine. We might do worse than a Greek epigram, said Cossington. One in each number. It, it impresses parents and keeps up our classical tradition. And the masters can help. We don't want to antagonise them. Of course, we've got to departmentalise. Writing is only one section of the thing. The Arvonian has to stand for the school. There's questions of space and questions of expense. We can't turn out a great chunk of printed prose like like wet cold toast and call it a magazine. Britain writhed, appreciating the image. There's to be a section of sports. You must do that. I'm not going to do any fine writing, said Shoesmith. What you've got to do is just to list all the chaps and put a note to their play. Naylor Minor must pass more. Football isn't the place for extreme individualism. Amersham shapes well as half-back. Things like that. I could do that all right, said Shoesmith, brightening and manifestly becoming pregnant with judgments. One great thing about a magazine of this sort, said Cossington, is to mention just as many names as you can in each number. It keeps the interest alive. Chaps will turn it over looking for their own little bit. Then it all lights up for them. "'Do you want any reports of matches?' "'Shoesmith broke from his meditation. 
rather with comments naylor surpassed himself and negotiated the lemon safely home said shoesmith shut it said naylor modestly exactly said cossington that gives us three features touching them off on his fingers epigram literary section sports then we want a section to shove anything into a joke a notice of anything that's going on so on our notebook oh hell said britain and clashed his boots to the silent disapproval of every one well don't we unless we have our notebook to begin on the front page it gives a scrappy effect to do that we want something manly and straightforward and a bit thoughtful about patriotism say or esprit de corps or afterlife i looked at britain hitherto we had not considered cossington mattered very much in the world he went over us as a motor-car goes over a dog there was a sort of energy about him a new sort of energy to us we had never realised that anything of the sort existed in the world we were hopelessly at a disadvantage almost instantly we had developed a clear and detailed vision of a magazine made up of everything that was most acceptable in the magazines that flourished in the adult world about us and had determined to make it a success he had by a kind of instinct as it were synthetically plagiarised every successful magazine and breathed into this dusty mixture the breath of life he was elected at his own suggestion managing director with the earnest support of shoesmith and naylor and conducted the magazine so successfully and brilliantly that he even got a whole back page of advertisements from the big sports shop in holborn and made the printers pay at the same rate for a notice of certain books of their own which they said they had inserted by inadvertency to fill up space the only literary contribution in the first number was a column by topham in faultless stereotyped english in depreciation of some fancied evil called utilitarian studies and ending with that noble old quotation to the glory that was greece and the grandeur that was rome and flack crowded us out of number two with a bright little paper on the humours of cricket and the head himself was profusely thoughtful all over the editorial under the heading of the school chapel and how it seems to an old boy britain and i found it difficult to express to each other with any grace or precision what we felt about that magazine end of chapter three section two Chapter Four, Section One of the New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Adolescence One. I find it very difficult to trace how form was added to form and interpretation followed interpretation in my ever spreading ever deepening ever multiplying and enriching vision of this world into which I had been born. Every day added its impressions, its hints, its subtle explications to the growing understanding. Day after day, the living, interlacing threads of a mind weave together. Every morning, now for three weeks and more, for today is Thursday and I started on a Tuesday, I have been trying to convey some idea of the factors and early influences by which my particular scrap of subjective tapestry was shaped to show the child playing on the nursery floor, the son perplexed by his mother, gazing aghast at his dead father, exploring interminable suburbs, touched by first intimations of the sexual mystery, coming in with a sort of confused avidity towards the centres of the life of London. It is only by such an effort to write it down that one realises how marvellously crowded how marvellously analytical and synthetic those ears must be. One begins with the little child to whom the sky is a roof of blue, the world a screen of opaque and disconnected facts, the home a thing eternal, and being good, just simple obedience to unquestioned authority. And one comes at last to the vast world of one's adult perception, pierced deep by flaring searchlights of partial understanding, 
here masked by mists, here refracted and distorted through half-translucent veils, here showing broad prospects and limitless vistas, and here impenetrably dark. I recall phases of deep speculation, doubts and even prayers by night, and strange occasions when by a sort of hypnotic contemplation of nothingness I sought to pierce the web of appearances about me. It is hard to measure these things in receding perspective, and now I cannot trace, so closely has mood succeeded and overlaid and obliterated mood, the phases by which an utter horror of death was replaced by the growing realisation of its necessity and dignity. Difficulty of the imagination with infinite space, infinite time, entangled my mind and moral distress for the pain and suffering of bygone ages that made all thought of reformation in the future seem but the grimmest irony upon now irreparable wrongs. Many an intricate perplexity of these broadening years did not so much get settled as cease to matter. Life crowded me away from it. I have confessed myself a temerarious theologian, and in that passage from boyhood to manhood, I ranged widely in my search for some permanently satisfying truth. That too ceased after a time to be urgently interesting. I came at last into a phase that endures to this day of absolute tranquillity, of absolute confidence in whatever that incomprehensible comprehensive, which must needs be the substratum of all things, may be. Feeling of it, feeling by it, I cannot feel afraid of it. I think I have got quite clearly and finally to that adjustment long before my Cambridge days were done. I am sure that the evil in life is transitory and finite, like an accident or distress in the nursery, that God is my Father, and that I may trust Him, even though life hurts so that one must needs cry out at it, even though it shows no consequence but failure, no promise but pain. But while I was fearless of theology, I must confess it was comparatively late before I faced and dared to probe the secrecies of sex. I was afraid of sex. I had an instinctive perception that it would be a large and difficult thing in my life, but my early training was all in the direction of regarding it as an irrelevant thing, as something disconnected from all the broad significances of life as hostile and disgraceful in its quality. The world was never so emasculated in thought, I suppose, as it was in the Victorian time. I was afraid to think either of sex or, what I have always found inseparable from a kind of sexual emotion, beauty. Even as a boy I knew the thing as a haunting and alluring mystery that I tried to keep away from. Its dim presence obsessed me none the less for all the extravagant decency, the stimulating silences of my upbringing. The plaster Venuses and Apollos that used to adorn the vast aisle and huge grey terraces of the Crystal Palace were the first intimations of the beauty of the body that ever came into my life. As I write of it, I feel again the shameful attraction of those gracious forms. I used to look at them, not simply, but curiously and askance. Once at least in my later days at Penge, I spent a shilling in admission chiefly for the sake of them. The strangest thing of all my odd and solitary upbringing seems to me now that swathing up of all the splendours of the flesh, that strange combination of fanatical terrorism and shyness that fenced me about with prohibitions. It caused me to grow up, I will not say blankly ignorant, but with an ignorance blurred and dishonoured by shame, by enigmatical warnings, by cultivated aversions, an ignorance in which a fascinated curiosity and desire struggled like a thing in a net. I knew so little, and I felt so much. There was indeed no Aphrodite at all in my youthful pantheon, but instead there was a mysterious and minatory gap, I have told how at last a new Venus was born in my imagination out of gas lamps and the twilight, a Venus with a cockney accent and dark eyes shining out of the dusk, a Venus who was a warm, passion-stirring atmosphere rather than incarnate in a body, and I have told too how I bought a picture. 
All this was a thing apart from the rest of my life, a locked, avoided chamber. It was not until my last year at Trinity that I really broke down the barriers of this unwholesome silence and brought my secret broodings to the light of day. Then a little set of us plunged suddenly into what we called at first sociological discussion. I can still recall even the physical feeling of those first tentative talks. I remember them mostly as occurring in the rooms of Ted Hatherley, who kept at the corner by the Trinity Great Gate, but we also used to talk a good deal at a man's in King's, a man named, if I remember rightly, Redmain. The atmosphere of Hatherley's rooms was a haze of tobacco smoke against a background brown and deep. He professed himself a socialist with anarchistic leanings, he had suffered the martyrdom of ducking for it, and a huge French May Day poster displaying a splendid proletarian in red and black on a barricade against a flaring orange sky dominated his decorations. Hatherley affected a fine untidiness, and all the place, even the floor, was littered with books, for the most part open and face downward. Deeper darknesses were supplied by a discarded gown and our caps, all conscientiously battered. Hatherley's flopped like an elephant's ear, and inserted quill pens supported the corners of mine. The highlights of the picture came chiefly as reflections from his chequered blue mugs, full of audit ale. We sat on oak chairs, except the four or five who crowded on a capacious settle. We drank a lot of beer and were often fuddled and occasionally quite drunk, and we all smoked reckless-looking pipes. There was a transient fashion among us for corn cobs, for which Mark Twain, I think, was responsible. Our little excesses with liquor were due far more to conscience than appetite, indicated chiefly a resolve to break away from restraints that we suspected were keeping us off the instructive knife edges of life. Hatherley was a good Englishman of the premature type with a red face, a lot of hair, a deep voice and an explosive plunging manner, and it was he who said one evening, heaven knows how he got to it, Look here, you know, it's all rot this shutting up about women. We ought to talk about them. What are we going to do about them? It's got to come. We're all festering inside about it. Let's out with it. There's too much decency altogether about this infernal university. We rose to his challenge a little awkwardly, and our first talk was clumsy. There were flushed faces and red ears, and I remember Hatherley broke out into a monologue on decency. Modesty and decency, said Hatherley, are oriental vices. The Jews brought them to Europe. They're Semitic, just like our monasticism here, and the seclusion of women and mutilating the dead on a battlefield, and all that sort of thing. Hatherley's mind progressed by huge leaps, leaps that were usually wildly inaccurate, and for a time we engaged hotly upon the topic of those alleged mutilations and the Semitic responsibility for decency. Hatherley tried hard to saddle the Semitic race with the less elegant war customs of the Sudan and the northwest frontier of India, and quoted Doughty, at that time a little-known author, and Cunningham Graham, to show that the Arab was worse than a county-town spinster in his regard for respectability. But his case was too preposterous, and Esmir, with his shrill penetrating voice, and his way of pointing with all four long fingers flat together, carried the point against him. He quoted Cato and Roman law and the monasteries of Tibet. Well, anyway, said Hatherley, escaping from our hands like an intellectual frog, Semitic or not, I've got no use for decency. We argued points, and Hatherley professed an unusually balanced and tolerating attitude. I don't mind a certain refinement and dignity, he admitted generously. What I object to is this spreading out of decency until it darkens the whole sky, until it makes a man's father afraid to speak of the most important things, until it makes a man afraid to look a frank book in the face, or think, even think, 
until it leads to our coming to to the business at last with nothing but a few prohibitions a few hints a lot of dirty jokes and and he waved a hand and seemed to seek and catch his image in the air oh a confounded buttered slide of sentiment to guide us i tell you i'm going to think about it and talk about it until i see a little more daylight than i do at present i'm twenty-two things might happen to me any when you men can go out into the world if you like to sin like fools and marry like fools not knowing what you are doing and ashamed to ask you'll take the consequences too i expect pretty meekly sniggering a bit sentimentalising a bit like like cambridge humorists i mean to know what i'm doing he paused to drink and i think i cut in with ideas of my own but one is apt to forget one's own share in a talk i find more than one does the clear-cut objectivity of other people's and i do not know how far i contributed to this discussion that followed i am however pretty certain that it was then that ideal that we were pleased to call aristocracy and which soon became the common property of our set was developed it was esmir i know who laid down and maintained the proposition that so far as minds went there were really only two sorts of man in the world the aristocrat and the man who subdues his mind to other peoples i couldn't think of it sir said esmir in his elucidatory tones that's what a servant says his mind even is broken in to run between fences and he admits it we've got to be able to think of anything and such things aren't for the likes of us that's another servant saying well everything is for the likes of us if we see fit that is a small fresh-coloured man in grey objected well exploded hatherley if that isn't so what the deuce are we up here for instead of working in mines if some things aren't to be thought about ever we've got the privilege of all these extra years for getting things straight in our heads and then we won't use em good god what do you think a university's for esmir's idea came with an effect of real emancipation to several of us we were not going to be afraid of ideas any longer we were going to throw down every barrier of prohibition and take them in and see what came of it we became for a time even intemperately experimental and one of us at the bare suggestion of an eminent psychic investigator took hashish and very nearly died of it within a fortnight of our great elucidation the chief matter of our interchanges was of course the discussion of sex once the theme had been opened it became a sore place in our intercourse none of us seemed able to keep away from it our imaginations got astir with it we made up for lost time and went round it and through it and over it exhaustively i recall prolonged discussion of polygamy on the way to royston muddy november tramps to maddingley when amidst much profanity from hatherley at the serious treatment of so obsolete a matter we weighed the reasons if any for the institution of marriage the fine dim night-time spaces of the great court are bound up with the inconclusive finales of mighty hot-eared wrangles the narrows of trinity street and petty curie and market hill have their particular associations for me with that spate of confession and free speech that almost painful goal delivery of long pent and crappled and sometimes crippled ideas and we went on a reading party that easter to a place called pulborough in sussex where there is a fishing inn and a river that goes under a bridge it was a late easter and a blazing one and we boated and bathed and talked of being hellenic and the beauty of the body until at moments it seemed to us that we were destined to restore the golden age by the simple abolition of tailors and outfitters those undergraduate talks how rich and glorious they seemed how splendidly new the ideas that grew and multiplied in our seething minds we made long afternoon and evening raids over the downs towards arundel and would come tramping back through the still keen moonlight singing and shouting we formed romantic friendships with one another and grieved more or less convincingly that there were no splendid women fit to be our companions in the world 
but Hatherley, it seemed, had once known a girl whose hair was gloriously red. "'My God!' said Hatherley, to convey the quality of her, just simply and with projectile violence. "'My God!' Benton had heard of a woman who lived with a man refusing to be married to him. We thought that splendid beyond measure. I cannot now imagine why. She was like a tender goddess, Benton said. A sort of shame came upon us in the dark, in spite of our liberal intentions when Benton committed himself to that. And after such talk we would fall upon great pauses of emotional dreaming, and if by chance we passed a girl in a governess cart, or some farmer's daughter walking to the station, we became alertly silent or obstreperously indifferent to her. For might she not be just that one exception to the banal decency, the sickly pointless conventionality, the sham modesty of the times in which we lived? We felt we stood for a new movement, not realising how perennially this same emancipation returns to those ancient courts beside the cam. We were the anti-decency party. We discovered a catchphrase that we flourished about in the Union and made our watchword, namely, stark fact. We hung nude pictures in our rooms, much as if they had been flags, to the earnest concern of our bedders, and I disinterred my long-kept engraving and had it framed in fumed oak and found for it a completer and less restrained companion, a companion I never cared for in the slightest degree. This efflorescence did not prevent, I think indeed it rather helped, our more formal university work, for most of us took firsts and three of us got fellowships in one year or another. There was Benton who had a research fellowship and went to Tubingen, there was Esmeer and myself who both became residential fellows. I had taken the mental and moral science tripos, as it was then, and three years later I got a lectureship in political science. In those days it was disguised in the cloak of political economy. 2. It was our affectation to be a little detached from the mainstream of undergraduate life, we worked pretty hard, but by virtue of our beer, our socialism and such-like heterodoxy, held ourselves to be differentiated from the swatting reading man. None of us except Baxter, who was a rowing blue, a rather abnormal blue with an appetite for ideas, took games seriously enough to train, and on the other hand we intimated contempt for the rather mediocre, deliberately humorous, consciously gentlemanly and consciously wild undergraduate men who made up the mass of Cambridge life. After the manner of youth, we were altogether too hard on our contemporaries. We battered our caps and tore our gowns, lest they should seem new, and we despised these others extremely for doing exactly the same things. We had an idea of ourselves, and resented beyond measure a similar weakness in these our brothers. There was a type, or at least there seemed to us to be a type, I'm a little doubtful at times now whether after all we didn't create it, for which Hatherley invented the nickname the Pinky Dinkies, intending thereby both contempt and abhorrence in almost equal measure. The Pinky Dinky summarised all that we particularly did not want to be, and also, I now perceive, much of what we were, and all that we secretly dreaded becoming. But it is hard to convey the pinky-dinky idea, for all that it meant so much to us. We spent one evening at least during that reading party upon the pinky-dinky. We sat about our one fire after a walk in the rain, it was our only wet day, smoked our excessively virile pipes, and elaborated the natural history of the pinky-dinky. We improvised a sort of pinky-dinky litany, and Hatherley supplied deep notes for the responses. "'The pinky-dinky extracts a good deal of amusement from life,' said someone. "'Damn prig!' said Hatherley. "'The pinky-dinky arises in the Union and treats the question with a light gay touch. He makes the weird ones mad, but sometimes he cannot go on because of the amusement he extracts.' "'I want to shy books at the giggling swine,' said Hatherley. The Pinky Dinky says suddenly, while he is making the tea, we're all being frightfully funny. It's time for you to say something now. The Pinky Dinky shakes his head and says, I'm afraid I shall never be a responsible being, and he really is frivolous. Frivolous, but not vulgar, 
said Esmere. Pinky Dinkies are chaps who've had their buds nipped, said Hatherley. They're plebs and they know it. They haven't the guts to get hold of things, and so they worry up all those silly little jokes of theirs to carry it off. We tried bad ones for a time, viciously flavoured. Pinky Dinkies are due to overproduction of the type that ought to keep outfitters' shops. Pinky Dinkies would like to keep outfitters' shops with whimsy scriptions on the boxes and make your bill out funny and not be snobs to customers. No, not even if they had titles. Every Pinky Dinkies people are rather good people, and better than most Pinky Dinkies people, but he does not put on side. Pinky Dinkies became playful at the sight of women. Croak is my game, said the Pinky Dinky, and felt a man condescended. But what the devil do they think they're up to anyhow? roared old Hatherley suddenly, dropping plump into bottomless despair. We felt we had still failed to get at the core of the mystery of the Pinky Dinky. We tried over things about his religion. The Pinky Dinky goes to King's Chapel and sits and feels in the dusk. Solemn things. Oh, hush, he wouldn't tell you. He couldn't tell you. Religion is so sacred to him, he never talks about it, never reads about it, never thinks about it, just feels. But in his heart of hearts, oh, ever so deep, the Pinky Dinky has a doubt, someone protested. Not a vulgar doubt, Esmere went on, but a kind of hesitation whether the Ancient of Days is really exactly what one would call good form. There's a lot of horrid coarseness got into the world somehow. Somebody put it there. And anyhow, there's no particular reason why a man should be seen about with him. He's jolly awful, of course, and all that. The Pinky Dinky, for all his fun and levity, has a clean mind. A thoroughly clean mind. Not like Esmere's, the pig. If once he began to think about sex, how could he be comfortable at croquet? It's their damn modesty said Hatherley suddenly. That's what's the matter with Pinky Dinky. It's mental cowardice dressed up as virtue and taking the poor dears in. Cambridge is soaked with it. It's some confounded local bacillus, like the thing that gives a flavour to Havana's cigars. He comes up here to be made into a man and a ruler of the people, and he thinks it shows a nice disposition not to take on the job. How the devil is a great empire to be run with men like him? All his little jokes and things, said Esmere, regarding his feet on the fender. It's just a nervous sniggering, because he's afraid Oxford's no better. What's he afraid of? said I. God knows, exploded Hatherley, and stared at the fire. Life, said Esmere, and so in a way are we, he added, and made a thoughtful silence for a time. I say, began Carter, who was doing the natural science tripos, what is the adult form of the pinky dinky? But there we were checked by our ignorance of the world. What is the adult form of any of us? asked Benton, voicing the thought that had arrested our flow. 3. I do not remember that we ever lifted our criticism to the dons and the organisation of the university, I think we took them for granted. When I look back at my youth, I am always astonished by the multitude of things that we took for granted. It seemed to us that Cambridge was in the order of things, for all the world like having eyebrows or a vermiform appendix. Now, with a larger scepticism of middle age, I can entertain very fundamental doubts about these old universities. Indeed, I had a scheme. I do not see what harm I can do now by laying bare the purpose of the political combinations I was trying to effect. My educational scheme was indeed the starting point of all the big project of conscious public reconstruction at which I aimed. I wanted to build up a new educational machine altogether for the governing class out of a consolidated system of special public service schools. I meant to get to work upon this, whatever office I was given in the new government. I could have begun my plan from the Admiralty or the War Office quite as easily as from the Education Office. I am firmly convinced it is hopeless to think of reforming the old public schools and universities to meet the needs of a modern state. They send their roots too deep and far. The cost would exceed any good that could possibly be effected. 
and so I have sought a way round this invincible obstacle. I do think it would be quite practicable to side-track, as the Americans say, the whole system, by creating hard-working, hard-living, modern and scientific boys' schools, first for the Royal Navy and then for the public service generally, and as they grew, opening them to the public without any absolute obligation to subsequent service. Simultaneously with this, it would not be impossible to develop a new college system with strong faculties in modern philosophy, modern history, European literature and criticism, physical and biological science, education and sociology. We could in fact create a new liberal education in this way, and cut the umbilicus of the classical languages for good and all. I should have set this going and trusted it to correct or kill the old public schools and the Oxford and Cambridge tradition altogether. I had men in my mind to begin the work, and I should have found others. I should have aimed at making a hard-trained, capable, intellectually active, proud type of man. Everything else would have been made subservient to that. I should have kept my grip on the men through their vocation, and somehow or other I would have contrived a young woman to match them. I think I could have seen to it effectually enough that they didn't get at croquet and tennis with the vicarage daughters and discover sex in the peeping Tom fashion I did, and that they realised quite early in life that it isn't really virile to reek of tobacco. I should have had military manoeuvres, training ships, aeroplane work, mountaineering and so forth, in the place of the solemn trivialities of games, and I should have fed and housed my men clean and very hard, where there wasn't any audit ale, no credit tradesmen, and plenty of high-pressure douches. I have revisited Cambridge and Oxford time after time since I came down, and so far as the empire goes, I want to get clear of those two places. Always I renew my old feelings, a physical oppression, a sense of lowness and dampness, almost exactly like the feeling of an underground room where paper moulders and leaves the wall, a feeling of ineradicable contagion in the Gothic buildings, in the narrow ditch-like rivers, in those roads and roads of stuffy little villas, those little villas have destroyed all the good of the old monastic system, and none of its evil. Some of the most charming people in the world live in them, but their collective effect is below the quality of any individual among them. Cambridge is a world of subdued tones, of excessively subtle humours, of prim conduct and free thinking. It fears the parent, but it has no fear of God. It offers, amid surroundings that vary between disguises and antiquarian charm, the inflammation of literature's purple draught. One hears there a peculiar thin scandal like no other scandal in the world, a covetous scandal, so that I am always reminded of Ibsen in Cambridge. In Cambridge and the plays of Ibsen alone does it seem appropriate for the heroine before the great crisis of life to enter take off her overshoes and put her wet umbrella upon the writing desk. We have to make a new academic mind for modern needs, and the last thing to make it out of, I am convinced, is the old academic mind. One might as soon try to fake the old victory at Portsmouth into a line of battleship again. Besides which, the old academic mind, like those old bathless damp Gothic colleges, is much too delightful in its peculiar and distinctive way to damage by futile patching. My heart warms to a sense of affectionate absurdity as I recall dear old Codger, surely the most unleaderly of men. No more than from the old schoolman his kindred could one get from him a school for princes, yet apart from his teaching he was as curious and adorable as a good Netsuki. Until quite recently he was a power in Cambridge. He could make and bar and destroy, and in a way he has become the quintessence of Cambridge in my thoughts. I see him on his way to the morning's lecture with his plump, childish face, his round, innocent eyes, his absurdly non-prehensile fat hand carrying his cap, his grey trousers braced up much too high, his feet a trifle interned, and going across the great court with a queer, tripping pace that seemed cultivated even to my naive undergraduate eye. 
or I see him lecturing. He lectured walking up and down between the desks, talking in a fluting rapid voice, and with the utmost lucidity. If he could not walk up and down, he could not lecture. His mind and voice had precisely the fluid quality of some clear, subtle liquid. One felt it could flow round anything and overcome nothing. And its nimble eddies were wonderful. Or again I recall him drinking port with little muscular movements in his neck and cheek and chin, and his brows knit, very judicial, very concentrated, preparing to say the apt just thing. It was the last thing he would have told a lie about. When I think of Codger, I am reminded of an inscription I saw on some occasion in Regent's Park, above two eyes scarcely more limpidly innocent than his, born in the menagerie. Never once since Codger began to display the early promise of scholarship at the age of eight or more had he been outside the bars. His utmost travel had been to lecture here and lecture there. His student phase had culminated in papers of quite exceptional brilliance, and he had gone on to lecture with a cheerful combination of wit and mannerism that had made him a success from the beginning. He has lectured ever since. He lectures still. Year by year he has become plumper, more rubicund, and more and more of an item for the intelligent visitor to see. Even in my time he was pointed out to people as part of our innumerable enrichments, and obviously he knew it. He has become now almost the leading character in a little donnish world of much too intensely appreciated characters. He boasted he took no exercise, and also of his knowledge of port wine. Of other wines, he confessed quite frankly, he had no special knowledge. Beyond these things, he had little pride, except that he claimed to have read every novel by a woman writer that had ever entered the Union Library. This, however, he held to be remarkable rather than ennobling, and such boasts as he made of it were tinged with playfulness. Certainly he had a scholar's knowledge of the works of Miss Marie Corelli, Miss Braddon, Miss Elizabeth Glynn, and Madame Sarah Grand, that would have astonished and flattered those ladies enormously, and he loved nothing so much in his hours of relaxation as to propound and answer difficult questions upon their books. Tarsha of Kings was his ineffectual rival in this field. Their bouts were memorable, and rarely other than glorious for Codger. But then Tusher spread himself too much. He also undertook to rehearse whole pages out of Bradshaw, and tell you with all the changes how to get from any station to any station in Great Britain by the nearest and cheapest routes. Codger lodged with a little deaf, innocent old lady, Mrs. Araminta Mergle, who was understood to be herself a very redoubtable character in the Jip Bedder class. About her he related quietly absurd anecdotes. He displayed a marvellous invention in ascribing to her plausible expressions of opinion entirely identical in import with those of the Oxford and Harvard pragmatists against whom he waged a fierce, obscure war. It was conscious function to teach me philosophy, philosophy, the intimate wisdom of things, he dealt in a variety of Hegelian stuff like nothing else in the world, but marvellously consistent with itself. It was a wonderful web he spun out of that queer, big, active, childish brain that had never lusted, nor hated, nor grieved, nor feared, nor passionately loved. A web of iridescent threads. He had luminous final theories about love and death and immortality, odd matters they seemed for him to think about, and all his woven thoughts lay across my perception of the realities of things, as flimsy and irrelevant and clever and beautiful, oh, as a dew-wet spider's web slung in the morning sunshine across the black mouth of a gun. 4. All through those years of development, I perceive now there must have been growing in me slowly, irregularly, assimilating to itself all the phrases and forms of patriotism, diverting my religious impulses, utilising my aesthetic tendencies, my dominating idea, the statesman's idea, that idea of social service which is the protagonist of my story, 
that real though complex passion for making, making widely and greatly cities, national order, civilization, whose interplay with all those other factors in life I have set out to present. It was growing in me as one's bones grow, no man intending it. I have tried to show how quite early in my life the fact of disorderliness, the conception of social life as being a multitudinous confusion out of hand, came to me. One always, of course, simplifies these things in the telling, but I do not think I ever saw the world at large in any other terms. I never at any stage entertained the idea which sustained my mother and which sustained so many people in the world, the idea that the universe, whatever superficial discords it may present, is, as a matter of fact, all right, is being steered to definite ends by a serene and unquestionable God. My mother thought that order prevailed, and that disorder was just incidental and foredoomed rebellion. I feel, and have always felt, that order rebels against and struggles against disorder, that order has an uphill job in gardens, experiments, suburbs, everything alike. From the very beginnings of my experience, I discovered hostility to order, a constant escaping from control. The current of living and contemporary ideas in which my mind was presently swimming made all in the same direction. In place of my mother's attentive, meticulous, but occasionally extremely irascible providence, the talk was all of the struggle for existence, and the survival not of the best, that was nonsense, but of the fittest to survive. The attempts to rehabilitate faith in the form of the individualist's laissez-faire never won upon me. I disliked Herbert Spencer all my life until I read his autobiography, and then I laughed a little and loved him. I remember as early as the city merchant's days how Britain and I scoffed at that pompous question-begging word evolution, having, so to speak, found it out. Evolution, some illuminating talk had remarked at the Britain lunch table, had led not only to man, but to the liver fluke and skunk. Obviously it might lead anywhere. Order came into things only through the struggling mind of man. That licked things wonderfully for us. When I went up to Cambridge, I was perfectly clear that life was a various and splendid disorder of forces that the spirit of man sets itself to tame. I have never since fallen away from that persuasion. I do not think I was exceptionally precocious in reaching these conclusions and a sort of religious finality for myself by 18 or 19. I know men and women vary very much in these matters, just as children do in learning to talk. Some will chatter at 18 months and some will hardly speak until three, and the thing has very little to do with their subsequent mental quality. So it is with young people. Some will begin their religious, their social, their sexual interests at fourteen, some not until far on in the twenties. Britain and I belong to one of the precocious types, and Cossington very probably to another. It wasn't that there was anything priggish about any of us. We should have been prigs to have concealed our spontaneous interests and aped the theoretical boy. The world of man centred for my imagination in London. It still centres there. The real and present world, that is to say, as distinguished from the wonderlands of atomic and microscopic science and the stars and future time. I had travelled scarcely at all. I had never crossed the Channel, but I had read copiously, and I had formed a very good working idea of this round globe, with its mountains and wildernesses and forests, and all the sorts and conditions of human life that were scattered over its surface. It was all alive, I felt, and changing every day. How it was changing, and the changes men might bring about, fascinated my mind beyond measure. I used to find a charm in old maps that showed the world as known to the ancients, and I wish I could now, without any suspicion of self-deception, write down compactly the world as it was known to me at nineteen. So far as extension went, it was, I fancy, very like the world I know now at forty-two. I had practically all the mountains and seas, boundaries and races, products and possibilities that I have now. 
but its intention was very different. All the interval had been increasing and deepening my social knowledge, replacing crude and second-hand impressions by felt and realised distinctions. In 1895, that was my last year with Britain, for I went up to Cambridge in September, my vision of the world had much the same relation to the vision I have today that an ill-drawn daub of a mask has to the direct vision of a human face. Britain and I looked at our world and saw, what did we see? Forms and colours side by side that we had no suspicion were interdependent, we had no conception of the roots of things, nor of the reaction of things. It did not seem to us, for example, that business had anything to do with government, or that money and means affected the heroic issues of war. There were no wagons in our war game, and where there were guns, there it was assumed the ammunition was gathered together. Finance again was a sealed book to us. We did not so much connect it with the broad aspects of human affairs as regard it as a sort of intrusive nuisance to be earnestly ignored by all right-minded men. We had no conception of the quality of politics, nor how interests came into such affairs. We believed men were swayed by purely intellectual convictions and were either right or wrong, honest or dishonest, in which case they deserved to be shot, good or bad. We knew nothing of mental inertia, and could imagine the opinion of a whole nation changed by one lucid and convincing exposition. We were capable of the most incongruous transfers from the scroll of history to our own times. We could suppose Brixton ravaged and Hampstead burnt in civil wars for the succession to the throne, or Cheapside a lane of death and the front of the mansion house set about with guillotines in the course of an accurately transposed French Revolution. We rebuilt London by Act of Parliament, and once in a mood of hygienic enterprise, we transferred its population en masse to the North Downs by an order of the local government board. We thought nothing of throwing religious organisations out of employment, or superseding all the newspapers by freely distributed bulletins. We could contemplate the possibility of laws abolishing whole classes. We were equal to such a dream as the peaceful and orderly proclamation of communism from the steps of St Paul's Cathedral, after the passing of a simply worded bill, a close and not unnaturally an exciting division carrying the third reading. I remember quite distinctly evolving that vision, we were then fully fifteen, and we were perfectly serious about it. We were not fools. It was simply that as yet we had gathered no experience at all of the limits and powers of legislation and conscious collective intention. I think that this statement does my boyhood justice, and yet I have my doubts. It is so hard now to say what one understood and what one did not understand. It isn't only that every day change one's general outlook, but also that a boy fluctuates between phases of quite adult understanding and phases of tawdrily magnificent puerility. Sometimes I myself was in those tumbrils that went along Cheapside to the mansion house, a Sydney Carton-esque figure, a white defeated Mirabeen. Sometimes it was I who sat judging and condemning and ruling, sleeping in my clothes and feeding very simply, and the sole and autocrat of the provisional government, which occupied, of all inconvenient places, the general post office at St. Martin's Le Grand. I cannot trace the development of my ideas at Cambridge, but I believe the mere physical fact of going two hours' journey away from London gave that place for the first time an effect of unity in my imagination. I got outside London. It became tangible instead of being a frame almost as universal as sea and sky. At Cambridge my ideas ceased to live in a duologue. In exchange for Britain, with whom, however, I corresponded lengthily, stylishly and self-consciously for some years, I had now a set of congenial friends. I got talk with some of the younger dons, I learnt to speak in the Union, and in my little set we were all pretty busily sharpening each other's wits and correcting each other's interpretations. 
Cambridge made politics personal and actual. At City Merchants we had had no sense of effective contact. We boasted, it is true, an undersecretary and a colonial governor among our old boys, but they were never real to us. Such distinguished sons as returned to visit the old school were elusive and pleasant in the best pinky-dinky style and pretended to be in earnest about nothing but our football and cricket to mourn the abolition of water and find a shuddering personal interest in the ancient swishing block. At Cambridge I felt for the first time that I touched the thing that was going on. Real living statesmen came down to debate in the Union. The older dons had been their college intimates. Their sons and nephews expounded them to us and made them real to us. They invited us to entertain ideas. I found myself for the first time in my life expected to read and think and discuss. My secret vice had become a virtue. That combination room world is at last larger and more populous and various than the world of schoolmasters. The shoesmiths and nailers who had been the aristocracy of city merchants fell into their place in my mind. They became an undistinguished mass on the more athletic side of Pinky Dinkyism, and their hostility to ideas and to the expression of ideas ceased to limit and trouble me. The brighter men of each generation stay up. These others go down to propagate their tradition as the fathers of families, as mediocre professional men, as assistant masters in schools. Cambridge, which perfects them, is by the nature of things least oppressed by them, except when it comes to a vote in convocation. We were still in those days under the shadow of the great Victorians. I never saw Gladstone, as I never set eyes on the old Queen, but he had resigned office only a year before I went up to Trinity, and the combination rooms were full of personal gossip about him and Disraeli and the other big figures of the gladiatorial stage of parliamentary history, talk that leaped copiously into such sets as mine. The ceiling of our guest chamber at Trinity was glorious with the arms of Sir William Harcourt, whose death duties had seemed at first like a socialist dawn. Mr. Evesham we asked to come to the Union every year, Masters, Chamberlain and the old Duke of Devonshire. They did not come indeed, but their polite refusals brought us all, as it were, within personal touch of them. One heard of cabinet councils and meetings at country houses. Some of us, pursuing such interests, went so far as to read political memoirs and the novels of Disraeli and Mrs. Humphrey Ward. From gossip, example and the illustrated newspapers, one learnt something of the way in which parties were split, coalitions formed, how permanent officials worked and controlled their ministers, how measures were brought forward and projects modified. And while I was getting the great leading figures on the political stage, who had been presented to me in my school days not so much as men as the pantomimic monsters of political caricature, while I was getting them reduced in my imagination to the stature of humanity and their motives to the quality of impulses like my own, I was also acquiring in my tripos work a constantly developing and enriching conception of the world of men as a complex of economic, intellectual and moral processes. End of chapter 4, section 1「Chapter Four, Section Two of the New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Five. Socialism is an intellectual Proteus, but to the men of my generation it came as the revolt of the workers. Rudbertus we never heard of, and the Fabian Society we did not understand. Marx and Morris, the Chicago anarchists, justice and social democratic federation as it was then, presented socialism to our minds. Hatherley was the leading exponent of the new doctrines in Trinity, and the figure upon his wall of a huge, muscled, black-haired toiler, swaggering sledge-hammer in hand across a revolutionary barricade, seemed the quintessence of what he had to expound. 
landlord and capitalist had robbed and enslaved the workers and were driving them quite automatically to inevitable insurrection. They would arise, and the capitalist system would flee and vanish like the mists before the morning, like the Jews before the sunrise, giving place in the most simple and obvious manner to an era of right and justice and virtue and well-being, and in short, a perfectly splendid time. I had already discussed this sort of socialism under the guidance of Britain before I went up to Cambridge. It was all mixed up with ideas about freedom and natural virtue and a great scorn for kings, titles, wealth and officials, and it was symbolised by the red ties we wore. Our simple verdict on existing arrangements was that they were all wrong. The rich were robbers and knew it. Kings and princes were usurpers and knew it. Religious teachers were impostors in league with power. The economic system was an elaborate plot on the part of the few to expropriate the many. We went about feeling scornful of all the current forms of life, forms that esteemed themselves solid, that were, we knew, no more than shapes painted on a curtain that was presently to be torn aside. It was Hathaly's poster and his capacity for overstating things, I think, that first qualified my simple revolutionary enthusiasm. Perhaps also I had met with Fabian publications, but if I did I forget the circumstances. And no doubt my innate constructiveness, with its practical corollary of an analytical treatment of the material supplied, was bound to push me on beyond this melodramatic interpretation of human affairs. I compared that working man of the poster with any sort of working man I knew. I perceived that the latter was not going to change, and indeed could not under any stimulus whatever be expected to change, into the former. It crept into my mind as slowly and surely as the dawn creeps into a room that the former was not, as I had at first rather glibly assumed, an ideal, but a complete misrepresentation of the quality and possibilities of things. I do not know now whether it was during my school days or at Cambridge that I first began not merely to see the world as a great contrast of rich and poor, but to feel the massive effect of that multitudinous majority of people who toil continually, who are forever anxious about ways and means, who are restricted, ill-clothed, ill-fed and ill-housed, who have limited outlooks and continually suffer misadventures, hardships and distresses through the want of money. My lot had fallen upon the fringe of the possessing minority. If I did not know the want of necessities, I knew shabbiness, and the world that let me go on to a university education intimated very plainly that there was not a thing beyond the primary needs that my stimulated imagination might demand that it would not be an effort for me to secure. A certain aggressive radicalism against the ruling and propertied classes followed almost naturally from my circumstances. It did not at first connect itself at all with the perception of a planless disorder in human affairs that had been forced upon me by the atmosphere of my upbringing, nor did it link me in sympathy with any of the profounder realities of poverty. It was a personal independent thing. The dingier people one saw in the back streets and lower quarters of Bromstead and Penge, the drift of dirty children, ragged old women, street loafers, grimy workers that made the social background of London, the stories one heard of privation and sweating, only joined up very slowly with the general propositions I was making about life. We could become splendidly eloquent about the social revolution and the triumph of the proletariat after the class war, and it was only by a sort of inspiration that it came to me that my bedder, a garrulous old thing with a dusty black bonnet over one eye and an ostentatiously clean apron outside the dark mysteries that clothed her, or the cheeky little ruffians who yelled papers about the streets, were really material to such questions. Directly any of us young socialists of Trinity found ourselves in immediate contact with servants, or cadgers, or gyps, or bedders, or plumbers, or navvies, or cabmen, or railway porters, we became unconsciously and unthinkingly aristocrats. Our voices altered, 
our gestures altered. We behaved just as all the other men, rich or poor, swatters or sportsmen or pinky dinkies behaved, and exactly as we were expected to behave. On the whole, it is a population of poor quality round about Cambridge, rather stunted and spiritless and very difficult to idealise. That theoretical working man of ours. If we felt the clash at all, we explained it, I suppose, by assuming that he came from another part of the country. Esmir, I remember, who lived somewhere in the Fens, was very eloquent about the Cornish fishermen, and Hatherley, who was a Hampshire man, assured us we ought to know the Scottish miner. My private fancy was for the Lancashire operative, because of his cooperative societies, and because what Lancashire thinks today, England thinks tomorrow. And also I had never been in Lancashire. My little increments of realisation, it was that the profounder verities of the problem of socialism came to me. It helped me very much that I had to go down to the potteries several times to discuss my future with my uncle and guardian. I walked about and saw Bursley Wakes and much of the human aspects of organised industrialism at close quarters for the first time. The picture of a splendid working man cheated out of his innate glorious possibilities and presently to arise and dash this scoundrelly and scandalous system of private ownership to fragments began to give place to a limitless spectacle of inefficiency, to a conception of millions of people not organised as they should be, not educated as they should be, not simply prevented from but incapable of nearly every sort of beauty mostly kindly and well-meaning, mostly incompetent, mostly obstinate, and easily humbugged, and easily diverted. Even the tragic and inspiring idea of Marx, that the poor were nearing a limit of painful experience, and awakening to a sense of intolerable wrongs, began to develop into the more appalling conception that the poor were simply in a witless, uncomfortable, inconclusive way muddling along that they wanted nothing very definitely nor very urgently, that mean fears enslaved them and mean satisfactions decoyed them, that they took the very gift of life itself with a spiritless lassitude, hoarding it, being rather anxious not to lose it than to use it in any way whatever. The complete development of that realisation was the work of many years. I had only the first intimations at Cambridge, but I did have intimations. Most acutely do I remember the doubts that followed the visit of Chris Robinson. Chris Robinson was heralded by such heroic anticipations, and he was so entirely what we had not anticipated. Hatherley got him to come, arranged a sort of meeting for him at Redmayne's rooms in King's, and was very proud and proprietorial. It failed to stir Cambridge at all profoundly. Beyond a futile attempt to screw up Hatherley, made by some inexpert duffers who use nails instead of screws and gimlets, there was no attempt to rag. Next day, Chris Robinson went and spoke at Bennett Hall in Newnham College, and left Cambridge in the evening amidst the cheers of twenty men or so. Socialism was at such a low ebb politically in those days that it didn't even rouse men to opposition. And there sat Chris under that flamboyant and heroic worker of the poster, a little wrinkled, grey-bearded, apologetic man in ready-made clothes, with watchful, innocent brown eyes, and a persistent and invincible air of being out of his element. He sat with his stout boots tucked up under his chair, and clung to a teacup and saucer, and looked away from us into the fire, and we all sat about on tables and chair-arms and window-sills and boxes and anywhere except upon chairs after the manner of young men. The only other chair whose seat was occupied was the one containing his knitted woollen comforter and his picturesque old beach photographer's hat. We were all shy and didn't know how to take hold of him now we had got him, and which was disconcertingly unanticipated, he was manifestly having the same difficulty with us. We had expected to be gripped. "'I'll not be knowing what to say to these chaps,' he repeated with a North Country quality in his speech. 
we made reassuring noises. The ambassador of the workers stirred his tea earnestly through an uncomfortable pause. I'd best tell em something of how things are in Lancashire, what with the new machines and all that, he speculated at last with red reflections in his thoughtful eyes. We had an inexcusable dread that perhaps he would make a mess of the meeting. But when he was no longer in the unaccustomed meshes of refined conversation, but speaking with an audience before him, he became a different man. He declared he would explain to us just exactly what socialism was, and went on at once to an impassioned contrast of social conditions. "'Yo, young men,' he said, "'come from homes of luxury. Every need you feel is supplied.' We sat and stood and sprawled about him, occupying every inch of Redmayne's floor space except the hearthrug platform, and we listened to him and thought him over. He was the voice of wrongs that made us indignant and eager. We forgot for a time that he had been shy and seemed not a little incompetent. His provincial accent became a beauty of his earnest speech. We were carried away by his indignations. We looked with shining eyes at one another and at the various dons who had dropped in and were striving to maintain a front of judicious severity. We felt more and more that social injustice must cease and cease forthwith. We felt we could not sleep upon it. At the end we clapped and murmured our applause and wanted badly to cheer. Then like a lancet stuck into a bladder came the heckling. Denson, that indolent, liberal-minded sceptic, did most of the questioning. He lay contorted in a chair with his ugly head very low, his legs crossed and his left boot very high, and he pointed his remarks with a long, thin hand and occasionally adjusted the unstable glasses that hid his watery eyes. "'I don't want to carp,' he began. "'The present system, I admit, stands condemned. "'Every present system always has stood condemned "'in the minds of intelligent men. "'But where it seems to me you get thin "'is just where everybody has been thin, "'and that's when you come to the remedy.' socialism said chris robinson as if it answered everything and hatherley said here here very resolutely i suppose i ought to take that as an answer said denson getting his shoulder blades well down to the seat of his chair but i don't i don't you know it's rather a shame to cross-examine you after this fine address of yours chris robinson and the hearthrug made acquiescent and inviting noises but the real question remains how exactly are you going to end all these wrongs? There are the administrative questions. If you abolish the private owner, I admit you abolish a very complex and clumsy way of getting businesses run, land controlled and things in general administered. But you don't get rid of the need of administration, you know. Democracy, said Chris Robinson. Organised somehow, said Denson, and it's just the how perplexes me. I can quite easily imagine a socialist state administered in a sort of scrambling tumult that will be worse than anything we have got now. Nothing could be worse than things are now, said Chris Robinson. I have seen little children. I submit life on an ill-provisioned raft, for example, could easily be worse, or life in a beleaguered town. Murmurs. They wrangled for some time and it had the effect upon me of coming out from the glow of a good matinee performance into the cold daylight of late afternoon. Chris Robinson did not shine in conflict with Denson. He was an orator and not a dialectician, and he missed Denson's points and displayed a disposition to plunge into untimely pathos and indignation. And Denson hit me curiously hard with one of his shafts, Suppose, he said, you found yourself Prime Minister. I looked at Chris Robinson, bright-eyed, and his hair a little ruffled, and his whole being rhetorical, and measured him against the huge machine of government, muddled and mysterious. Oh, but I was perplexed. 
and then we took him back to Hathley's rooms and drank beer and smoked about him while he nursed his knee with hairy wristed hands that protruded from his flannel shirt and drank lemonade under the cartoon of that emancipated worker and we had a great discursive talk with him eh you should see our big meetings up north he said denson had ruffled him and worried him a good deal and ever and again he came back to that discussion it's all very easy for your learned men to sit and pick holes he said while the children suffer and die they don't pick holes up north they mean business he talked and that was the most interesting part of it all of his going to work in a factory when he was twelve when you chaps were all with your mummies and how he had educated himself of nights until he would fall asleep at his reading it's made many of us keen for all our lives he remarked all that clemming for education why i longed all through one winter to read a bit of darwin i must know about this darwin if i die for it i said and i could no get the book hatherley made an enthusiastic noise and drank beer at him with round eyes over the mug well anyhow i wasted no time on greek and latin said chris robinson and one learns to go straight at a thing without splitting straws one gets hold of the elementals well did they that was the gist of my perplexity one doesn't quibble he said returning to his rankling memory of denson while men decay and starve but suppose i said suddenly dropping into opposition the alternative is to risk a worse disaster or do something patently futile i don't follow that said chris robinson we don't propose anything futile so far as i can see six the prevailing force in my undergraduate days was not socialism but kiplingism our set was quite exceptional in its socialistic professions and we were all you must understand very distinctly imperialists also and professed a vivid sense of the white man's burden it is a little difficult now to get back to the feelings of that period kipling has since been so mercilessly and exhaustively mocked criticised and torn to shreds never was a man so violently exalted and then himself assisting so relentlessly called down but in the middle nineties this spectacled and moustached little figure with its heavy chin and its general effect of vehement gesticulation its wild shouts of boyish enthusiasm for effective force its lyric delight in the sounds and colours in the very odours of empire its wonderful discovery of machinery and cotton waste and the under-officer and the engineer and shop as a poetic dialect became almost a national symbol he got hold of us wonderfully he filled us with tinkling and haunting quotations he stirred britain and myself to futile imitations he coloured the very idiom of our conversation he rose to his climax with his recessional while i was still an undergraduate what did he give me exactly he helped to broaden my geographical sense immensely and he provided phrases for just that desire for discipline and devotion and organised effort the socialism of our time failed to express that the current socialist movement still fails i think to express the sort of thing that follows for example tore something out of my inmost nature and gave it a shape and i took it back from him shaped and let much of the rest of him the tumult and the bullying the hysteria and the impatience the incoherence and inconsistency go uncriticised for the sake of it keep ye the law be swift in all obedience clear the land of evil drive the road and bridge the ford make ye sure to each his own that he reap where he hath sown by the peace among our peoples let men know we serve the lord and then again and for all our later criticism this sticks in my mind sticks there now as quintessential wisdom the heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone he don't obey no orders unless they is his own he keeps his side arms awful he leaves em all about and then comes up the regiment and pokes the heathen out all along a dirtiness all along a mess 
all along of doing things rather more or less. All along of Abbey Nay, call and as our ho, mind you keep your rifle and yourself just so. It is, after all, a secondary matter that Kipling, not having been born and brought up in Bromstead and Penge, and the war in South Africa being yet in the womb of time, could quite honestly entertain the now remarkable delusion that England had her side arms at that time kept anything but awful. He learnt better, and we all learnt with him in the dark years of exasperating and humiliating struggle that followed, and I do not see that we fellow learners are justified in turning resentfully upon him for a common ignorance and assumption. South Africa seems almost painted on the backcloth of my Cambridge memories. How immense those disasters seemed at the time, disasters our facile english world has long since contrived in any edifying or profitable sense to forget how we thrilled to the shouting newspaper sellers as the first false flush of victory gave place to the realization of defeat far away there our army showed itself human mortal and human in the sight of all the world the pleasant officers we had imagined would change to wonderful heroes at the first crackling of rifles remained the pleasant, rather incompetent men they had always been, failing to imagine, failing to plan and cooperate, failing to grip. And the common soldiers too, they were just what our streets and countryside had made them. No sudden magic came out of the war bugles for them. Neither splendid nor disgraceful were they, just ill-trained and fairly plucky and wonderfully good-tempered men paying for it. And how it lowered our vitality all that first winter to hear of Nicholson's neck, and then presently close upon one another to realise the bloody waste of Margus Fontaine, the shattering retreat from Stormberg, Colenso, Colenso, that blundering battle, with white, as it seemed, in Ladysmith near the point of surrender. And so through the long unfolding catalogue of bleak disillusionments, of aching, unconcealed anxiety, lest worse should follow. To advance upon your enemy, singing about his lack of cleanliness and method, went out of fashion altogether. The dirty, retrogressive boar vanished from our scheme of illusion. All through my middle Cambridge period, the guns boomed and the rifles crackled away there on the veldt, and the horsemen rode, and the tale of accidents and blundering went on. Men, mules, horses, stores and money poured into South Africa, and the convalescent wounded streamed home. I see it in my memory as if I had looked at it through a window instead of through the pages of the illustrated papers. I recall as if I had been there the wide open spaces, the ragged hillsides, the open order attacks of helmeted men in khaki, the scarce visible smoke of the guns, the wrecked trains in great lonely places, the burnt isolated farms, and at last the blockhouses and the fences of barbed wire uncoiling and spreading for endless miles across the desert, netting the elusive enemy, until at last, though he broke the meshes again and again, we had him in the toils. If one's attention strayed in the lecture room, it wandered to those battlefields. And that imagined panorama of war unfolds to an accompaniment of yelling newsboys in the narrow old Cambridge streets, of the flicker of papers hastily bought and torn open in the twilight, of the doubtful reception of doubtful victories, and the insensate rejoicings at last that seemed to some of us more shameful than defeats. 7. A book that stands out among these memories, that stimulated me immensely so that I forced it upon my companions, half in the spirit of propaganda and half to test it by their comments, was Meredith's One of Our Conquerors. It is one of the books that have made me. In that I got a supplement and corrective of Kipling. It was the first attached and adverse criticism of the Englishman I had ever encountered. It must have been published already nine or ten years when I read it. The country had paid no heed to it, had gone on to the expensive lessons of the war because of the dull aversion our people feel for all such intimations, and so I could read it as a book justified. 
the war endorsed its every word for me, underlined each warning indication of the gigantic dangers that gathered against our system across the narrow seas. It discovered Europe to me as watching and critical. But while I could respond to all its criticisms of my country's intellectual indolence, of my country's want of training and discipline and moral courage, I remember that the idea that on the continent there were other peoples going ahead of us, mentally alert while we fumbled, disciplined while we slouched, aggressive and preparing to bring our imperial pride to a reckoning, was extremely novel and distasteful to me. It set me worrying of nights. It put all my projects for social and political reconstruction upon a new uncomfortable footing. It made them no longer merely desirable but urgent. Instead of pride and the love of making, one might own to a baser motive. Under Kipling's sway, I had a little forgotten the continent of Europe, treated it as a mere envious echo to our world-wide display. I began now to have a disturbing sense, as it were, of busy searchlights over the horizon. One consequence of the patriotic chagrin Meredith produced in me was an attempt to belittle his merit. It isn't a good novel, anyhow, I said. The charge I brought against it was, I remember, a lack of unity. It professed to be a study of the English situation in the early nineties, but it was all deflected, I said, and all the interest was confused by the story of Victor Radner's fight with society to vindicate the woman he had loved and never married. Now in the retrospect, and with a mind full of bitter enlightenment, I can do Meredith justice, and admit the conflict was not only essential but cardinal in his picture, that the terrible inflexibility of the rich aunts and the still more terrible claim of Mrs. Berman Radner, the infernal punctilio, and Dudley Sowerby's limitations, were the central substance of that inalertness the book set itself to assail. So many things have been brought together in my mind that were once remotely separated, a people that will not valiantly face and understand and admit love and passion can understand nothing whatever. But in those days, what is now just obvious truth to me was altogether outside my range of comprehension. 8. As I seek to recapitulate the interlacing growth of my apprehension of the world, as I flounder among the half-remembered developments that found me a crude schoolboy and left me a man, there comes out, as if it stood for all the rest, my first holiday abroad. That did not happen until I was twenty-two. I was a fellow of Trinity, and the peace of Ferenigan had just been signed. I went with a man named Willersley, a man some years senior to myself, who had just missed a fellowship and the higher division of the civil service, and who had become an enthusiastic member of the London School Board, upon which the cumulative vote and the support of the advanced people had placed him. He had, like myself, a small independent income that relieved him of any necessity to earn a living, and he had a kindred craving for social theorising and some form of social service. He had sought my acquaintance after reading a paper of mine, begotten by the visit of Chris Robinson, on the limits of pure democracy. It had marched through some thoughts of his own. We went by train to Spietz on the Lake of Tain, then up the Gemi, and thence with one or two halts and digressions and a little modest climbing we crossed over by the Antrona Pass, on which we were benighted, into Italy, and by way of Domodossola and the Santa Maria Maggiore Valley to Canobio, and thence up the lake to Locarno, where, as I shall tell, we stayed some eventful days, and so up the Val Maggia and over to Airolo and home. As I write of that long tramp of ours, something of its freshness and enlargement returns to me. I feel again the faint pleasant excitement of the boat train, the trampling procession of people with hand baggage and laden porters along the platform of the Folkestone Pier, the scarcely perceptible swaying of the moored boat beneath our feet. Then, very obvious and simple, the little emotion of standing out from the homeland and seeing the long white Kentish cliffs recede. One walked about the boat doing one's best not to feel absurdly adventurous, 
and presently a movement of people directed one's attention to a white lighthouse on a cliff to the east of us, coming up suddenly. And then one turned to scan the little different French coast villages, and then, sliding by in a pale sunshine, came a long wooden pier with oddly dressed children upon it, and the clustering town of Boulogne. One took it all with the outward calm that became a young man of nearly three and twenty, but one was alive to one's fingertips with pleasing little stimulations. The custom house examination excited one, the strangeness of a babble in a foreign tongue. One found the French of city merchants and Cambridge a shy and viscous flow, and then one was standing in the train as it went slowly through the rail-laid street to Blanville, and one looked out at the world in French, porters in blouses, workmen in enormous purple trousers, police officers in peaked caps instead of helmets and romantically cloaked, big carts, all on two wheels instead of four, green shuttered casements instead of sash windows, and great numbers of neatly dressed women in economical mourning. Oh, there's a priest, one said, and was betrayed into such like artless cries. It was a real other world, with different government and different methods, and in the night one was roused from uneasy slumbers and sat blinking and surly, wrapped up in one's couverture and with one's array all awry, to encounter a new social phenomenon, the German official, so different in manner from the British, and when one woke again after that one had come to Baal, and out one tumbled to get coffee in Switzerland. I have been over that route dozens of times since, but it still revives a certain lingering youthfulness, a certain sense of cheerful release in me. I remember that I and Willersley became very sociological as we ran on to Spiers, and made all sorts of generalisations from the steeply sloping fields on the hillsides, and from the people we saw on platforms, and from little differences in the way things were done. The clean prosperity of Baal and Switzerland, the big clean stations, filled me with patriotic misgivings as I thought of the vast dirtiness of London, the mean dirtiness of Cambridgeshire. It came to me that perhaps my scheme of international values was all wrong, that quite stupendous possibilities and challenges for us and our empire might be developing here, and I recall Meredith's Skepsy in France with a new understanding. Willersley had dressed himself in a world-worn Norfolk suit of greenish-grey tweeds that ended unfamiliarly at his rather impending, spectacled, intellectual visage. I didn't, I remember, like the contrast of him with the drilled Swiss and Germans about us. Convict-coloured stockings and vast hobnailed boots finished him below, and all his luggage was a borrowed rucksack that he had tied askew. He did not want to shave in the train, but I made him at one of the Swiss stations. I dislike these Oxford slovenlinesses, and then confound him, he cut himself and bled. Next morning we were breathing a thin, exhilarating air that seemed to have washed our very veins to an incredible cleanliness, and eating hard-boiled eggs in a vast clear space of rime-edged rocks, slow mottled above a blue-gashed glacier. All about us the monstrous rock surfaces rose towards the shining peaks above, and there were winding moraines from which the ice had receded, and then dark clustering fir trees far below. I had an extraordinary feeling of having come out of things, of being outside. But this is the round world, I said, with a sense of never having perceived it before. This is the round world. End of chapter 4, section 2。chapter 4, section 3 of The New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 9. That holiday was full of big comprehensive effects. 
the first view of the Rhone Valley and the distant Valaisian Alps, for example, which we saw from the shoulder of the mountain above the Gemi, and the early summer dawn breaking over Italy as we moved from our nights crouching and munched bread and chocolate and stretched our stiff limbs among the tumbled and precipitous rocks that hung over Lake Cingolo, and surveyed the winding, tiring, rocky track going down and down to Antronapiano, and our thoughts were as comprehensive as our impressions. Willersley's mind abounded in historical matter. He had an inaccurate, abundant habit of topographical reference. He made me see and trace and see again the Roman Empire sweep up these winding valleys, and the coming of the first great peace among the warring tribes of men. In the retrospect, each of us seems to have been talking about our outlook almost continually. Each of us, you see, was full of the same question, very near and altogether predominant to us, the question, what am I going to do with my life? He saw it almost as importantly as I, but from a different angle, because his choice was largely made, and mine still hung in the balance. I feel we might do so many things, I said, and everything that calls one, calls one away from something else. Willersley agreed without any modest disavowals. We have got to think out, he said, just what we are and what we are up to. We've got to do that now. And then, it's one of those questions it is inadvisable to reopen subsequently. He beamed at me through his glasses. The sententious use of long words was a playful habit with him, that and a slight, deliberate humour, Habit's occasional extension lecturing was doing very much to intensify. "'You've made your decision?' He nodded with a peculiar forward movement of his head. "'How would you put it?' "'Social service, education. Whatever else matters or doesn't matter, it seems to me there is one thing we must have an increase, and that is the number of people who can think a little, and have—' he beamed again, an adequate sense of causation. You're sure it's worth while? For me, certainly. I don't discuss that any more. I don't limit myself too narrowly, he added. After all, the work is all one. We who know, we who feel, are building the great modern state, joining wall to wall and way to way, the new great England rising out of the decaying old. We are the real statesmen, I like that use of statesmen. Yes, I said with many doubts. Yes, of course. Willersley is middle-aged now, with silver in his hair and a deepening benevolence in his always amiable face, and he has very fairly kept his word. He has lived for social service and to do vast masses of useful, undistinguished, fertilising work. Think of the days of arid administrative plodding, and of contention still more arid and unrewarded that he must have spent. His little affectations of gesture and manner, imitative affectations for the most part, have increased, and the humorous beam and the humorous intonations have become a thing he puts on every morning like an old coat. His devotion is mingled with a considerable whimsicality, and they say he is easily flattered by subordinates, and easily offended into opposition by colleagues. He has made mistakes at times, and followed wrong courses. Still there he is, a flat contradiction to all the ordinary doctrine of motives, a man who has foregone any chances of wealth and profit, foregone any easier paths to distinction, foregone marriage and parentage, in order to serve the community. He does it without any fee or reward, except his personal self-satisfaction in doing this work, and he does it without any hope of future joys and punishments, for he is an implacable rationalist. No doubt he idealises himself a little and dreams of recognition. No doubt he gets his pleasure from a sense of power, from the spending and husbanding of large sums of public money and from the inevitable proprietorship he must feel in the fair, fine, well-ordered schools he has done so much to develop. But for me, he can say, there would have been a job about those diagrams, and that subject or this would have been less ably taught. The fact remains that for him the rewards have been adequate, if not to content, at any rate to keep him working. 
Of course he covets the notice of the world he has served, as a lover covets the notice of his mistress. Of course he thinks somewhere, somewhen, he will get credit. Only last year I heard some men talking of him, and they were noting, with little mean smiles, how he had shown himself self-conscious while there was talk of some honorary degree giving or other. It would, I have no doubt, please him greatly if his work were to flower into a crimson gown in some academic parterre. Why shouldn't it? But that is incidental vanity at the worst. He goes on anyhow. Most men don't. But we had our walk twenty years or more ago now. He was oldish even then as a young man, just as he is oldish still in middle age. Long may his industrious elderliness flourish for the good of the world. He lectured a little in conversation then. He lectures more now and listens less, toilsomely disentangling what you already understand, giving you in detail the data you know. These are things like callosities that come from a man's work. Our long three weeks' talk comes back to me as a memory of ideas and determinations slowly growing, all mixed up with the smell of wood smoke and pine woods, and huge precipices and remote gleams of snow fields, and the sound of cascading torrents rushing through deep gorges far below. It is mixed too with gossips with waitresses and fellow travellers, with my first essays in colloquial German and Italian, with disputes about the way to take, and other things that I will tell of in another section. But the white passion of human service was our dominant theme. Not simply, perhaps, nor altogether unselfishly, but quite honestly, and with at least a frequent self-forgetfulness, did we want to do fine and noble things, to help in their developing, to lessen misery, to broaden and exalt life. It is very hard, perhaps it is impossible, to present in a page or two the substance and quality of nearly a month's conversation, conversation that is casual and discursive in form, that ranges carelessly from triviality to immensity, and yet is constantly resuming a constructive process as workmen on a wall loiter and jest and go and come back and all the while build we got it more and more definite that the core of our purpose beneath all its varied aspects must needs be order and discipline. Muddle, said I, is the enemy. That remains my belief to this day. Clearness and order, light and foresight, these things I know for good. It was Muddle had just given us all the still freshly painful disasters and humiliations of the war. Muddle that gives us the visibly sprawling disorder of our cities and industrial countryside. Muddle that gives us the waste of life, the limitations, wretchedness and unemployment of the poor. Muddle, I remember myself quoting Kipling, all along a dirtiness, all along a mess, all along a doing things rather more or less. We build the state, we said over and over again. That is what we are for, servants of the new reorganisation. We planned half in earnest and half utopianising a league of social service. We talked of the splendid world of men that might grow out of such unpaid and ill-paid work as we were setting our faces to do. We spoke of the intricate difficulties, the monstrous passive resistances, the hostilities to such a development as we conceived our work subserved, and we spoke with that underlying confidence in the invincibility of the causes we adopted that is natural to young and scarcely tried men. We talked much of the detailed life of politics so far as it was known to us, and there Willersley was more experienced and far better informed than I. We discussed possible combinations and possible developments, and the chances of some great constructive movement coming from the heart-searchings the Boer War had occasioned. We would sink to gossip, even at the Suetonius level. Willersley would decline towards illuminating anecdotes that I capped more or less loosely from my private reading. We were particularly wise, I remember, upon the management of newspapers, because about that we knew nothing whatever. We perceived that great things were to be done through newspapers. We talked of swaying opinion and moving great classes to massive action. 
Men are egotistical even in devotion. All our splendid projects were thick-set with the first personal pronoun. We both could write, and all that we said in general terms was reflected in the particular in our minds. It was ourselves we saw, and no others, writing and speaking that moving word. We had already produced manuscript and passed the initiations of proof-reading. I had been a frequent speaker in the Union, and Willersley was an active man on the school board. Our feet were already on the lower rungs that led up and up. He was six and twenty, and I twenty-two. We intimated our individual careers in terms of bold expectation. I had prophetic glimpses of walls and hoardings clamorous with vote for Remington, and Willersley, no doubt, saw himself chairman of this committee and that, saying a few slightly ironical words after the declaration of the poll, and then sitting friendly beside me on the government benches. There was nothing impossible in such dreams. Why not the Board of Education for him? My preference at that time wavered between the local government board, I had great ideas about town planning, about revisions of municipal areas and reorganised internal transit, and the war office. I swayed strongly towards the latter as the journey progressed. My educational bias came later. The swelling ambitions that have tramped over alpine passes, how many of them, like mine, have come almost within sight of realisation before they failed. There were times when we posed like young gods of unassuming exterior, and times when we were full of the absurdest little solicitudes about our prospects. There were times when one surveyed the whole world of men as if it was a little thing at one's feet, and by way of contrast I remember once lying in bed, it must have been during this holiday, though I cannot for the life of me fix where, and speculating whether perhaps some day I might not be a KCB, Sir Richard Remington KCB MB. But the big style prevailed. We could not tell from minute to minute whether we were planning for a world of solid reality or telling ourselves fairy tales about this prospect of life. So much seemed possible and everything we could think of so improbable. There were lapses when it seemed to me I could never be anything but just the entirely unimportant and undistinguished young man I was for ever and ever. I couldn't even think of myself as five and thirty. Once I remember Willersley going over a list of failures and why they had failed. But young men in the twenties do not know much about failures. 10. Willersley and I professed ourselves socialists, but by this time I knew my Rodbertus as well as my Marx, and there was much in our socialism that would have shocked Chris Robinson as much as anything in life could have shocked him. Socialism as a simple democratic cry we had done with forever. We were socialist because individualism for us meant muddle, meant a crowd of separated, undisciplined little people, all obstinately and ignorantly doing things jarringly, each one in his own way. Each, I said, quoting words of my father's that rose apt in my memory, snarling from his own little bit of property like a dog tied to a cart's tail. Essentially, said Willersley, essentially we're for conscription, in peace and war alike. The man who owns property is a public official and has to behave as such. That's the gist of socialism, as I understand it. Or to be dismissed from his post, I said, and replaced by some better sort of official. A man's none the less an official because he's irresponsible. What he does with his property affects people just the same. Private? No one is really private, but an outlaw. Order and devotion were the very essence of our socialism, and a splendid collective vigour and happiness its end. We projected an ideal state, an organised state, as confident and powerful as modern science, as balanced and beautiful as a body, as beneficent as sunshine, the organised state that should end muddle for ever, it ruled all our ideals and gave form to all our ambitions. Every man was to be definitely related to that, to have his predominant duty to that. 
Such was the England renewed we had in mind, and how to serve that end, to subdue undisciplined worker and undisciplined wealth to it, and make the scientific common weal king, was the continuing substance of our intercourse. 11. Every day the wine of the mountains was stronger in our blood, and the flush of our youth deeper. We would go in the morning sunlight along some narrow alpine mule path, shouting large suggestions for national reorganisation, and weighing considerations as lightly as though the world was wax in our hands. Great England, we said in effect, over and over again, and we will be among the makers. England renewed. The country has been warned. It has learnt its lesson. The disasters and anxieties of the war have sunk in. England has become serious. Oh, there are big things before us to do, big enduring things. One evening we walked up to the lodger of a little pilgrimage church, I forget its name, that stands out on a conical hill at the head of a winding stair above the town of Locarno. Down below the houses clustered amidst a confusion of heat-bitten greenery. I had been sitting silently on the parapet, looking across to the purple mountain masses where Switzerland passes into Italy, and the drift of our talk seemed suddenly to gather to a head. I broke into speech, giving form to the thoughts that had been accumulating. My words have long since passed out of my memory. The phrases of familiar expression have altered for me, but the substance remains as clear as ever. I said how we were in our measure emperors and kings, men undriven, free to do as we please with life. We classed among the happy ones. Our bread and common necessities were given us for nothing. We had abilities. It wasn't modesty but cowardice to behave as if we hadn't, and fortune watched us to see what we might do with opportunity in the world. There are so many things to do, you see, began Willersley in his judicial lecturer's voice. So many things we may do, I interrupted, with all these years before us. We are exceptional men. It's our place, our duty to do things. Here, anyhow, I said, answering the faint amusement of his face, I've got no modesty. Everything conspires to set me up. Why should I run about like all those grubby little beasts down there, seeking nothing but mean little vanities and indulgences, and then take credit for modesty? I know I am capable. I know I have imagination. Modesty? I know if I don't attempt the very biggest things in life, I'm a damned shirk. The very biggest. Somebody has to attempt them. I feel like a loaded gun that is only a little perplexed because it has to find out just where to aim itself. The lake and the frontier villages, a white puff of steam on the distant railway to Luino, the busy boats and steamers trailing triangular wakes of foam, the long vista eastward towards battlemented Bellinzona, the vast mountain distances now tinged with sunset light behind this nearer landscape, and the southward waters with remote coast towns shining dimly, waters that merged at last in a luminous golden haze, made a broad panoramic spectacle. It was as if one surveyed the world, and it was like the games I used to set out upon my nursery floor. I was exalted by it. I felt larger than men. So kings should feel. That sense of largeness came to me then, and it has come to me since, again and again, a splendid intimation or a splendid vanity. Once, I remember, when I looked at Genoa from the mountain crest behind the town, and saw that multitudinous place in all its beauty of width and abundance and clustering human effort, and once as I was steaming past the brown low hills of Staten Island towards the towering vigour and clamorous vitality of New York City, that mood rose to its quintessence. And once it came to me, as I shall tell, on Dover Cliffs, and a hundred times when I have thought of England as our country might be, with no wretched poor, no wretched rich, a nation armed and ordered, trained and purposeful amidst its vales and rivers, that emotion of collective ends and collective purposes has returned to me. I felt as great as humanity. For a brief moment I was humanity, looking at the world I had made and had still to make. 
12. And mingled with these dreams of power and patriotic service, there was another series of a different quality and a different colour, like the antagonistic colour of a shot silk. The white life and the red life contrasted and interchanged, passing swiftly at a turn from one to another, and refusing ever to mingle peacefully one with the other. I was asking myself openly and distinctly, what are you going to do for the world? What are you going to do with yourself? And with an increasing strength and persistence, nature, in spite of my averted attention, was asking me in penetrating undertones, what are you going to do about this other fundamental matter, the beauty of girls and women and your desire for them? I have told of my sisterless youth and the narrow circumstances of my upbringing. It made all womankind mysterious to me. If it had not been for my Staffordshire cousins, I do not think I should have known any girls at all until I was twenty. Of Staffordshire I will tell a little later, but I can remember still how through all those ripening years the thought of women's beauty, their magic presence in the world beside me, and the unknown untried reactions of their intercourse, grew upon me and grew as a strange presence grows in a room when one is occupied by other things. I busied myself and pretended to be wholly occupied, and there the woman stood, full half of life neglected, and it seemed to my averted mind sometimes that she was there clad and dignified and divine, and sometimes Aphrodite shining and commanding, and sometimes that Venus who stoops and allures. This travel abroad seemed to have released a multitude of things in my mind, the clear air, the beauty of the sunshine, the very blue of the glaciers, made me feel my body and quickened all those disregarded dreams. I saw the sheathed beauty of women's forms all about me, in the cheerful waitresses at the inns, in the pedestrians one encountered in the tracks, in the chance fellow travellers at the hotel tables. Confound it, said I, and talked all the more zealously of that greater England that was calling us. I remember that we passed two Germans, an old man and a tall, fair girl, father and daughter, who were walking down from Sars. She came swinging and shining towards us, easy and strong. I worshipped her as she approached. Good talk, said Willersley, removing his hat. Morgan, said the old man, saluting. I stared stockishly at the girl, who passed with an indifferent face. That sticks in my mind as a picture remains in a room. It has kept there bright and fresh as a thing seen yesterday for twenty years. I flirted hesitatingly once or twice with comely serving girls and was a little ashamed lest Willersley should detect the keen interest I took in them. And then as we came over the pass from Santa Maria Maggiore to Canobio, my secret preoccupation took me by surprise and flooded me and broke down my pretences. The women in that valley are very beautiful. Women vary from valley to valley in the Alps, and a plain and squat here, and divinities five miles away. And as we came down, we passed a group of five or six of them resting by the wayside. Their burthens were beside them, and one like Ceres held a reaping hook in her brown hand. She watched us approaching, and smiled faintly, her eyes at mine. There was some greeting, and two of them laughed together. We passed. Glorious girls they were, said Willersley, and suddenly an immense sense of boredom enveloped me. I saw myself striding on down that winding road, talking of politics and parties and bills of Parliament and all sorts of desiccated things. That road seemed to me to wind on for ever down to dust and infinite dreariness. I knew it for a way of death. Reality was behind us. Willersley set himself to draw a sociological moral. I'm not so sure, he said in a voice of intense discriminations, after all, that agricultural work isn't good for women. Damn agricultural work, I said, and broke out into a vigorous cursing of all I held dear. Fettered things we are, I cried. I wonder why I stand it. Stand what? Why don't I go back and make love to those girls, and let the world and you and everything go hang, 
deep breasts and rounded limbs, and we poor emasculated devils go tramping by with the blood of youth in us. I'm not quite sure, Remington, said Willersley, looking at me with a deliberately quaint expression over his glasses, that picturesque scenery is altogether good for your morals. That fever was still in my blood when we came to Locarno. 13. Along the hot and dusty lower road between the Orido of Trafiume and Canobio, Willersley had developed his first blister and partly because of that, and partly because there was a bag at the station that gave us the refreshment of clean linen, and partly because of the lazy lower air into which we had come, we decided upon three or four days' sojourn in the Empress Hotel. We dined that night at a table d'hôte, and I found myself next to an Englishwoman, who began a conversation that was resumed presently in the hotel lounge. She was a woman of a perhaps thirty-three or thirty-four, slenderly built, with a warm reddish skin and very abundant fair golden hair, the wife of a petulant-looking, heavy-faced man of perhaps fifty-three, who smoked a cigar and dozed over his coffee and presently went to bed. He always goes to bed like that, she confided startlingly. He sleeps after all his meals, I never knew such a man to sleep. Then she returned to our talk, whatever it was. We had begun at the dinner table with itineraries and the usual topographical talk, and she had envied our pedestrian travel. My husband doesn't walk, she said. His heart is weak, and he cannot manage the hills. There was something friendly and adventurous in her manner. She conveyed she liked me, and when presently Willersley drifted off to write letters, our talk sank at once to easy confidential undertones. I felt enterprising, and indeed it is easy to be daring with people one has never seen before and may never see again. I said I love beautiful scenery and all beautiful things, and the pointing note in my voice made her laugh. She told me I had bold eyes, and so far as I can remember, I said she made them bold. Blue they are, she remarked, smiling archly. I like blue eyes. Then I think we compared ages, and she said she was the woman of thirty, George Moore's woman of thirty. I had not read George Moore at the time, but I pretended to understand. That, I think, was our limit that evening. She went to bed, smiling good night quite prettily down the big staircase, and I and Willersley went out to smoke in the garden. My head was full of her, and I found it necessary to talk about her, so I made her a problem in sociology. "'Who the deuce are these people?' I said, "'and how do they get a living? They seem to have plenty of money. He strikes me as being, Willersley, what is a dry salter? I think he's a retired dry salter. Willersley theorised while I thought of the woman and that provocative quality of dash she had displayed. The next day at lunch she and I met like old friends.' A huge mass of private thinking during the interval had been added to our effect upon one another. We talked for a time of insignificant things. "'What do you do?' she asked rather quickly after lunch. "'Take a siesta?' "'Sometimes,' I said, and hung for a moment eye to eye. We hadn't a doubt of each other, but my heart was beating like a steamer propeller when it lifts out of the water. "'Do you get a view from your room?' she asked after a pause. It's on the third floor, number 17, near the staircase. My friend's next door. She began to talk of books. She was interested in Christian science, she said, and spoke of a book. I forget altogether what that book was called, though I remember to this day with the utmost exactness the purplish magenta of its cover. She said she would lend it to me, and hesitated. Willersley wanted to go for an expedition across the lake that afternoon, but I refused. He made some other proposals that I rejected abruptly. "'I shall write in my room,' I said. "'Why not write down here?' "'I shall write in my room,' I snarled like a thwarted animal, and he looked at me curiously. "'Very well,' he said. "'Then I'll make some notes and think about that order of ours out under the magnolias.' 
I hovered about the lounge for a time, buying postcards and feverishly restless, watching the movements of the other people. Finally I went up to my room and sat down by the windows, staring out. There came a little tap at the unlocked door, and in an instant, like the go of a taut bowstring, I was up and had it open. "'Here is that book,' she said, and we hesitated. "'Come in,' I whispered, trembling from head to foot. "'You're just a boy,' she said in a low tone. I did not feel a bit like a lover. I felt like a burglar with the safe door nearly opened. "'Come in,' I said almost impatiently, for any one might be in the passage, and I gripped her wrist and drew her towards me. "'What do you mean?' she answered with a faint smile on her lips, and awkward and yielding. I shut the door behind her, still holding her with one hand, then turned upon her, she was laughing nervously, and without a word drew her to me and kissed her. And I remember that as I kissed her she made a little noise, almost like the purring meow with which a cat will greet one, and her face, close to mine, became solemn and tender. She was suddenly a different being from the discontented wife who had tapped a moment since on my door, a woman transfigured. That evening I came down to dinner, a monster of pride, for behold, I was a man. I felt myself the most wonderful and unprecedented of adventurers. It was hard to believe that anyone in the world before had done as much. My mistress and I met smiling. We carried things off admirably and it seemed to me that Willersley was the dullest old dog in the world. I wanted to give him advice. I wanted to give him derisive pokes. After dinner and coffee in the lounge, I was too excited and hilarious to go to bed. I made him come with me down to the café under the arches by the pier, and there drank beer and talked extravagant nonsense about everything under the sun in order not to talk about the happenings of the afternoon. All the time something shouted within me, I am a man, I am a man. What shall we do tomorrow? said he. I am for loafing, I said. Let's row in the morning and spend tomorrow afternoon just as we did today. They say the church behind the town is worth seeing. We'll go up about sunset, that's the best time for it. We can start about five. We heard music and went further along the arcade to discover a place where girls in operatic Swiss peasant costume were singing and dancing on a creaking, protesting little stage. I eyed their generous display of pink neck and arm with the seasoned eye of a man who has lived in the world. Life was perfectly simple and easy, I felt, if one took it the right way. Next day Willersley wanted to go on, but I delayed. Altogether I kept him back four days. Then abruptly my mood changed, and we decided to start early the following morning. I remember, though a little indistinctly, the feeling of my last talk with that woman, whose surname, odd as it may seem, either I never learnt or I have forgotten. Her Christian name was Millie. She was tired and rather low-spirited, and disposed to be sentimental, and for the first time in our intercourse I found myself liking her for the sake of her own personality. There was something kindly and generous appearing behind the veil of naive and uncontrolled sensuality she had worn. There was a curious quality of motherliness in her attitude to me that something in my nature answered and approved. She didn't pretend to keep it up that she had yielded to my initiative. "'I've done you no harm.' she said a little doubtfully, an odd note for a man's victim, and, "'We've had a good time. You have liked me, haven't you?' She interested me in her lonely, dissatisfied life. She was childless and had no hope of children, and her husband was the only son of a rich meat salesman, very mean, a mighty smoker. "'He reeks of it,' she said, "'always.' and interested in nothing but golf, billiards, which he played very badly, pigeon-shooting, convivial freemasonry and stock exchange punting. Mostly they drifted about the Riviera. Her mother had contrived her marriage when she was eighteen. They were the first samples I ever encountered of the great multitude of functionless property owners which encumbers modern civilization 
but at the time I didn't think much of that aspect of them. I tell all this business as it happened without comment, because I have no comment to make. It was all strange to me, strange rather than wonderful, and, it may be, some dream of beauty died forever in those furtive meetings. It happened to me, and I could scarcely have been more irresponsible in the matter, or controlled events less, if I had been suddenly pushed over a cliff into water. I swam, of course, finding myself in it. Things tested me, and I reacted as I have told. The bloom of my innocence, if ever there had been such a thing, was gone. And here is the remarkable thing about it. At the time, and for some days, I was overweeningly proud. I have never been so proud before or since. I felt I had been promoted to virility. I was unable to conceal my exultation from Willersley. It was a mood of shining, shameless, ungracious self-approval. As he and I went along in the cool morning sunshine by the rice fields in the throat of the Valmaggia, a silence fell between us. "'You know,' I said abruptly, "'about that woman.' Willersley did not answer for a moment. He looked at me over the corner of his spectacles. "'Things went pretty far,' he asked. "'Oh, all the way.' and I had a twinge of fatuous pride in my unpremeditated achievement. She came to your room? I nodded. I heard her. I heard her whispering. The whispering and rustling and so on. I was in my room yesterday. Anyone might have heard you. I went on with my head in the air. You might have been caught, and that would have meant endless trouble. You might have incurred all sorts of consequences. What did you know about her? We have wasted four days in that hot, close place. When we found that League of Social Service we were talking about, he said with a determined eye upon me, chastity will be first among the virtues prescribed. I shall form a rival league, I said a little damped. I am hanged if I give up a single desire in me until I know why. He lifted his chin and stared before him through his glasses at nothing. There are some things, he said, that a man who means to work, to do great public services, must turn his back upon. I'm not discussing the rights or wrongs of this sort of thing. It happens to be the conditions we work under. It will probably always be so. If you want to experiment in that way, if you want even to discuss it, out you go from political life. You must know that's so. You're a strange man, Remington, with a kind of kink in you. You've a sort of force... You might happen to do immense things, only... He stopped. He had said all that he had forced himself to say. I mean to take myself as I am, I said. I'm going to get experience for humanity out of all my talents, and bury nothing. Willersley twisted his face to its humorous expression. I doubt if sexual proclivities, he said dryly, come within the scope of the parable. I let that go for a little while. Then I broke out. Sex, said I, is a fundamental thing in life. We went through all this at Trinity. I'm going to look at it, experience it, think about it, and get it square with the rest of life. Career and politics must take their chances of that. It's part of the general English slackness that they won't look this in the face. Gods, what a muffled time we're coming out of. Sex means breeding, and breeding is a necessary function in a nation. The Romans broke up upon that. The Americans fade out amidst their successes. Eugenics. That wasn't eugenics, said Willersley. It was a woman, I said after a little interval, feeling oddly that I had failed altogether to answer him, and yet had a strong dumb case against him. End of chapter 4 End of book 1「Chapter Five of the New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Margaret in Staffordshire. Section One. One. I must go back a little way with my story. In the previous book I have described the kind of education that happens to a man of my class nowadays 
and it has been convenient to leap a phase in my experience that I must now set out at length. I want to tell in this second book how I came to marry, and to do that I must give something of the atmosphere in which I first met my wife, and some intimations of the forces that went to her making. I met her in Staffordshire while I was staying with that uncle of whom I have already spoken, the uncle who sold my father's houses and settled my mother in Penge. Margaret was twenty then, and I was twenty-two. It was just before the walking tour in Switzerland that opened up so much of the world to me. I saw her once for an afternoon, and circumstances so threw her up in relief that I formed a very vivid memory of her. She was in the sharpest contrast with the industrial world about her. She impressed me as a dainty blue flower might do come upon suddenly on a clinker heap. She remained in my mind at once a perplexing interrogation and a symbol. But first I must tell of my Staffordshire cousins and the world that served as a foil for her. 2. I first went to stay with my cousins when I was an awkward youth of sixteen, wearing deep mourning for my mother. My uncle wanted to talk things over with me, he said, and if he could, to persuade me to go into business instead of going up to Cambridge. I remember that visit on account of all sorts of novel things, but chiefly, I think, because it was the first time I encountered anything that deserves to be spoken of as wealth. For the first time in my life, I had to do with people who seemed to have endless supplies of money, unlimited good clothes, numerous servants, whose daily life was made up of things that I had hitherto considered to be treats or exceptional extravagances. My cousins of eighteen and nineteen took cabs, for instance, with the utmost freedom, and travelled first class in the local trains that run up and down the district of the five towns, with an entire unconsciousness of the magnificence, as it seemed to me, of such a proceeding. The family occupied a large villa in Newcastle, with big lawns before it, and behind a shrubbery with quite a lot of shrubs, a coach-house and stable, and subordinate dwelling-places for the gardener and the coachman. Every bedroom contained a gas-heater and a canopied brass bedstead, and had a little bathroom attached, equipped with the porcelain baths and fittings my uncle manufactured, bright and sanitary and stamped with his name, and the house was furnished throughout with chairs and tables in bright shining wood, soft and prevalently red Turkish carpets, cosy corners, curtained archways, gold-framed landscapes, over mantels, a dining-room sideboard like a palace with a large tantalus, and electric light fittings of a gay and expensive quality. There was a fine billiard-room on the ground floor with three comfortable sofas and a rotating bookcase containing an excellent collection of the English and American humorists from three men in a boat to the penultimate Mark Twain. There was also a conservatory opening out of the dining-room, to which the gardener brought potted flowers in their season. My aunt was a little woman with a scared look and a cap that would get over one eye, not very like my mother, and nearly eight years her junior. She was very much concerned with keeping everything nice, and unmercifully bullied by my two cousins, who took after their father and followed the imaginations of their own hearts. They were tall, dark, warmly flushed girls, handsome rather than pretty. Gertrude, the eldest and tallest, had eyes that were almost black. Sybil was of a stouter build, and her eyes, of which she was shamelessly proud, were dark blue. Sybil's hair waved, and Gertrude's was severely straight. They treated me on my first visit with all the contempt of the adolescent girl for a boy a little younger and infinitely less expert in the business of life than herself. They were very busy with the writings of notes and certain mysterious goings and comings of their own, and left me very much to my own devices. Their speech in my presence was full of unfathomable allusions. They were the sort of girls who will talk over and through an uninitiated stranger with the pleasantest sense of superiority. 
I met them at breakfast and at lunch and at the half-past six o'clock high tea that formed the third chief meal of the day. I heard them rattling off the compositions of Chaminade and Moskovsky with great decision and effect, and hovered on the edge of tennis foursomes, where it was manifest to the dullest intelligence that my presence was unnecessary. Then I went off to find some readable book in the place, but apart from miscellaneous popular novels, some veterinary works, a number of comic books, old bound volumes of the illustrated London news, and a large popular illustrated history of England, there was very little to be found. My aunt talked to me in a casual, feeble way, chiefly about my mother's last illness. The two had seen very little of each other for many years. She made no secret of it that the ineligible qualities of my father were the cause of the estrangement. The only other society in the house during the day was an old and rather decayed Sky Terrier in constant conflict with what were no doubt imaginary fleas. I took myself off for a series of walks and acquired a considerable knowledge of the scenery and topography of the potteries. It puzzled my aunt that I did not go westward where it was countryside and often quite pretty, with hedgerows and fields and copses and flowers. But always I went eastward, where in a long valley industrialism smokes and sprawls. That was the stuff to which I turned by nature to the human effort, and the accumulation and jar of men's activities. And in such a country as that valley, social and economic relations were simple and manifest. Instead of the limitless confusion of London's population, in which no man can trace any but the most slender correlation between rich and poor, in which everyone seems disconnected and adrift from everyone, you can see here the works, the pot bank or the iron works or what not, and here close at hand the congested, meanly housed workers, and at a little distance a small middle class quarter, and again remoter, the big house of the employer. It was like a very simplified diagram after the untraceable confusion of London. I prowled alone, curious and interested, through shabby back streets of mean little homes. I followed canals, sometimes canals of mysteriously heated waters with ghostly wisps of steam rising against blackened walls, or a distant prospect of dustbin-fed vegetable gardens I saw the women pouring out from the pot-banks, heard the hooters summoning the toilers to work, lost my way upon slag-heaps as big as the hills of the south country, dodged trains at manifestly dangerous level crossings, and surveyed across dark intervening spaces the flaming uproar, the gnome-like activities of iron foundries. I heard talk of strikes and rumours of strikes, and learnt from the columns of some obscure labour paper I bought one day of the horrors of the lead poisoning that was in those days one of the normal risks of certain sorts of pottery workers. Then back I came, by the ugly groaning and clanging steam train of that period, to my uncle's house, and lavish abundance of money, and more or less furtive flirtations, and the tinkle of Moskovsky and Chaminade. It was, I say, diagrammatic. One saw the expropriator and the expropriated, as if Marx had arranged the picture. It was as jumbled and far more dingy and disastrous than any of the confusions of building and development that had surrounded my youth at Bromstead and Penge, but it had a novel quality of being explicable. I found great virtue in the word exploitation. There stuck in my mind, as if it was symbolical of the whole thing, the twisted figure of a man, whose face had been horribly scalded, I can't describe how, except that one eye was just expressionless white, and he ground at an organ bearing a card which told in weak and bitterly satirical phrasing that he had been scalded by the hot water from the two-year of the blast furnace of Lord Pandrum's works. He had been scalded and quite inadequately compensated and dismissed, and Lord Pandrum was worth half a million. That upturned, sightless white eye of his took possession of my imagination. I don't think that even then I was swayed by any crude melodramatic conception of injustice. 
I was quite prepared to believe the card wasn't a punctiliously accurate statement of fact, and that a case could be made out for Lord Pandram. Still there in the muddy gutter, painfully and dreadfully, was the man, and he was smashed and scalded and wretched, and he ground his dismal hurdy-gurdy with a weary arm, calling upon heaven and the passer-by for help, for help and some sort of writing, one could not imagine quite what. There he was as a fact, as a by-product of the system that heaped my cousins with trinkets and provided the comic novels and the abundant cigars and spacious billiard-room of my uncle's house. I couldn't disconnect him and them. My uncle, on his part, did nothing to conceal the state of war that existed between himself and his workers and the mingled contempt and animosity he felt from them. 3. Prosperity had overtaken my uncle, so quite naturally he believed that every man who was not as prosperous as he was had only himself to blame. He was rich and he had left school and gone into his father's business at fifteen, and that seemed to him the proper age at which everyone's education should terminate. He was very anxious to dissuade me from going up to Cambridge, and we argued intermittently through all my visit. I had remembered him as a big and buoyant man, striding destructively about the nursery floor of my childhood, and saluting my existence by slaps, loud laughter, and questions about half herrings and half eggs, subtly framed to puzzle and confuse my mind. I didn't see him for some years until my father's death, and then he seemed rather smaller, though still a fair size, yellow instead of red, and much less radiantly aggressive. This altered effect was due not so much to my own changed perspectives, I fancy, as to the fact that he was suffering for continuous cigar smoking and being taken in hand by his adolescent daughters who had just returned from school. During my first visit there was a perpetual series of the only word is rows between them and him. Up to the age of fifteen or thereabouts, he had maintained his ascendancy over them by a simple old-fashioned physical chastisement. Then, after an interlude of a year, it had dawned upon them that power had mysteriously departed from him. He had tried stopping their pocket money, but they found their mother financially amenable, besides which it was fundamental to my uncle's attitude that he should give them money freely. Not to do so would seem like admitting a difficulty in making it so that after he had stopped their allowances for the fourth time, Sybil and Gertrude were prepared to face beggary without a qualm. It had been his pride to give them the largest allowance of any girls at the school, not even excepting the granddaughter of Fladden, the Borax King, and his soul recoiled from this discipline as it had never recoiled from the ruder method of the earlier phase. Both girls had developed to a high pitch in their mutual recriminations, a gift for damaging retort, and he found it an altogether deadlier thing than the power of the raised voice that had always cowed my aunt. Whenever he became heated with them, they frowned as if involuntarily, drew in their breath sharply, said, Daddy, you really must not say, and corrected his pronunciation. Then, at a great advantage, they resumed the discussion. My uncle's views about Cambridge, however, were perfectly clear and definite. It was waste of time and money. It was all damned foolery. Did they make a man a better businessman? Not a bit of it. He gave instances. It spoilt a man for business by giving him false ideas. Some men said that at college a man formed useful friendships. What use were friendships to a businessman? He might get to know lords, but as my uncle pointed out, a lord's requirements in his line of faience were little greater than a common man's. If college introduced him to hotel proprietors, there might be something in it. Perhaps it helped a man into Parliament, Parliament still being a confused retrogressive corner in the world where lawyers and such like shelter themselves from the onslaughts of common sense behind a fog of Latin and Greek and twaddle and tosh but I wasn't the sort to go into Parliament unless I meant to be a lawyer. Did I mean to be a lawyer? It cost no end of money and was full of uncertainties, and there were no judges nor great solicitors among my relations. 
"'Young chaps think they get on by themselves,' said my uncle. "'It isn't so, not unless they take their coats off. "'I took mine off before I was your age by nigh a year.' "'We were at cross-purposes from the outset, "'because I did not think men lived to make money, "'and I was obtuse to the hints he was throwing out "'at the possibilities of his own pot-bank, "'not willfully obtuse, but just failing to penetrate his meaning.' Whatever city merchants had or had not done for me, Flack, Topham and Old Gates had certainly barred my mistaking the profitable production and sale of lavatory basins and bathroom fittings for the highest good. It was only upon reflection that it dawned upon me that the splendid chance for a young fellow with my uncle, me having no son of my own, was anything but an illustration for comparison with my own chosen career. I still remember very distinctly my uncle's talk. He loved to speak, a reet Staffordshire, his rather flabby face with the mottled complexion that told of crude, ill-regulated appetites, his clumsy gestures, he kept emphasising his points by prodding at me with his finger, the ill-worn, costly, grey tweed clothes, the watch-chain of plain solid gold, and soft felt hat thrust back from his head. He tackled me first in the garden after lunch, and then tried to raise me to enthusiasm by taking me to his pot-bank and showing me its organisation, from the dusty grinding mills in which whitened men worked and coughed, through the highly ventilated glazing-room in which strangely masked girls looked ashamed of themselves. "'They have risked death, the fools, to show their faces to a man,' said my uncle quite audibly to the firing kilns and the glazing kilns, and so round the whole place to the railway siding and the gratifying spectacle of three trucks laden with executed orders. Then we went up a creaking outside staircase to his little office, and he showed off before me for a while with one or two subordinates and the telephone. "'None of your gas,' he said. "'All this. It's real, every bit of it. Hard cash and hard glaze.' "'Yes,' I said with memories of a carelessly read pamphlet in my mind, and without any satirical intention, I suppose you must use lead in your glazes. Whereupon I found I had tapped the ruling grievance of my uncle's life. He hated leadless glazes more than he hated anything, except the benevolent people who had organised the agitation for their use. "'Leadless glazes ain't only fit for buns,' he said. "'Let me tell you, my boy.' He began in a voice of bland persuasiveness that presently warmed to anger to explain the whole matter. I hadn't the right to the matter at all. Firstly, there was practically no such thing as lead poisoning. Secondly, not everyone was liable to lead poisoning, and it would be quite easy to pick out the susceptible types as soon as they had it and put them to other work. Thirdly, the evil effects of lead poisoning were much exaggerated. Fourthly, and this was in a particularly confidential undertone, many of the people liked to get lead poisoning, especially the women, because it caused abortion. I might not believe it, but he knew it for a fact. Fifthly, the work people simply would not learn the gravity of the danger, and would eat with unwashed hands, and incur all sorts of risks, so that, as my uncle put it, the fools deserve what they get. Sixthly, he and several associated firms had organised a simple and generous insurance scheme against lead poisoning risks. Seventhly, he never wearied in rational, as distinguished from excessive, futile and expensive precautions against the disease. Eighthly, in the ill-equipped shops of his minor competitors, lead poisoning was a frequent and virulent evil, and people had generalised from these exceptional cases. The small shops he hazarded, looking out of the cracked and dirty window at distant chimneys, might be advantageously closed. "'But what's the good of talking?' said my uncle, getting off the table on which he had been sitting. "'Seems to me there'll come a time when a master will get fined if he don't run round the works, blowing his girl's noses for them. That's about what it'll come to.' He walked to the black mantelpiece and stood on the threadbare rug, and urged me not to be misled by the stories of prejudiced and interested enemies of our national industries. "'They'll get a strike one of these days of employers, and then we'll see a bit,' he said. "'They'll drive capital abroad, and then they'll whistle to get it back again.' 
He led the way down the shaky wooden steps, and cheered up to tell me of his way of checking his coal consumption. He exchanged a ferocious greeting with one or two workpeople, and so we came out of the factory gates into the ugly, narrow streets, paved with a peculiarly hard, diapered brick of an unpleasing inky-blue colour, and bordered with the mean and squalid homes of his workers. Doors stood open and showed grimy interiors, and dirty, ill-clad children playing in the kennel. We passed a sickly-looking girl with a sallow face, who dragged her limbs and peered at us dimly with painful eyes. She stood back, as partly blinded people will do, to allow us to pass, although there was plenty of room for us. I glanced back at her. "'That's plumism,' said my uncle casually. "'What?' said I. "'Plumism. And the other day I saw a fool of a girl, and what do you think? She'd got a basin that hadn't been fired, a cracked piece of biscuit it was, up on the shelf over her head, just all over glaze, killing glaze, man, and she was putting up her hand, if you please, and eating her dinner out of it. Got her dinner in it. "'Eating her dinner out of it,' he repeated in loud and bitter tones, and punched me hard in the ribs. "'And then they comes to that and grumbles, "'and the fools up in Westminster "'want you to put in fans here and fans there, "'the Longton fools have, "'and then eating their dinners out of it all the time.' "'At high tea that night, "'my uncle was still holding out against evening dinner, "'Sybil and Gertrude made what was evidently "'a concerted demand for a motor-car. "'You've got your mother's broom,' he said. "'That's good enough for you.' "'But he seemed shaken by the fact that some Burslem rival was launching out with the new invention. "'He spoils his girls,' he remarked. "'He's a fool,' and became thoughtful. Afterwards he asked me to come to him into his study. It was a room with a writing desk, and full of pieces of earthenware and such like litter, and we had our great row about Cambridge. "'Are you thought things over, Dick?' he said. "'I think I'll go to Trinity, Uncle,' I said firmly. "'I want to go to Trinity.' "'It is a great college.' "'He was manifestly chagrined. "'You're a fool,' he said. "'I made no answer. "'You're a damned fool,' he said. "'But I suppose you've got to do it. "'You could have come here. "'That don't matter, though, now. "'You'll have your time and spend your money "'and be a poor half-served clergyman "'mucking about with the women all the day "'and afraid I'm one of your own ever, "'or you'll be a schoolmaster "'or some such fool for the rest of your life, "'or some newspaper chap. "'That's what you'll get from Cambridge. "'Have half a mind not to let you. Eh? "'More than half a mind. "'You've got to do the thing you can,' he said after a pause, "'and likely it's what you're fitted for.' 4. I paid several short visits to Staffordshire during my Cambridge days, "'and always these relations of mine produced the same effect of hardness. "'My uncle thoughts had neither atmosphere nor mystery.' He lived in a different universe from the dreams of scientific construction that filled my mind. He could as easily have understood Chinese poetry. His motives were made up of intense rivalries with other men of his class and kind, a few vindictive hates springing from real and fancied slights, a habit of acquisition that had become a second nature, the keen love both of efficiency and display in his own affairs. He seemed to me to have no sense of the state, no sense and much less any love of beauty, no charity and no sort of religious feeling whatever. He had strong bodily appetites, he ate and drank freely, smoked a great deal, and occasionally was carried off by his passions for a bit of a spree to Birmingham or Liverpool or Manchester. The indulgences of these occasions were usually followed by a period of reaction, when he was urgent for the suppression of nudity in the local art gallery, and a harsh and forcible elevation of the superficial morals of the valley. And he spoke of the ladies who ministered to the delights of his jolly dog period, when he spoke of them at all, by the unprintable feminine equivalent. My aunt he treated with a kindly contempt and considerable financial generosity. But his daughters tore his heart, he was so proud of them, so glad to find the money to spend, so resolved to own them, so instinctively jealous of every man who came near them. My uncle has been the clue to a great number of men for me. He was an illuminating extreme. I have learnt what not to expect from them through him, 
and to comprehend resentments and dangerous sudden antagonisms I should have found incomprehensible in their more complex forms, if I had not first seen them in him, in their feral state. With his soft felt hat at the back of his head, his rather heavy, rather mottled face, his rationally thick boots and slouching tweed-clad form, a little round-shouldered and very obstinate-looking, he strolled through all my speculations, sucking his teeth audibly, and occasionally throwing out a shrewd aphorism, the intractable, unavoidable awe of the new civilization. Essentially he was simple. Generally speaking, he hated and despised, in equal measure, whatever seemed to suggest that he personally was not the most perfect human being conceivable. He hated all education after fifteen, because he had had no education after fifteen. He hated all people who did not have high tea, until he himself under duress gave up high tea. He hated every game except football, which he had played and could judge. He hated all people who spoke foreign languages, because he knew no language but Staffordshire. He hated all foreigners, because he was English, and all foreign ways, because they were not his ways. Also he hated particularly, and in this order, Londoners, Yorkshiremen, Scotch, Welsh and Irish, because they were not great Staffordshire, and he hated all other Staffordshire men as insufficiently great. He wanted to have all his own women in violet, and to fancy he had a call upon every other woman in the world. He wanted to have the best cigars and the best brandy in the world to consume or give away magnificently, and every one else to have inferior ones. His billiard-table was an extra-large size, specially made and very inconvenient. And he hated trade unions, because they interfered with his autocratic direction of his works, and his work-people, because they were not obedient and untiring mechanisms to do his bidding. He was, in fact, a very naive, vigorous human being. He was about as much civilised about as much tamed to the ideas of collective action and mutual consideration as a Central African Negro. There are hordes of such men as he throughout all the modern industrial world. You will find the same type, with the slightest modifications, in the Pas de Calais, or Rhenish Prussia, or New Jersey, or North Italy. No doubt you would find it in New Japan. These men have raised themselves up from the general mass of untrained, uncultured, poorish people in a hard, industrious, selfish struggle. To drive others, they have had first to drive themselves. They have never yet had occasion nor leisure to think of the state or social life as a whole, and as for dreams or beauty, it was a condition of survival that they should ignore such cravings. All the distinctive qualities of my uncle can be thought of as dictated by his conditions, his success and harshness, the extravagances that expressed his pride in making money, the uncongenial luxury that sprang from rivalry, and his self-reliance, his contempt for broad views, his contempt for everything that he could not understand. His daughters were the inevitable children of his life. Queer girls they were, curiously spirited, as people phrase it, and curiously limited. During my Cambridge days, I went down to Staffordshire several times. My uncle, though he still resented my refusal to go into his business, was also, in his odd way, proud of me. I was his nephew and poor relation, and yet there I was, a young gentleman learning all sorts of unremunerative things in the grandest manner, Latin and muck while the sons of his neighbours, not nephews merely, but sons, stayed unpolished in their native town. Every time I went down, I found extensive changes and altered relations, and before I had settled down to them, off I went again. I don't think I was one person to them. I was a series of visitors. There is a gulf of ages between a gaunt schoolboy of sixteen in unbecoming mourning and two vividly self-conscious girls of eighteen and nineteen, but a Cambridge man of two-and-twenty, with a first and good tennis and a growing social experience, is a fair contemporary for two girls of twenty-three and twenty-four. A motor-car appeared, I think, in my second visit, a bottle-green affair that opened behind, had dark purple cushions, and was controlled mysteriously by a man in shiny black costume and a flat cap. 
the high tea had been shifted to seven and rechristened dinner but my uncle would not dress nor consent to have wine and after one painful experiment i gathered and a scene he put his foot down and prohibited any but high neck dresses dad is perfectly impossible sybil told me the foot had descended vehemently my own daughters he had said dressed up like and had arrested himself and fumbled and decided to say actresses and showing their fat arms for every fool to stare at nor would he have any people invited to dinner he didn't he had explained want strangers poking about in his house when he came home tired so such calling as occurred went on during his absence in the afternoon one of the peculiarities of the life of these ascendant families of the industrial class to which wealth has come is its tremendous insulations there were no customs of intercourse in the five towns all the isolated prosperities of the district sprang from economising hard-driven homes in which there was neither time nor means for hospitality social intercourse centred very largely upon the church or chapel and the chapels were better at bringing people together than the establishment to which my cousins belonged their chief outlet to the wider world lay, therefore, through the acquaintances they had formed at school, and through two much less prosperous families of relations who lived at Longton and Hanley. A number of gossiping friendships with old schoolmates were kept up, and my cousins would spend the afternoon or even spend the day with these. Such occasions led to other encounters, and interlaced with the furtive correspondences and snatched meetings that formed the emotional thread of their lives. When the billiard-table had been new, my uncle had been taken to asking in a few approved friends for an occasional game, but mostly the billiard-room was for glory in the girls. Both of them played very well. They never, so far as I know, dined out and when at last, after bitter domestic conflicts, they began to go to dances, they went with the quavering connivance of my aunt, and changed into bull frocks at friends' houses on the way. There was a tennis club that formed a convenient afternoon rendezvous, and I recall that in the period of my earlier visits, the young bloods of the district found much satisfaction in taking girls for drives in dog-carts and such-like high-wheeled vehicles, a disposition that died in tangled tandems at the apparition of motor-cars. My aunt and uncle had conceived no plans in life for their daughters at all. In the undifferentiated industrial community from which they had sprung, girls got married somehow, and it did not occur to them that the concentration of property that had made them wealthy had cut their children off from the general social sea in which their own awkward meeting had occurred, without necessarily opening any other world in exchange. My uncle was too much occupied with the works and his business affairs and his private vices to philosophise about his girls. He wanted them just to keep girls, preferably about sixteen, and to be a sort of animated flowers and make home bright and be given things. He was irritated that they would not remain at this, and still more irritated that they failed to suppress altogether their natural interest in young men. The tandems would be steered by weird and devious routes to evade the bare chance of his bloodshot eye. My aunt seemed to have no ideas whatever about what was likely to happen to her children. She had, indeed, no ideas about anything. She took her husband and the days as they came. I can see now the pathetic difficulty of my cousin's position in life, the absence of any guidance or instruction or provision for their development. They supplemented the silences of home by the conversation of school fellows and the suggestions of popular fiction. They had to make what they could out of life with such hints as these. The church was far too modest to offer them any advice. It was obtruded upon my mind upon my first visit that they were both carrying on correspondences and having little furtive passings and seeings and meetings with the mysterious owners of certain initials, S and L K, and if I remember rightly, the R N brothers and cousins, I suppose, of their friends. The same thing was going on with a certain intensification at my next visit, excepting only that the initials were different. But when I came again, their methods were maturer, or I was no longer a negligible quantity, 
and the notes and the initials were no longer flaunted quite so openly in my face. My cousins had worked it out from the indications of their universe that the end of life is to have a good time. They used the phrase. That and the drives in dog carts were only the first of endless points of resemblance between them and the commoner sort of American girl. When some years ago I paid my first and only visit to America, I seemed to recover my cousin's atmosphere as soon as I entered the train at Euston. There were three girls in my compartment supplied with huge decorated cases of sweets, and being seen off by a company of friends, noisily arch and eager about the steamer letters they would get at Liverpool. They were the very sole sisters of my cousins. The chief elements of a good time, as my cousins judged it, as these countless thousands of rich young women judge it, are a petty eventfulness, laughter, and to feel that you are looking well and attracting attention. Shopping is one of its leading joys. You buy things, clothes and trinkets for yourself and presents for your friends. Presents always seem to be flying about in that circle. Flowers and boxes of sweets were common currency. My cousins were always getting and giving, my uncle caressed them with parcels and cheques. They kissed him, and he exuded sovereigns as a stroked aphis exudes honey. It was like the new language of the Academy of Legado to me, and I never learnt how to express myself in it, for nature and training make me feel encumbered to receive presents and embarrassed in giving them. But then, like my father, I hate and distrust possessions. Of the quality of their private imagination I never learnt anything. I suppose it followed the lines of the fiction they read, and was romantic and sentimental. So far as marriage went, the married state seemed at once very attractive and dreadfully serious to them, composed in equal measure of becoming important and becoming old. I don't know what they thought about children. I doubt if they thought about them at all. It was very secret if they did. As for the poor and dingy people all about them, my cousins were always ready to take part in a charitable bazaar. They were unaware of any economic correlation of their own prosperity and that circumambient poverty, and they knew of trade unions simply as disagreeable external things that upset my uncle's temper. They knew of nothing wrong in social life at all, except that there were agitators. It surprised them a little, I think, that agitators were not more drastically put down but they had a sort of instinctive dread of social discussion as of something that might breach the happiness of their ignorance. End of chapter 5, section 1。Chapter 5, section 2 of The New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 5. My cousins did more than illustrate marks for me. They also undertook a stage of my emotional education. Their method in that, as in everything else, was extremely simple, but it took my inexperience by surprise. It must have been on my third visit that Sybil took me in hand. Hitherto I seemed to have seen her only in profile, but now she became almost completely full face, manifestly regarded me with those violet eyes of hers. She passed me things I needed at breakfast, it was the first morning of my visit, before I asked for them. When young men are looked at by pretty cousins, they become intensely aware of those cousins. It seemed to me that I had always admired Sybil's eyes very greatly, and that there was something in her temperament congenial to mine. It was odd I had not noted it on my previous visits. We walked round the garden some when that morning, and talked about Cambridge. She asked quite a lot of questions about my work and my ambitions. She said she had always felt sure I was clever. The conversation languished a little, and we picked some flowers for the house. Then she asked if I could run. I conceded her various starts, and we raced up and down the middle garden path. Then, a little breathless, we went into the new twenty-five-guinea summer-house at the end of the herbaceous border. 
we sat side by side pleasantly hidden from the house and she became anxious about her hair which was slightly and prettily disarranged and asked me to help her with the adjustment of a hairpin i had never in my life been so near the soft curly hair and the dainty eyebrow and eyelid and warm soft cheek of a girl and i was stirred it stirs me now to recall it i became a battleground of impulses and inhibitions thank you said my cousin and moved a little away from me she began to talk about friendship and lost her thread and forgot the little electric stress between us in rather meandering analysis of her principal girlfriends but afterwards she resumed her purpose i went to bed that night with one proposition overshadowing everything else in my mind namely that kissing my cousin sybil was a difficult but not impossible achievement i do not recall any shadow of a doubt whether on the whole it was worth doing the thing had come into my existence disturbing and interrupting its flow exactly as a fever does sybil had infected me with herself the next day matters came to a crisis in the little upstairs sitting-room which had been assigned me as a study during my visit i was working up there or rather trying to work in spite of the outrageous capering of some very primitive elements in my brain when she came up to me under a transparent pretext of looking for a book i turned round and then got up at the sight of her i quite forget what our conversation was about but i know she led me to believe i might kiss her then when i attempted to do so she averted her face how could you she said i didn't mean that that remained the state of our relations for two days i developed a growing irritation with and resentment against cousin sybil combined with an intense desire to get that kiss for which i hungered and thirsted cousin sybil went about in the happy persuasion that i was madly in love with her and her game so far as she was concerned was played and won it wasn't until i had fretted for two days that i realised that i was being used for the commonest form of excitement possible to a commonplace girl that dozens perhaps of young men had played the part of tantalus at cousin sybil's lips i walked about my room at night damning her and calling her by terms which on the whole she rather deserved while sybil went to sleep pitying poor old dick damn it i said i will be equal with you but i never did equalise the disadvantage and perhaps it's as well for i fancy that sort of revenge cuts both people too much for a rational man to seek it why are men so silly said cousin sybil next morning wriggling back with down-bent head to release herself from what should have been a compelling embrace confound it i said with a flash of clear vision you started this game oh she stood back against a hedge of roses a little flushed and excited and interested and ready for the delightful defensive if i should renew my attack beastly hot for scuffling i said white with anger i don't know whether i'm so keen on kissing you sybil after all i just thought you wanted me to i could have whipped her and my voice stung more than my words our eyes met a real hatred in hers leaping up to meet mine let's play tennis i said after a moment's pause no she answered shortly i'm going indoors very well and that ended the affair with sybil i was still in the full glare of this disillusionment when gertrude awoke from some preoccupation to an interest in my existence she developed a disposition to touch my hand by accident and let her fingers rest in contact with it for a moment she had pleasant soft hands she began to drift into summer houses with me to let her arm rest trustfully against mine to ask questions about cambridge they were much the same questions that sybil had asked but i controlled myself and maintained a profile of intelligent and entirely civil indifference to her blandishments what gertrude made of it came out one evening in some talk i forget about what with sybil oh dick said gertrude a little impatiently dick's pie 
and I never disillusioned her by any subsequent levity from this theory of my innate and virginal piety. 6. It was against this harsh and crude Staffordshire background that I think I must have seen Margaret for the first time. I say I think because it is quite possible that we had passed each other in the streets of Cambridge, no doubt with that affectation of mutual disregard which was once customary between undergraduates and Newnham girls, but if that was so I had noted nothing of the slender graciousness that shone out so pleasingly against the bleaker Midland surroundings. She was a younger schoolfellow of my cousin's, and the stepdaughter of Seddon, a prominent solicitor of Burslem. She was not only not in my cousin's generation, but not in their set. She was one of a small, hard-working group who kept immaculate notebooks, and did as much as is humanly possible of that insensate pile of written work that the girls' public school movement has inflicted upon schoolgirls. She really learnt French and German admirably and thoroughly. She got as far in mathematics as an unflinching industry can carry anyone with no great natural aptitude, and she went up to Bennet Hall, Newnham, after the usual conflict with her family, to work for the history tripos. There in her third year she made herself thoroughly ill through overwork, so ill that she had to give up Newnham altogether and go abroad with her stepmother. She made herself ill, as so many girls do in those university colleges, through the badness of her home and school training. She thought study must needs be a hard straining of the mind. She worried her work. She gave herself no leisure to see it as a whole. She felt herself not making headway, and she cut her games and exercise in order to increase her hours of toil, and worked into the night. She carried a knack of laborious thoroughness into the blind alleys and inessentials of her subject. It didn't need the badness of the food for which Bennet Hall is celebrated, and the remarkable dietary of nocturnal cocoa, cakes and soft biscuits, with which the girls have supplemented it, to ensure her collapse. Her mother brought her home, fretting and distressed, and then finding her hopelessly unhappy at home, took her and her half-brother, a rather ailing youngster of ten who died three years later, for a journey to Italy. Italy did much to assuage Margaret's chagrin. I think all three of them had a very good time there. At home, Mr. Said and her stepfather played the part of a well-meaning blight by reason of the mood that arose from nervous dyspepsia. They went to Florence, equipped with various introductions and much sound advice from sympathetic Cambridge friends, and having acquired an ease in Italy there, went on to Siena, Orvieto, and at last Rome. They returned, if I remember rightly, by Pisa, Genoa, Milan, and Paris. Six months or more they had had abroad, and now Margaret was back in Burslem, in health again, and consciously a very civilised person. New ideas were abroad. It was May time, and a spring of abundant flowers. Daffodils were particularly good that year, and Mrs. Seddon celebrated her return by giving an afternoon reception at short notice, with the clear intention of letting everyone out into the garden if the weather held. The Seddons had a big old farmhouse modified to modern ideas of comfort on the road out towards Misterton with an orchard that had been rather pleasantly subdued from use to ornament. It had rich blossoming cherry and apple trees. Large patches of grass full of nodding yellow trumpets had been left amidst the not too precisely mown grass, which was as it were grass path with an occasional lapse into lawn or glade. And Margaret, hatless, with the fair hair above her thin, delicately pink face very simply done, came to meet our rather too consciously dressed party. We had come in the motor four strong, with my aunt in grey silk. Margaret wore a soft, flowing, flowered blue dress of diaphanous material, all unconnected with the fashion, and tied with pretty ribbons, like a slenderer, unbountiful primavera. It was one of those May days that ape the light and heat of summer, and I remember disconnectedly quite a number of brightly lit figures and groups walking about, 
and a white gate between orchard and garden, and a large lawn with an oak tree, and a red Georgian house with a veranda and open French windows, through which the tea-drinking had come out upon the moss-edged flagstones, even as Mrs. Seddon had planned. The party was almost entirely feminine, except for a little curate with a large head, a good voice, and a radiant manner, who was obviously attracted by Margaret, and two or three young husbands, still sufficiently addicted to their wives, to accompany them. One of them, I recall, as a quite romantic figure with abundant blonde curly hair, on which was poised a grey felt hat, encircled by a refined black band. He wore, moreover, a loose rich shot silk tie of red and purple, a long frock coat, grey trousers and brown shoes, and presently he removed his hat and carried it in one hand. There were two tennis-playing youths besides myself. There was also one father, with three daughters in anxious control, a father of the old school, scarcely half broken in, reluctant, rebellious, and consciously and conscientiously, Rach Staffordshire. The daughters were all alert to suppress the possible plungings, the undesirable humorous impulses of this almost feral guest. They nipped his very gestures in the bud. The rest of the people were mainly mothers with daughters, daughters of all ages, and a scattering of aunts, and there was a tendency to clotting, parties kept together and regarded parties suspiciously, Mr. Seddon was in hiding, I think, all the time, though not formally absent. Matters centred upon the tea in the long room of the French windows, where four trim maids went to and fro, busily between the house and the clumps of people seated or standing before it, and tennis and croquet were intermittently visible and audible, beyond a bank of rockwork rich with the spikes and cups and bells of high spring. Mrs. Seddon presided at the tea-urn, and Margaret partly assisted and partly talked to me and my cousin Sybil. Gertrude had found a disused and faded initial, and was partnering him at tennis in a state of gentle revival, while their mother exercised a divided chaperonage from a seat near Mrs. Seddon. The little curate, stirring a partially empty cup of tea, mingled with our party, and preluded, I remember, every observation he made by a vigorous resumption of stirring. We talked of Cambridge, and Margaret kept us to it. The curate was a Selwyn man, and had taken a past degree in theology, but Margaret had come to Gaylord's lecturers in Trinity for a term before her breakdown, and understood these differences. She had the eagerness of an exile to hear the old familiar names of places and personalities. We capped familiar anecdotes and were enthusiastic about King's Chapel and the Backs, and the curate, addressing himself more particularly to Sybil, told a long confused story, illustrative of his disposition to reckless devilry, of a pure-minded kindly sort, about upsetting two canoes quite needlessly on the way to Grantchester. I can still see Margaret as I saw her that afternoon, see her fresh fair face, with the little obliquity of the upper lip, and her brow always slightly knitted, and her manner as of one breathlessly shy but determined. She had rather open blue eyes, and she spoke in an even musical voice, with the gentlest of stresses and the ghost of a lisp. And it was true, she gathered, that Cambridge still existed, "'I went to Grantchester,' she said, "'last year, and had tea under the apple blossom. "'I didn't think then I should have to come down.' "'It was that started the curate upon his anecdote. "'I've seen a lot of pictures, and learnt a lot about them, "'at the Pity and the Brera. "'The Brera is wonderful, wonderful places, "'but it isn't like real study,' she was saying presently. "'We bought bales of photographs,' she said. "'I thought the bales a little out of keeping.' But fair-haired and quite simply and yet graciously and fancifully dressed, talking of art and beautiful things and a beautiful land, and with so much manifest regret for learning denied, she seemed a different kind of being altogether from my smart, hard, high-coloured, black-haired and resolutely hatted cousin. She seemed translucent beside Gertrude. 
Even the little twist and droop of her slender body was a grace to me. I liked her from the moment I saw her, and set myself to interest and please her as well as I knew how. We recalled a case of ragging that had rustled the shrubs of Newnham, and then Chris Robinson's visit. He had given a talk to Bennett Hall also, and our impression of him. He disappointed me too, said Margaret. I was moved to tell Margaret something of my own views in the matter of social progress, and she listened, oh, with a kind of urged attention, and her brow a little more knitted, very earnestly. The little curate desisted from the appendices and refuse heaps and general debris of his story, and made himself look very alert and intelligent. "'We did a lot of that when I was up in the eighties, he said. "'I'm glad imperialism hasn't swamped you fellows altogether.' Gertrude, looking bright and confident, came to join our talk from the shrubbery. The initial, a little flushed and evidently in a state of refreshed relationship, came with her, and a cheerful lady in pink, and more particularly distinguished by a pink bonnet, joined our little group. Gertrude had been sipping admiration, and was not disposed to play a passive part in the talk. "'Socialism!' she cried, catching the word. "'It's well Pa isn't here. He has fits when people talk of socialism. Fits!' The initial laughed in a general kind of way. The curate said there was socialism and socialism, and looked at Margaret to gauge whether he had been too bold in this utterance. But she was all he perceived for broad-mindedness, and he stirred himself, and incidentally his tea, to still more liberality of expression. He said the state of the poor was appalling, simply appalling, that there were times when he wanted to shatter the whole system. Only, he said, turning to me appealingly, what have we got to put in its place? The thing that exists is always the more evident alternative, I said. The little curate looked at it for a moment. Precisely, he said explosively, and turned stirring and with his head a little on one side to hear what Margaret was saying. Margaret was saying with a swift blush and an effect of daring that she had no doubt she was a socialist. "'And wearing a gold chain,' said Gertrude, "'and drinking out of eggshell, I like that.' I came to Margaret's rescue. It doesn't follow that because one's a socialist one ought to dress in sackcloth and ashes. The initial coloured deeply, and having secured my attention by prodding me slightly with the wrist of the hand that held his teacup, cleared his throat, and suggested that one ought to be consistent. I perceived we were embarked upon a discussion of the elements. We began an interesting little wrangle, one of those crude discussions of general ideas that are dear to the heart of youth. I and Margaret supported one another as socialists. Gertrude and Sybil in the initial maintained an anti-socialist position. The curate attempted a cross-bench position with an air of intending to come down upon us presently with a casting vote. He reminded us of a number of useful principles too often overlooked in argument, that in a big question like this there was much to be said on both sides, that if every one did his or her duty to every one about them there would be no difficulty with social problems at all, that over and above all enactments we needed moral changes in people themselves. My cousin Gertrude was a difficult controversialist to manage, being unconscious of inconsistency in statement and absolutely impervious to reply. Her standpoint was essentially materialistic. She didn't see why she shouldn't have a good time because other people didn't. They would have a good time, she was sure, if she didn't. She said that if we did give up everything we had to other people, they wouldn't very likely know what to do with it. She asked if we were so fond of work people, why we didn't go and live among them, and expressed the inflexible persuasion that if we had socialism, everything would be just the same again in ten years' time. She also threw upon us the imputation of ingratitude for a beautiful world by saying that, so far as she was concerned, she didn't want to upset everything. She was contented with things as they were, thank you. The discussion led in some way that I don't in the least recall now, 
and possibly by abrupt transitions, to a croquet foursome, in which Margaret involved the curate without involving herself, and then stood beside me on the edge of the lawn while the others played. We watched silently for a moment. "'I hate that sort of view,' she said suddenly in a confidential undertone, with her delicate pink flush returning. "'It's want of imagination,' I said. "'To think we are just to enjoy ourselves,' she went on, "'just to go on dressing and playing and having meals and spending money.' She seemed to be referring not simply to my cousins, but to the whole world of industry and property about us. "'But what is one to do?' she asked. "'I do wish I had not had to come down. It's all so pointless here. There seems to be nothing going forward, no ideas, no dreams. No one here seems to feel quite what I feel, the sort of need there is for meaning in things. I hate things without meaning.' "'Don't you do—' local work i suppose i shall i suppose i must find something do you think if one were attempt to some sort of propaganda could you i began a little doubtfully i suppose i couldn't she answered after a thoughtful moment i suppose it would come to nothing and yet i feel there is so much to be done for the world so much one ought to be doing i want to do something for the world I can see her now as she stood there, with her brows nearly frowning, her blue eyes looking before her, her mouth almost petulant. One feels that there are so many things going on, out of one's reach, she said. I went back in the motor car with my mind full of her, the quality of delicate discontent, the suggestion of exile. Even a kind of weakness in her was sympathetic. She told tremendously against her background. She was, I say, like a protesting blue flower upon a cinder heap. It is curious, too, how she connects and mingles with the furious quarrel I had with my uncle that very evening. That came absurdly. Indirectly, Margaret was responsible. My mind was running on ideas she had revived and questions she had set clamouring and quite inadvertently in my attempt to find solutions, I talked so as to outrage his profoundest feelings. 7. What a preposterous shindy that was! I sat with him in the smoking-room, propounding what I considered to be the most indisputable and non-contentious propositions conceivable, until to my infinite amazement he exploded and called me a damned young puppy! It was seismic. Tremendously interesting time, I said, just in the beginning of making a civilization. Ah, he said, with an averted face, and nodded, leaning forward over his cigar. I had not the remotest thought of annoying him. Monstrous muddle of things we have got, I said. Jumbled streets, ugly population, ugly factories. You'd do a sight better if you had to do with it said my uncle, regarding me askance. Not me, but a world that had a collective plan and knew where it meant to be going would do a sight better anyhow. We're all swimming in a flood of ill-calculated chances. You'll be making out I organise that business down there by chance next, said my uncle, his voice thick with challenge. I went on as though I was back in Trinity. There's a lot of chance in the making of all great businesses, I said. My uncle remarked that that showed how much I knew about businesses. If chance made businesses, why was it that he always succeeded and grew, while those fools Ackroyd and Sons always took second place? He showed a disposition to tell the glorious history of how once Ackroyd's overshadowed him, and how now he could buy up Ackroyd's three times over. But I wanted to get out what was in my mind. Oh, I said, as between man and man and business and business, some, of course, get the pull by this quality or that, but it's forces quite outside the individual case that make the big part of any success under modern conditions. You never invented pottery, nor any process in pottery that matters a rap in your works. It wasn't your foresight that joined all England up with railways and made it possible to organise production on an altogether different scale. 
You really, at the utmost, can't take credit for much more than being the sort of man who happened to fit what happened to be the requirements of the time, and who happened to be in a position to take advantage of them. It was then my uncle cried out and called me a damned young puppy, and became involved in some unexpected trouble of his own. I woke up, as it were, from my analysis of the situation, to discover him bent over a splendid spittoon, cursing incoherently, retching a little, and spitting out the end of his cigar which he had bitten off in his last attempt at self-control, and withal fully prepared as soon as he had cleared for action to give me just all that he considered to be the contents of his mind upon the condition of mine. Well, why shouldn't I talk my mind to him? He'd never had an outside view of himself for years, and I resolved to stand up to him. We went at it hammer and tongs. It became clear that he supposed me to be a socialist, a zealous, embittered hater of all ownership, and also an educated man of the vilest, most pretentiously superior description. His principal grievance was that I thought I knew everything. To that he recurred again and again. We had been maintaining an armed truce with each other since my resolve to go up to Cambridge, and now we had out all that had accumulated between us. There had been stupendous accumulations. The particular things we said and did in that bawling encounter matter nothing at all in this story. I can't now estimate how near we came to fisticuffs. It ended with my saying, after a pungent reminder of benefits conferred and remembered, that I didn't want to stay another hour in his house. I went upstairs in a state of puerile fury to pack and go off to the railway hotel, while he, with ironical civility, telephoned for a cab. "'Good riddance!' shouted my uncle, seeing me off into the night. On the face of it our row was preposterous, but the underlying reality of our quarrel was the essential antagonism, it seemed to me, in all human affairs the antagonism between ideas and the established method, that is to say, between ideas and the rule of thumb. The world I hate is the rule of thumb world. The thing I and my kind of people exist for, primarily, is to battle with that, to annoy it, disarrange it, reconstruct it. We question everything, disturb anything that cannot give a clear justification to our questioning, because we believe inherently that our sense of disorder implies the possibility of a better order. Of course we are detestable. My uncle was of that other vaster mass who accept everything for the thing it seems to be, hate inquiry and analysis as a tramp hates washing, dread and resist change, oppose experiment, despise science. The world is our battleground, and all history, all literature that matters, all science, deals with this conflict of the thing that is, and the speculative if that will destroy it. But that is why I did not see Margaret Seddon again for five years. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six, Section One of the New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Margaret in London. One. I was twenty-seven when I met Margaret again, and the intervening five years had been years of vigorous activity for me, if not of very remarkable growth. When I saw her again, I could count myself a grown man. I think, indeed, I counted myself more completely grown than I was. At any rate, by all ordinary standards, I had got on very well, and my ideas, if they had not changed very greatly, had become much more definite, and my ambitions clearer and bolder. I had long since abandoned my fellowship and come to London, I had published two books that had been talked about, written several articles, and established a regular relationship with the Weekly Review and the Evening Gazette. I was a member of the Eighty Club and learning to adapt the style of the Cambridge Union to larger uses. 
the London world had opened out to me very readily. I had developed a pleasant variety of social connections. I had made the acquaintance of Mr. Evesham, who had been attracted by my new ruler, and who talked about it and me, and so did a very great deal to make a way for me into the company of prominent and amusing people. I dined out quite frequently. The glitter and interest of good London dinner parties became a common experience. I liked the sort of conversation one got at them extremely, the little glow of duologues burning up into more general discussions, the closing in of the men after the going of the women, the sage, substantial, masculine gossiping, the later resumption of effective talk with some pleasant woman graciously at her best. I had a wide range of houses. Cambridge had linked me to one or two correlated sets of artistic and literary people, and my books and Mr. Evesham had opened to me the big vague world of society. I wasn't aggressive, nor particularly snobbish, nor troublesome. Sometimes I talked well, and if I had nothing interesting to say, I said as little as possible, and I had a youthful gravity of manner that was liked by hostesses. And the other side of my nature that first flared through the cover of restraints at Locarno that too had had opportunity to develop along the line London renders practicable. I had had my experiences and secrets and adventures among that fringe of ill-mated or erratic or discredited women the London world possesses. The thing had long ago ceased to be a matter of magic or mystery, and had become a question of appetites and excitement, and among other things the excitement of not being found out. I write rather doubtfully of my growing during this period. Indeed, I find it hard to judge whether I can say that I grew at all in any real sense of the word between three and twenty and twenty-seven. It seems to me now to have been rather a phase of realisation and clarification. All the broad lines of my thought were laid down, I am sure, by the date of my Locarno adventure, but in those five years I discussed things over and over again with myself and others, filled out with concrete fact forms I had at first apprehended sketchily and conversationally, measured my powers against my ideals and the forces in the world about me. It was evident that many men no better than myself and with no greater advantages than mine had raised themselves to influential and even decisive positions in the worlds of politics and thought. I was gathering the confidence and knowledge necessary to attack the world in the large manner. I found I could write, and that people would let me write if I chose, as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Socially and politically and intellectually, I knew myself an honest man, and that quite without any deliberation on my part, this showed and made things easy for me. People trusted my good faith from the beginning, for all that I came from nowhere, and had no better position than any adventurer. But the growth process was arrested. I was nothing bigger at twenty-seven than at twenty-two, however much saner and stronger, and any one looking closely into my mind during that period might well have imagined growth finished altogether. It is particularly evident to me now that I came no nearer to any understanding of women during that time. That Locarno affair was infinitely more to me than I had supposed. It ended something, nipped something in the bud perhaps, took me at a stride from a vague, fine, ignorant, closed world of emotion to intrigue and a perfectly definite and limited sensuality. It ended my youth, and for a time it prevented my manhood. I had never yet even peeped at the sweetest, profoundest thing in the world, the heart and meaning of a girl, or dreamt with any quality of reality of a wife or any such thing as a friend among womanhood. My vague anticipation of such things in life had vanished altogether. I turned away from their possibility. It seemed to me I knew what had to be known about womankind. I wanted to work hard, to get on to a position in which I could develop and forward my constructive projects. Women, I thought, had nothing to do with that. It seemed clear I could not marry for some years. 
I was attractive to certain types of women, I had vanity enough to give me an agreeable confidence in love-making, and I went about seeking a convenient mistress quite deliberately, someone who should serve my purpose and say in the end, like that kindly first mistress of mine, I've done you no harm, and so release me. It seemed the only wise way of disposing of urgencies that might otherwise entangle and wreck the career I was intent upon. I don't apologise for or defend my mental and moral phases. So it was I appraised life and prepared to take it, and so it is a thousand ambitious men see it today. For the rest, these five years were a period of definition, my political conceptions were perfectly plain and honest. I had one constant desire ruling my thoughts. I meant to leave England and the empire better ordered than I found it, to organise and discipline, to build up a constructive and controlling state out of my world's confusions. We had, I saw, to suffuse education with public intention to develop a new, better living generation with a collectivist habit of thought, to link now chaotic activities in every human affair, and particularly to catch that escaped, world-making, world-ruining, dangerous thing, industrial and financial enterprise, and bring it back to the service of the general good. I had then the precise image that still serves me as a symbol for all I wish to bring about, the image of an engineer building a lock in a swelling torrent, with water pressure as his only source of power. My thoughts and acts were habitually turned to that enterprise. It gave shape and direction to all my life. The problem that most engaged my mind during those years was the practical and personal problem of just where to apply myself to serve this almost innate purpose. How was I, a child of this confusion, struggling upward through the confusion to take hold of things? Somewhere between politics and literature my grip must needs be found, but where? Always I seem to have been looking for that in those opening years, and disregarding everything else to discover it. 2. The Baileys, under whose auspices I met Margaret again, were in the sharpest contrast with the narrow industrialism of the Staffordshire world. They were, indeed, at the other extreme of the scale, two active, self-centred people, excessively devoted to the public service. It was natural I should gravitate to them, for they seemed to stand for the maturer, more disciplined, better informed expression of all I was then urgent to attempt to do. The bulk of their friends were politicians or public officials. They described themselves as publicists, a vague yet sufficiently significant term. They lived and worked in a hard little house in Chambers Street, Westminster, and made a centre for quite an astonishing amount of political and social activity. Willersley took me there one evening. The place was almost pretentiously matter-of-fact and unassuming. The narrow passage hall, papered with some ancient yellowish paper, grained to imitate wood, was choked with hats and cloaks, and an occasional feminine wrap. Motioned rather than announced by a tall Scotch servant woman, the only domestic I ever remember seeing there, we made our way up a narrow staircase past the open door of a small study packed with blue books to discover Altiora Bailey receiving before the fireplace in her drawing-room. She was a tall commanding figure, splendid but a little untidy in black silk and red beads, with dark eyes that had no depths, with a clear, hard voice that had an almost visible prominence, aquiline features and straight black hair that was apt to get astray, that was now astray like the head feathers of an eagle in a gale. She stood with her hands behind her back and talked in a high tenor of a projected town planning bill with Blupp, who was practically in those days the secretary of the local government board. A very short, broad man, with thick ears and fat white hands writhing intertwined behind him, stood with his back to us, 
eager to bark interruptions into Altiora's discourse. A slender girl in pale blue, manifestly a young political wife, stood with one foot on the fender, listening with an expression of entirely puzzled propitiation. A tall, sandy-bearded bishop, with the expression of a man in a trance, completed this central group. The room was one of those long apartments once divided by folding doors and reaching from back to front that are common upon the first floors of London houses. Its walls were hung with two or three indifferent watercolours. There was scarcely any furniture but a sofa or so and a chair, and the floor, severely carpeted with matting, was crowded with a curious medley of people, men predominating. Several were in evening dress, but most had the morning garb of the politician. The women were either severely rational or radiantly magnificent. Willersley pointed out to me the wife of the Secretary of State for War, and I recognised the Duchess of Kleins, who at that time cultivated intellectuality. I looked round, identifying a face here or there, and stepping back trod on someone's toe, and turned to find it belonged to the Right Honourable G. B. Mottisham, dear to the Punch caricaturists. He received my apology with that intentional charm that is one of his most delightful traits, and resumed his discussion. Beside him was Ismir of Trinity, whom I had not seen since my Cambridge days. Willersley found an ex-member of the school board for whom he had affinities, and left me to exchange experiences and comments upon the company with Esmir. Esmir was still a don, but he was nibbling, he said, at certain negotiations with the Times that might bring him down to London. He wanted to come to London. We peep at things from Cambridge, he said. This sort of thing, I said, makes London necessary. It's the oddest gathering. "'Everyone comes here,' said Esmir. "'Mostly we hate them like poison, jealousy, and little irritations. "'Altiora can be a horror at times, but we have to come. "'Things are being done. "'Oh, no doubt of it. "'It's one of the parts of the British machinery that doesn't show. "'But nobody else could do it.' Two people,' said Esmir, "'who've planned to be a power in an original way, "'and by Jove they've done it.' I did not for some time pick out Oscar Bailey, and then Esmere showed him to me in elaborately confidential talk in a corner with a distinguished-looking stranger wearing a ribbon. Oscar had none of the fine appearance of his wife. He was a short, sturdy figure with a rounded, protruding abdomen and a curious, broad, flattened, clean-shaven face that seemed nearly all forehead. He was of Anglo-Hungarian extraction, and I have always fancied something Mongolian in his type. He peered up with reddish, swollen-looking eyes over gilt-edged glasses that were divided horizontally into portions of different refractive power, and he talked in an ingratiating undertone with busy thin lips, an eager lisp, and nervous movements of the hand. People say that thirty years before at Oxford he was almost exactly the same eager, clever little man he was when I first met him. He had come up to Balliol, bristling with extraordinary degrees and prizes captured in provincial and Irish and Scotch universities, and had made a name for himself as the most formidable dealer in exact fact the rhetoricians of the Union had ever had to encounter. From Oxford he had gone on to a position in the higher division of the civil service, I think in the war office, and had speedily made a place for himself as a political journalist. He was a particularly neat controversialist, and very full of political and sociological ideas. He had a quite astounding memory for facts, and a mastery of detailed analysis, and the time afforded scope for these gifts. The later eighties were full of politico-social discussion, and he became a prominent name upon the contents list of the nineteenth century, the fortnightly and contemporary, chiefly as a half-sympathetic but frequently very damaging critic of the socialism of that period. He won the immense respect of everyone specially interested in social and political questions. 
he soon achieved the limited distinction that is awarded such capacity, and at that I think he would have remained for the rest of his life if he had not encountered Altiora. But Altiora McVitie was an altogether exceptional woman, an extraordinary mixture of qualities, the one woman in the world who could make something more out of Bailey than that. She had much of the vigour and handsomeness of a slender, impudent young man, and an unscrupulousness altogether feminine. She was one of those women who are waiting in, what is the word, muliebrity? She had courage and initiative, and a philosophical way of handling questions, and she could be bored by regular work like a man. She was entirely unfitted for her sex's sphere. She was neither uncertain, coy, nor hard to please, and altogether too stimulating and aggressive for any gentleman's hours of ease. Her cookery would have been about as sketchy as her handwriting, which was generally quite illegible, and she would have made, I feel sure, a shocking bad nurse. Yet you mustn't imagine she was an inelegant or unbeautiful woman, and she is inconceivable to me in high collars or any sort of masculine garment. But her soul was bony, and at the base of her was a vanity, gaunt and greedy. When she wasn't in a state of personal untidiness that was partly a protest against the waste of hours exacted by the toilet, and partly a natural disinclination, she had a gypsy splendour of black and red and silver all her own. And some when in the early nineties she met and married Bailey. I know very little about her early years. She was the only daughter of Sir Dayton McVitie, who applied the iodoform process to cotton, and only his subsequent unfortunate attempts to become a cotton king prevented her being a very rich woman. As it was, she had a tolerable independence. She came into prominence as one of the more able of the little shoal of young women who were led into politico-philanthropic activities by the influence of the earlier novels of Mrs. Humphrey Ward, the Marcella crop. She went slumming with distinguished figure, which was quite usual in those days, and returned from her experiences as an amateur flower girl with clear and original views about the problem, which is and always had been unusual. She had not married, I suppose because her standards were high and men are cowards, and with an instinctive appetite for muliebrity. She had kept house for her father by speaking occasionally to the housekeeper, butler and cook her mother had left her, and gathering the most interesting dinner parties she could, and had married off four orphan nieces in a harsh and successful manner. After her father's smash and death, she came out as a writer upon social questions, and a scathing critic of the Charity Organisation Society, and she was three and thirty and a little at loose ends when she met Oscar Bailey, so to speak, in the contemporary review. The lurking woman in her nature was fascinated by the ease and precision with which the little man rolled over all sorts of important and authoritative people. She was the first to discover a sort of imaginative bigness in his still-growing mind. The forehead, perhaps, carried him off physically. And she took occasion to meet and subjugate him, and, so soon as he had sufficiently recovered from his abject humility and a certain panic at her attentions, marry him. This had opened a new phase in the lives of Bailey and herself. The two supplemented each other to an extraordinary extent. Their subsequent career was, I think, almost entirely her invention. She was aggressive, imaginative, and had a great capacity for ideas, while he was almost destitute of initiative and could do nothing with ideas except remember and discuss them. She was, if not exact, at least indolent, with a strong disposition to save energy by sketching. Even her handwriting showed that, while he was inexhaustibly industrious, with a relentless invariable calligraphy that grew larger and clearer as the years passed by. She had a considerable power of charming. She could be just as nice to people, and incidentally just as nasty, as she wanted to be. He was always just the same, 
a little confidential and sotto voce, artlessly rude and egoistic in an undignified way. She had considerable social experience, good social connections, and considerable social ambition, while he had none of these things. She saw in a flash her opportunity to redeem his defects, use his powers, and do large, novel, rather startling things. She ran him. Her marriage, which shocked her friends and relations beyond measure, for a time they would only speak of Bailey as that gnome, was a stroke of genius, and forthwith they proceeded to make themselves the most formidable and distinguished couple conceivable. PBP, she boasted, was engraved inside their wedding rings, pro bono publico, and she meant it to be no idle threat. She had discovered very early that the last thing influential people will do is to work. Everything in their lives tends to make them dependent upon a supply of confidently administered detail. Their business is with the window and not the stock behind, and in the end they are dependent upon the stock behind for what goes into the window. She linked with that the fact that Bailey had a mind as orderly as a museum and an invincible power over detail. She saw that if two people took the necessary pains to know the facts of government and administration with precision, to gather together knowledge that was dispersed and confused, to be able to say precisely what had to be done and what avoided in this eventuality or that, they would necessarily become a centre of reference for all sorts of legislative proposals and political expedients, and she went unhesitatingly upon that. Bailey, under her vigorous direction, threw up his post in the civil service and abandoned sporadic controversies, and they devoted themselves to the elaboration and realisation of this centre of public information she had conceived as their role. They set out to study the methods and organisation and realities of government in the most elaborate manner. They did the work as no one had ever hitherto dreamt of doing it, they planned the research on a thoroughly satisfying scale and arranged their lives almost entirely for it. They took that house in Chambers Street and furnished it with severe economy. They discovered that Scotch domestic who is destined to be the guardian and tyrant of their declining years, and they set to work. Their first book, the permanent official filled three plump volumes and took them and their two secretaries upwards of four years to do. It is an amazingly good book, an enduring achievement. In a hundred directions, the history and the administrative treatment of the public service was clarified for all time. They worked regularly every morning from nine to twelve. They lunched lightly but severely, in the afternoon they took exercise, or Bailey attended meetings of the London School Board, on which he served, he said, for the purposes of study. He also became a railway director for the same end. In the late afternoon Altiora was at home to various callers, and in the evening came dinner, or a reception, or both. Her dinners and gatherings were a very important feature in their scheme. She got together all sorts of interesting people in or about the public service. She mixed the obscurely efficient with the ill-instructed famous and the rudderless rich, got together in one room more of the factors in our strange jumble of a public life than had ever met easily before. She fed them with a shameless austerity that kept the conversation brilliant on a soup, a plain fish, and mutton or boiled fowl and milk pudding, with nothing to drink but whisky and soda and hot and cold water and milk and lemonade. Everybody was soon very glad indeed to come to that. She boasted how little her housekeeping cost her, and sought constantly for fresh economies that would enable her, she said, to sustain an additional private secretary. Secretaries were the Baileys one extravagance, they loved to think of searches going on in the British Museum and letters being cleared up and Pracy made overhead while they sat in the little study and worked together, Bailey with a clockwork industry and Altiora in splendid flashes between intervals of cigarettes and meditation. 
"'All efficient public careers,' said Altiora, "'consist in the proper direction of secretaries. "'If everything goes well, I shall have another secretary next year,' Altiora told me. "'I wish I could refuse people dinner napkins. "'Imagine what it means in washing. "'I dare most things. "'But as it is, they stand a lot of hardship here.' "'There's something of the miser in both these people,' said Esmir, and the thing was perfectly true. For, after all, the miser is nothing more than a man who either through want of imagination or want of suggestion misapplies to a base use a natural power of concentration upon one end. The concentration itself is neither good nor evil, but a power that can be used in either way.' and the Baileys gathered and reinvested usuriously not money, but knowledge of the utmost value in human affairs. They produced an effect of having found themselves completely. One envied them at times extraordinarily. I was attracted, I was dazzled, and at the same time there was something about Bailey's big wrinkled forehead, his lisping broad mouth, the gestures of his hands, and an uncivil preoccupation I could not endure. 3. Their effect upon me was from the outset very considerable. Both of them found occasion on that first visit of mine to talk to me about my published writings, and particularly about my then just published book, The New Ruler, which had interested them very much. It fell in, indeed, so closely with their own way of thinking that I doubt if they ever understood how independently I had arrived at my conclusions. It was their weakness to claim excessively. That irritation, however, came later. We discovered each other immensely. For a time it produced a tremendous sense of kindred and cooperation. Altiora, I remember, maintained that there existed a great army of such constructive-minded people as ourselves, as yet undiscovered by one another. "'It's like boring a tunnel through a mountain,' said Oscar, and presently hearing the tapping of the workers from the other end. "'If you didn't know of them beforehand,' I said, "'it might be a rather badly joined tunnel.' "'Exactly!' said Altiora with a high note, and that's why we all want to find out each other. They didn't talk like that on our first encounter, but they urged me to lunch with them next day, and then it was we went into things. A woman factory inspector and the educational minister for New Banksland and his wife were also there, but I don't remember they made any contribution to the conversation. The Baileys saw to that. They kept on at me in an urgent, litigious way. We have read your book, each began, as though it had been a joint function, and we consider... Yes, I protested, I think... That was a secondary matter. They did not consider, said Altiora, raising her voice and going right over me, that I had allowed sufficiently for the inevitable development of an official administrative class in the modern state. Nor of its importance, echoed Oscar. That, they explained in a sort of chorus, was the cardinal idea of their lives, what they were up to, what they stood for. We want to suggest to you, they said, and I found this was a stock opening of theirs, that from the mere necessities of convenience, elected bodies must avail themselves more and more of the services of expert officials. We have that very much in mind. The more complicated and technical affairs become, the less confidence will the elected official have in himself. We want to suggest that these expert officials must necessarily develop into a new class and a very powerful class in the community. We want to organise that. It may be the power of the future. They will necessarily have to have very much of a common training. We consider ourselves as amateur unpaid precursors of such a class. The vision they displayed for my consideration as the aim of public-spirited endeavour seemed like a harder, narrower, more specialised version of the idea of a trained and disciplined state that Willersley and I had worked out in the Alps. They wanted things more organised, more correlated with government and a collective purpose, just as we did, but they saw it not in terms of a growing collective understanding, 
but in terms of functionaries, legislative change and methods of administration. It wasn't clear at first how we differed. The Baileys were very anxious to win me to cooperation, and I was quite prepared at first to identify their distinctive expressions with phrases of my own, and so we came very readily into an alliance that was to last some years, and break at last very painfully. Altiora manifestly liked me. I was soon discussing with her the perplexity I found in placing myself efficiently in the world, the problem of how to take hold of things that occupied my thoughts, and she was sketching out careers for my consideration, very much as an architect on his first visit sketches houses, considers requirements, and puts before you this example and that of the more or less similar thing already done. 4. It is easy to see how much in common there was between the Baileys and me, and how natural it was that I should become a constant visitor at their house, and an ally of theirs in many enterprises. It is not nearly so easy to define the profound antagonism of spirit that also held between us. There was a difference in texture, a difference in quality. How can I express it? The shapes of our thoughts were the same, but the substance quite different. It was as if they had made in china or cast iron what I had made in transparent living matter. The comparison is manifestly from my point of view. Certain things never seemed to show through their ideas that were visible, refracted perhaps and distorted, but visible always through mine. I thought for a time the essential difference lay in our relation to beauty. With me, beauty is quite primary in life. I like truth, order and goodness, wholly because they are beautiful or lead straight to beautiful consequences. The Baileys either hadn't got that or they didn't see it. They seemed at times to prefer things harsh and ugly. That puzzled me extremely. The aesthetic quality of many of their proposals, the manners of their work, so to speak, were at times as dreadful as, well, war office barrack architecture. A caricature by its exaggerated statements will sometimes serve to point a truth by antagonising falsity and falsity. I remember talking to a prominent museum official in need of more public funds for the work he had in hand. I mentioned the possibility of enlisting Bailey's influence. Oh, we don't want Philistines like that infernal bottle imp running us, he said hastily, and would hear of no concerted action for the end he had in view. I'd rather not have the extension. You see, he went on to explain, Bailey's wanting in the essentials. What essentials, said I? Oh, he'd be like a nasty, oily, efficient little machine for some merely subordinate necessity among all my delicate stuff. He'd do all we wanted, no doubt, in the way of money and powers, and he'd do it wrong and mess the place forever. Hands all black, you know. He's just a means, just a very aggressive and unmanageable means. This isn't a plumber's job. I stuck to my argument. I don't like him, said the official conclusively, and it seemed to me at the time he was just blind prejudice speaking. I came nearer the truth of the matter as I came to realise that our philosophies differed profoundly. That isn't a very curable difference, once people have grown up. Theirs was a philosophy devoid of finesse. Temperamentally, the Baileys were specialised, concentrated, accurate. While I am urged either by some inner force or some entirely assimilated influence in my training, always to round off and shadow my outlines. I hate them hard. I would sacrifice detail to modelling always, and the Baileys, it seemed to me, loved a world as flat and metallic as Sidney Cooper's cows. If they had the universe in hand, I know they would take down all the trees and put up stamped tin-green shades and sunlight accumulators. Altiora thought trees hopelessly irregular, and sea cliffs a great mistake. I got things clearer as time went on. Though it was an Hegelian mess of which I had partaken at Codger's table by way of a philosophical training, my sympathies have always been pragmatist. 
I belong almost by nature to that school of pragmatism that, following the medieval nominalists, bases itself upon a denial of the reality of classes and of the validity of general laws. The Baileys classified everything. They were, in the scholastic sense, which so oddly contradicts the modern use of the world, realists. They believed classes were real and independent of their individuals. This is the common habit of all so-called educated people who have no metaphysical aptitude and no metaphysical training. It leads them to a progressive misunderstanding of the world. It was a favourite trick of Altiora's to speak of everybody as a type. She saw men as samples moving. Her dining room became a chamber of representatives. It gave a tremendously scientific air to many of their generalisations, using scientific in its 19th century uncritical Herbert Spencer sense, an air that only began to disappear when you thought them over again in terms of actuality and the people one knew. At the Baileys one always seemed to be getting one's hands on the very strings that guided the world. You heard legislation projected to affect this type and that. Statistics marched by you with sin and shame and injustice and misery reduced to quite manageable percentages. You found men who were to frame or amend bills in grave and intimate exchange with Bailey's omniscience. You heard Altiora canvassing approaching resignations and possible appointments that might make or mar a revolution in administrative methods and doing it with a vigorous directness that manifestly swayed the decision. And you felt you were in a sort of signal box with levers all about you, and the world outside there, albeit a little dark and mysterious beyond the window, running on its lines in ready obedience to these unhesitating lights, true and steady to trim termini. And then with all this administrative fizzle, this pseudo-scientific administrative chatter dying away in your head, out you went into the limitless grimy chaos of London streets and squares, roads and avenues lined with teeming houses, each larger than the Chambers Street house and at least equally alive. You saw the chaotic clamour of hoardings, the jumble of traffic, the coming and going of mysterious myriads. You heard the rumble of traffic like the noise of a torrent a vague incessant murmur of cries and voices, wanton crimes and accidents bawled at you from the placards, imperative unaccountable fashions, swaggered triumphant in dazzling windows of the shops. And you found yourself swaying back to the opposite conviction, that the huge formless spirit of the world it was that held the strings and danced the puppets on the Bailey stage. Under the lamps you were jostled by people like my Staffordshire uncle out for a spree. You saw shy youths conversing with prostitutes. You passed young lovers pairing with an entire disregard of the social suitability of the types they might blend or create. You saw men leaning drunken against lampposts whom you knew for the type that will charge with fixed bayonets into the face of death and you found yourself unable to imagine little Bailey achieving either drunkenness or the careless defiance of annihilation. You realised that quite a lot of types were underrepresented in Chambers Street, that feral and obscure and altogether monstrous forces must be at work, as yet altogether unassimilated by those neat administrative reorganisations. End of chapter 6, section 1《ハッチャクトゥ・オブ・ザ・ニュー・マキアヴェリー・バイ・ H ・ G ・ウェルズ。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus.5 Altiora, I remember, preluded Margaret's reappearance by announcing her as a new type. I was accustomed to go early to the Baileys' dinners in those days for a preliminary gossip with Altiora in front of her drawing-room fire. One got her alone, and that early arrival was little sign of appreciation she valued. 
She had every woman's need of followers and servants. "'I'm going to send you down tonight,' she said, "'with a very interesting type indeed. "'One of the new generation of serious gals, "'middle-class origin and quite well off, rich in fact. "'Her stepfather was a solicitor "'and something of an entrepreneur towards the end, I fancy, "'in the black country. "'There was a little brother died, "'and she's lost her mother quite recently.' quite on her own, so to speak. She's never been out into society very much and doesn't seem really very anxious to go. Not exactly an intellectual person, you know, but quiet and great force of character. Came up to London on her own and came to us. Someone had told her we were the sort of people to advise her, to ask what to do. I'm sure she'll interest you. What can people of that sort do? I asked. Is she capable of investigation? Altiora compressed her lips and shook her head. She always did shake her head when you asked that of any one. "'Of course what she ought to do,' said Altiora, with her silk dress pulled back from her knee before the fire, and with a lift of her voice towards a chuckle at her daring way of putting things, "'is to marry a member of Parliament and see he does his work. Perhaps she will. It's a very exceptional gal who can do anything by herself. Quite exceptional.' The more serious they are, without being exceptional, the more we want them to marry. Her exposition was truncated by the entry of the type in question. Well, cried Altiora, turning, and with a high note of welcome, here you are. Margaret had gained in dignity and prettiness by the lapse of five years, and she was now very beautifully and richly and simply dressed. Her fair hair had been done in some way that made it seem softer and more abundant than it was in my memory, and a gleam of purple, velvet-set diamonds showed amidst its mist of little golden and brown lines. Her dress was of white and violet, the last trace of mourning for her mother, and confessed the gracious droop of her tall and slender body. She did not suggest Staffordshire at all and I was puzzled for a moment to think where I had met her. Her sweetly shaped mouth, with the slight obliquity of the lip and the little kink in her brow, were extraordinarily familiar to me. But she had either been prepared by Altiora, or she remembered my name. We met, she said, while my stepfather was alive, at Misterton. You came to see us. And instantly I recalled the sunshine between the apple blossom and a slender pale blue girlish shape among the daffodils, like something that had sprung from a bulb itself. I recalled at once that I had found her very interesting, though I did not clearly remember how it was she had interested me. Other guests arrived. It was one of Altiora's boldly blended mixtures of people with ideas and people with influence or money who might perhaps be expected to resonate to them. Bailey came down late, with an air of hurry, and was introduced to Margaret, and said absolutely nothing to her, there being no information either to receive or impart, and nothing to do, but stood snatching his left cheek, until I rescued him and her, and left him free to congratulate the new Lady Snape on her husband's KCB. I took Margaret down. We achieved no feats of mutual expression, except that it was abundantly clear we were both very pleased and interested to meet again, and that we had both kept memories of each other. We made that Misterton tea party, and the subsequent marriages of my cousins, and the world of Burslem generally, matter for quite an agreeable conversation, until at last Altiora, following her invariable custom, called me by name imperatively out of our duologue. "'Mr. Remington,' she said, we want your opinion, in her entirely characteristic effort to get all the threads of conversation into her own hands for the climax that always wound up her dinners. How the other women used to hate those concluding raids of hers. I forget most of the other people at that dinner, nor can I recall what the crowning rally was about. It didn't in any way join on to my impression of Margaret. In the drawing-room of the matting floor I rejoined her, with Altiora's manifest connivance, 
and in the interval I had been thinking of our former meeting. "'Do you find London?' I asked. "'Give you more opportunity for doing things and learning things than Burslem?' She showed at once she appreciated my allusion to her former confidences. "'I was very discontented then,' she said, and paused. "'I've really only been in London for a few months. "'It's so different. "'In Burslem life seems all business and getting, without any reason. "'One went on and it didn't seem to mean anything, "'at least anything that mattered. "'London seems to be so full of meanings, all mixed up together.' She knitted her brows over her words, and smiled appealingly at the end, as if for consideration for her inadequate expression, appealingly and almost humorously. I looked understandingly at her. "'We have all,' I agreed, "'to come to London.' "'One sees so much distress,' she added, as if she felt she had completely omitted something, and needed a codicil. "'What are you doing in London?' "'I'm thinking of studying.' some social question. I thought perhaps I might go and study social conditions as Mrs. Bailey did, go perhaps as a work girl, or see the reality of living in, but Mrs. Bailey thought perhaps it wasn't quite my work. Are you studying? I'm going to a good many lectures, and perhaps I shall take up a regular course at the Westminster School of Politics and Sociology, but Mrs. Bailey doesn't seem to believe very much in that either. Her faintly whimsical smile returned. "'I seem rather indefinite,' she apologised. "'But one does not want to get entangled in things one can't do. One, one has so many advantages. One's life seems to be such a trust and such a responsibility.' She stopped. "'A man gets driven into work,' I said. "'It must be splendid to be Mrs. Bailey.' she replied with a glance of envious admiration across the room. "'She has no doubts, anyhow,' I remarked. "'She had,' said Margaret, with the pride of one who has received great confidences. 6. "'You've met before,' said Altiora a day or so later. I explained when. "'You find her interesting?' I saw in a flash that Altiora meant to marry me to Margaret. Her intention became much clearer as the year developed. Altiora was systematic even in matters that evade system. I was to marry Margaret, and freed from the need of making an income, I was to come into politics as an exponent of Baileyism. She put it down with the other excellent and advantageous things that should occupy her summer holiday. It was her pride and glory to put things down and plan them out in detail beforehand, and I am not quite sure that she did not even mark off the day upon which the engagement was to be declared. If she did, I disappointed her. We didn't come to an engagement, in spite of the broadest hints and the glaring obviousness of everything that summer. Every summer the Baileys went out of London to some house they hired or borrowed, leaving their secretaries toiling behind, and they went on working hard in the mornings and evenings, and taking exercise in the open air in the afternoon. They cycled assiduously, and went for long walks at a trot, and raided and studied, and incidentally explained themselves too, any social types that lived in the neighbourhood. One invaded type, resentful under research, described them with a dreadful aptness as Donna Quixote and Sancho Panza, and himself as a harmless windmill, hurting no one and signifying nothing. She did rather tilt at things. This particular summer they were at a pleasant farmhouse in level country near Pangbourne, belonging to the Honourable Wilfred Winchester, and they asked me to come down to rooms in the neighbourhood. Altiora took them for a month for me in August, and bored with them upon extremely reasonable terms. And when I got there, I found Margaret sitting in a hammock at Altiora's feet. Lots of people I gathered were coming and going in the neighbourhood, the Ponts were in a villa on the river, and the Rickham's houseboat was to moor for some days, but these eruptions did not impede a great deal of duologue between Margaret and myself. Altiora was efficient rather than artistic in her matchmaking. 
She sent us off for long walks together. Margaret was a fairly good walker. She exhumed some defective croquet things and incited us to croquet, not understanding that detestable game is the worst stimulant for lovers in the world. And Margaret and I were always getting left about and finding ourselves for odd half-hours in the kitchen garden with nothing to do except talk, or we were told with a wave of the hand to run away and amuse each other. Altior even tried a picnic in canoes, knowing from fiction rather than imagination or experience the conclusive nature of such excursions. But there she fumbled at the last moment and elected at the river's brink to share a canoe with me. Bailey showed so much zeal and so little skill, his hat fell off and he became miraculously nothing but paddle-clutching hands and a vast wrinkled brow, that at last he had to be paddled ignominiously by Margaret, while Altiora, after a phase of rigid discretion, as nearly as possible drowned herself, and me no doubt into the bargain, with a sudden lateral gesture of the arm to emphasise the high note with which she dismissed the efficiency of the Charity Organisation Society. We shipped about an inch of water and sat in it for the rest of the time, an inconvenience she disregarded heroically. We had difficulties in landing Oscar from his frail craft upon the ayat of our feasting. He didn't balance sideways and was much alarmed, and afterwards, as Margaret had a pain in her back, I took him in my canoe, let him hide his shame with an ineffectual but not positively harmful paddle, and towed the other by means of the joined painters. Still it was the fault of the inadequate information supplied in the books, and not of Altiora, that that was not the date of my betrothal. I find it not a little difficult to state what kept me back from proposing marriage to Margaret that summer, and what urged me forward at last to marry her. It is so much easier to remember one's resolutions than to remember the moods and suggestions that produced them. Marrying and getting married was, I think, a pretty simple affair to Altiora. It was something that happened to the adolescent and unmarried when you threw them together under the circumstances of health, warmth and leisure. It happened with the kindly and approving smiles of the more experienced elders who had organised these proximities. The young people married, settled down, children ensued, and father and mother turned their minds, now decently and properly disillusioned, to other things. That, to Altiora, was the normal sexual life, and she believed it to be the quality of the great bulk of the life about her. One of the great barriers to human understanding is the wide temperamental difference one finds in the values of things relating to sex. It is the issue upon which people most need training in charity and imaginative sympathy. Here are no universal standards at all, and indeed for no single man or woman does there seem to be any fixed standard, so much do the accidents of circumstances and one's physical phases affect one's interpretations. There is nothing in the whole range of sexual fact that may not seem supremely beautiful or humanly jolly or magnificently wicked or disgusting or trivial or utterly insignificant according to the eye that sees or the mood that colours. Here is something that may fill the skies in every waking hour or be almost completely banished from a life. It may be everything on Monday, and less than nothing on Saturday, and we make our laws and rules as though in these matters all men and women were commensurable one with another, with an equal steadfast passion and an equal constant duty. I don't know what dreams Altiora may have had in her schoolroom days. I always suspected her of suppressed and forgotten phases, but certainly her general effect now was of an entirely passionless worldliness in these matters. Indeed, so far as I could get at her, she regarded sexual passion as being hardly more legitimate in a civilised person than, let us say, homicidal mania. She must have forgotten, and Bailey too. I suspect she forgot before she married him. I don't suppose either of them had the slightest intimation of the dimension sexual love can take in the thoughts of the great majority of people with whom they come in contact. 
They loved in their way, an intellectual way it was, and a fond way, but it had no relation to beauty and physical sensation, except that there seemed a decree of exile against these things. They got their glow in high moments of altruistic ambition, and in moments of vivid worldly success. They sat at opposite ends of their dinner table with so-and-so captured, and so-and-so flushed with a mutual approval. They saw people in love forgetful and distraught about them, and just put it down to forgetfulness and distraction. At any rate, Altiora manifestly viewed my situation and Margaret's with an abnormal and entirely misleading simplicity. There was the girl, rich, with an acceptable claim to be beautiful, shiningly virtuous, quite capable of political interests, and there was I, talented, ambitious, and full of political and social passion, in need of just the money, devotion, and regularization Margaret could provide. We were both unmarried, white sheets of uninscribed paper. Was there ever a simpler situation? What more could we possibly want? She was even a little offended at the inconclusiveness that did not settle things at Pangbourne. I seemed to her, I suspect, to reflect upon her judgment and good intentions. 7. I didn't see things with Altiora's simplicity. I admired Margaret very much. I was fully aware of all that she and I might give each other. Indeed, so far as Altiora went, we were quite in agreement. But what seemed solid ground to Altiora and the ultimate footing of her emasculated world was to me just the superficial covering of a gulf. Oh, abysses of vague and dim and yet stupendously significant things. I couldn't dismiss the interests and the passion of sex as Altiora did. Work, I agreed, was important, career and success, but deep, unanalyzable instincts told me this preoccupation was a thing quite as important, dangerous, interfering, destructive indeed, but nonetheless a dominating interest in life. I have told how flittingly and uninvited it came like a moth from the outer twilight into my life, how it grew in me with my manhood, how it find its way to speech and grew daring, and led me at last to experience. After that adventure at Locarno, sex and the interests and desires of sex never left me for long at peace. I went on with my work and my career, and all the time it was like, like someone talking ever and again in a room while one tries to write. There were times when I could have wished the world a world all of men. So greatly did this unassimilated series of motives and curiosities hamper me. And times when I could have wished the world all of women. I seemed always to be seeking something in women, in girls, and I was never clear what it was I was seeking. But never, even at my coarsest, was I moved by physical desire alone. Was I seeking help and fellowship? Was I seeking some intimacy with beauty? It was a thing too formless to state that I seemed almost desiring to attain and never attaining. Waves of gross sensuousness arose out of this preoccupation, carried me to a crisis of gratification or disappointment that was clearly not the needed thing. They passed and left my mind free again for a time to get on with the permanent pursuits of my life. And then presently this solicitude would have me again, an irrelevance as it seemed, and yet a constantly recurring demand. I don't want particularly to dwell upon things that are disagreeable for others to read, but I cannot leave them out of my story and get the right proportions of the forces I am balancing. I was no abnormal man, and that world of order we desire to make must be built of such stuff as I was, and am, and can beget. You cannot have a world of Baileys. It will end in one orderly generation. Humanity is begotten in desire, lives by desire. Love which is lust is the lamp in the tomb. Love which is lust is the call from the gloom. I echo Henley. I suppose the life of celibacy, which the active, well-fed, 
well-exercised and imaginatively stirred young man of the educated classes is supposed to lead from the age of nineteen or twenty, when nature certainly meant him to marry, to thirty or more, when civilization permits him to do so, is the most impossible thing in the world. We deal here with facts that are kept secret and obscure, but I doubt for my own part if more than one man out of five in our class satisfies that ideal demand. The rest are even as I was, and Hatherley and Esmere and all the men I knew. I draw no lessons and offer no panacea. I have to tell the quality of life, and this is how it is. This is how it will remain until men and women have the courage to face the facts of life. I was no systematic libertine, you must understand. Things happened to me, and desire drove me. Any young man would have served for that Locarno adventure, and after that what had been a mystic and wonderful thing passed rapidly into a gross, manifestly misdirected and complicating one. I can count a meagre tale of five illicit loves in the days of my youth, to include that first experience, and of them all only two are sustained relationships. Besides these five affairs, on one or two occasions, I dipped so low as the inky dismal sensuality of the streets, and made one of those pairs of correlated figures, the woman in her squalid finery sailing homeward, the man modestly aloof and behind, that every night in the London year flit by the score of thousands across the sight of the observant. How ugly it is to recall, ugly and shameful, now without qualification. Yet at the time there was surely something not altogether ugly in it, something that has vanished, some fine thing mortally ailing. One such occasion I recall, as if it were a vision deep down in a pit, as if it had happened in another state of existence to someone else. And yet it is the sort of thing that has happened, once or twice at least, to half the men in London who have been in a position to make it possible. Let me try and give you its peculiar effect. Man or woman, you ought to know of it. Figure to yourself a dingy room, somewhere in that network of streets that lies about Tottenham Court Road, a dingy bedroom lit by a solitary candle, and carpeted with scraps and patches, with curtains of cretonne closing the window, and a tawdry ornament of paper in the grate. I sit on a bed beside a weary-eyed, fair-haired, sturdy young woman, half undressed, who is telling me in broken German something that my knowledge of German is at first inadequate to understand. I thought she was boasting about her family, and then slowly the meaning came to me, she was a let from near Libau in Courland, and she was telling me, just as one tells something too strange for comment or emotion, how her father had been shot and her sister outraged and murdered before her eyes. It was as if one had dipped into something primordial and stupendous beneath the smooth and trivial surfaces of life. There was I, you know, the promising young Don from Cambridge, who wrote quite brilliantly about politics and might presently get into Parliament, with my collar and tie in my hand, and a certain sense of shameful adventure fading out of my mind. Ach, Gott! she sighed by way of comment, and mused deeply for a moment before she turned her face to me, as to something forgotten and remembered, and assumed the half-hearted, meretricious smile. Bin ich eine Hubsche? she asked like one who repeats a lesson. I was moved to crave her pardon and come away. Bin ich eine Hubsche? she asked a little anxiously, laying a detaining hand upon me, and evidently not understanding a word of what I was striving to say. 8. I find it extraordinarily difficult to recall the phases by which I passed from my first admiration of Margaret's earnestness and unconscious daintiness to an intimate acquaintance. The earlier encounters stand out clear and hard, but then the impressions become crowded and mingle not only with each other, but with all the subsequent developments of relationship, the enormous evolutions of interpretation and comprehension between husband and wife. D. 
dipping into my memories is like dipping into a rag bag one brings out this memory or that with no intimation of how they came in time or what led to them and joined them together and they are all mixed up with subsequent associations with sympathies and discords habits of intercourse surprises and disappointments and discovered misunderstandings i know only that always my feelings for margaret were complicated feelings woven of many and various strands it is one of the curious neglected aspects of life how at the same time and in relation to the same reality we can have in our minds streams of thought at quite different levels we can be at the same time idealising a person and seeing and criticising that person quite coldly and clearly and we slip unconsciously from level to level and produce all sorts of inconsistent acts in a sense i had no illusions about margaret in a sense my conception of margaret was entirely poetic illusion i don't think i was ever blind to certain defects of hers and quite as certainly they didn't seem to matter in the slightest degree her mind had a curious want of vigour flatness is the only word she never seemed to escape from her phrase her way of thinking her way of doing was indecisive she remained in her attitude it did not flow out to easy confirmatory action i saw this quite clearly and when we walked and talked together i seemed always trying for animation in her and never finding it i would state my ideas i know she would say i know i talked about myself and she listened wonderfully but she made no answering revelations i talked politics and she remarked with her blue eyes wide and earnest every word you say seems so just i admired her appearance tremendously but i can only express it by saying i didn't want to touch her her fair hair was always delectably done it flowed beautifully over her pretty small ears and she would tie its fair coilings with fillets of black or blue velvet that carried pretty buckles of silver and paste the light the faint down on her brow and cheek was delightful and it was clear to me that i made her happy my sense of her deficiencies didn't stand in the way of my falling at last very deeply in love with her her very shortcoming seemed to offer me something she stood in my mind for goodness and for things from which it seemed to me my hold was slipping she seemed to promise a way of escape from the deepening opposition in me between physical passions and the constructive career the career of wide aims and human service upon which i had embarked all the time that i was seeing her as a beautiful fragile rather ineffective girl i was also seeing her just as consciously as a shining slender figure a radiant reconciliation coming into my darkling disorders of lust and impulse i could understand clearly that she was incapable of the most necessary subtleties of political thought and yet i could contemplate praying to her and putting all the intricate troubles of my life at her feet before the reappearance of margaret in my world at all an unwonted disgust with the consequences and quality of my passions had arisen in my mind among other things that moment with the lettish girl haunted me persistently i would see myself again and again sitting amid those sluttish surroundings collar and tie in hand while her heavy german words grouped themselves to a slowly apprehended meaning i would feel again with a fresh stab of remorse that this was not a flash of adventure this was not seeing life in any permissible sense but a dip into tragedy dishonour hideous degradation and the pitiless cruelty of a world as yet uncontrolled by any ordered will good god i put it to myself that i should finish the work those cossacks had begun i who want order and justice before everything there's no way out of it no decent excuse if i didn't think i ought to have thought how did i get to it i would ransack the phases of my development from the first shy unveiling of a hidden wonder to the last extremity as a man will go through muddled account books to find some disorganizing error 
I was also involved at that time, I find it hard to place these things in the exact order of their dates because they were so disconnected with the regular progress of my work and life, in an intrigue, a clumsy, sensuous, pretentious, artificially stimulated intrigue with a Mrs. Larimer, a woman living separated from her husband. I will not go into particulars of that episode, nor how we quarrelled and chafed one another. She was at once unfaithful and jealous and full of whims about our meetings. She was careless of our secret and vulgarised our relationship by intolerable interpretations. Except for some glowing moments of gratification, except for the recurrent and essentially vicious desire that drew us back to each other again, we both fretted at a vexatious and unexpectedly binding intimacy. The interim was full of the quality of work delayed, of time and energy wasted, of insecure precautions against scandal and exposure. Disappointment is almost inherent in illicit love. I had, and perhaps it was part of her recurrent irritation also, a feeling as though one had followed something fine and beautiful into a net, into bird lime. These furtive scuffles, this sneaking into shabby houses of assignation, was what we had made out of the suggestion of pagan beauty. This was the reality of our vision of nymphs and satyrs dancing for the joy of life amidst incessant sunshine. We had laid hands upon the wonder and glory of bodily love and wasted them. It was a sense of waste, of finely beautiful possibilities getting entangled and marred forever, that oppressed me. I had missed, I had lost... I did not turn from these things after the fashion of the Baileys, as one turns from something low and embarrassing. I felt that these great organic forces were still to be wrought into a harmony with my constructive passion. I felt, too, that I was not doing it. I had not understood the forces in this struggle, nor its nature. And as I learnt, I failed. I had been started wrong, I had gone on wrong, in a world that was muddled and confused, full of false counsel and erratic shames and twisted temptations. I learnt to see it so by failures that were perhaps destroying any chance of profit in my lessons. Moods of clear, keen industry alternated with moods of relapse and indulgence and moods of dubiety and remorse. I was not going on as the Baileys thought I was going on. There were times when the blindness of the Baileys irritated me intensely. Beneath the ostensible success of those years, between twenty-three and twenty-eight, this rottenness, known to scarcely anyone but myself, grew and spread. My sense of the probability of a collapse intensified. I knew, indeed now, even as Willersley had prophesied five years before, that I was entangling myself in something that might smother all my uses in the world. Down there among those incommunicable difficulties, I was puzzled and blundering. I was losing my hold upon things. The chaotic and adventurous element in life was spreading upward and getting the better of me, overmastering me and all my will to rule and make, and the strength, the drugging urgency of the passion. Margaret shone at times in my imagination like a radiant angel in a world of mire and disorder, in a world of cravings, hot and dull red like scars inflamed. I suppose it was because I had so great a need of such help as her whiteness proffered that I could ascribe impossible perfections to her, a power of intellect, a moral power and patience to which she, poor fellow mortal, had indeed no claim. If only a few of us were angels, and freed from the tangle of effort, how easy life might be. I wanted her so badly, so very badly, to be what I needed. I wanted a woman to save me. I forced myself to see her as I wished to see her. Her tepidities became infinite delicacies, her mental vagueness an atmospheric realism. The harsh precisions of the Baileys and Altiora's blunt directness threw up her fineness into relief and made a grace of every weakness. 
mixed up with the memory of times when I talked with Margaret as one talks politely to those who are hopelessly inferior in mental quality, explaining with a false lucidity, welcoming and encouraging the feeblest response, when possible moulding and directing, at times when I did indeed, as the old phrase goes, worship the ground she trod on. I was equally honest and unconscious of inconsistency at each extreme, but in neither phase could I find it easy to make love to Margaret, for in the first I did not want to, though I talked abundantly to her of marriage and so forth, and was a little puzzled at myself for not going on to some personal application, and in the second she seemed inaccessible. I felt I must make confessions and put things before her that would be the grossest outrage upon the noble purity I attributed to her. 9. I went to Margaret at last to ask her to marry me, wrought up to the mood of one who stakes his life on a cast. Separated from her, and with the resonance of an evening of angry recriminations with Mrs. Larrimer echoing in my mind, I discovered myself to be quite passionately in love with Margaret. Last shreds of doubt vanished. It has always been a feature of our relationship that Margaret absent means more to me than Margaret present. Her memory distills from its dross and purifies in me. All my criticisms and qualifications of her vanished into some dark corner of my mind. She was the lady of my salvation. I must win my way to her or perish. I went to her at last, for all that I knew she loved me, in passionate self-abasement, white and a tremble. She was staying with the Rockleys at Woking, for Sheena Rockley had been at Bennet Hall with her, and they had resumed a close intimacy, and I went down to her on an impulse unheralded. I was kept waiting for some minutes, I remember, in a little room upon which a conservatory opened, a conservatory full of pots of large mauve-edged white cyclamens in flower, and there was a big lacquer cabinet, a Chinese thing, I suppose, of black and gold against the red-toned wall. To this day the thought of Margaret is inseparably bound up with the sight of a cyclamen's back-turned petals. She came in looking pale and drooping, rather more than usual. I suddenly realised that Altiora's hint of a disappointment leading to positive illness was something more than a vindictive comment. She closed the door and came across to me, and took and dropped my hand, and stood still. "'What is it you want with me?' she asked. The speech I had been turning over and over in my mind on the way vanished at the sight of her. "'I want to talk to you,' I answered lamely. For some seconds neither of us said a word. "'I want to tell you things about my life,' I began." She answered with a scarcely audible, yes. I almost asked you to marry me at Pangbourne, I plunged. I didn't. I didn't because, because you had too much to give me. Too much, she echoed, to give you. She had lifted her eyes to my face, and the colour was coming into her cheeks. Don't misunderstand me, I said hastily. I want to tell you things, things you don't know. Don't answer me. I want to tell you. She stood before the fireplace with her ultimate answer shining through the quiet of her face. Go on, she said very softly. It was so pitilessly manifest she was resolved to idealise the situation, whatever I might say. I began walking up and down the room between those cyclamens and the cabinet. There were little gold fishermen on the cabinet fishing from little islands that each had a pagoda and a tree, and there were also men in boats or something, I couldn't determine what, and some obscure sub-office in my mind concerned itself with that quite intently. Yet I seemed to have been striving with all my being to get words for the truth of things. You see, I emerged, you make everything possible to me. You can give me help and sympathy. "'Support, understanding. "'You know my political ambitions. "'You know all that I might do in the world. "'I do so intensely want to do constructive things, 
big things, perhaps, in this wild jumble. Only you don't know a bit what I am. I want to tell you what I am. I'm complex. I'm streaked. I glanced at her, and she was regarding me with an expression of blissful disregard for any meaning I was seeking to convey. You see, I said, I'm a bad man. She sounded a note of valiant incredulity. Everything seemed to be slipping away from me. I pushed on to the ugly facts that remained over from the wreck of my interpretation. What has held me back, I said, is the thought that you could not possibly understand certain things in my life. Men are not pure as women are. I have had love affairs. I mean I have had affairs. Passion, desire. You see, I have had a mistress. I have been entangled. She seemed about to speak, but I interrupted. I'm not telling you, I said, what I meant to tell you. I want you to know clearly that there is another side to my life, a dirty side. Deliberately, I say dirty. It didn't seem so at first. I stopped blankly. Dirty, I thought, was the most idiotic choice of words to have made. I had never in any tolerable sense of the word been dirty. I drifted into this, as men do, I said after a little pause, and stopped again. She was looking at me with her wide blue eyes. Did you imagine, she began, that I thought you, that I expected, but how can you know? I know, I do know, but, I began, I know, she persisted, dropping her eyelids, of course I know and nothing could have convinced me more completely that she did not know. All men, she generalised, a woman does not understand these temptations. I was astonished beyond measure at her way of taking my confession. Of course, she said, hesitating a little over a transparent difficulty, it is all over and past. It's all over and past, I answered. There was a little pause. I don't want to know, she said. None of that seems to matter now in the slightest degree. She looked up and smiled as though we had exchanged some acceptable commonplaces. Poor dear, she said, dismissing everything, and put out her arms, and it seemed to me that I could hear the lettish girl in the background, doomed safety valve of purity in this intolerable world, telling something in indistinguishable German, I know not what nor why. I took Margaret in my arms and kissed her. Her eyes were wet with tears. She clung to me and was near, I felt, to sobbing. I have loved you, she whispered presently. Oh, ever since we met in Misterton six years and more ago. End of chapter 6, section 2